I call the members to order, and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister, and the first question, Neil McAvoy. <clears throat> first Minister, not, not so long ago you described it as odd that uh, Wales doesn't have its own... You need to ask the question oh. on the order paper. <laughs> Excuse me. I do apologise. The pres It's not on the order paper, First Minister? Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Don't blame the right. order paper, Mr McAvoy. <laughs> Didn't problem. Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government support for cricket in Wales? Yes, via Sport Wales, we provide £537,000 uh, this year to Cricket Wales to support the development of the game across Wales. OK, Dioch, and thank you for your patience there. Um, not so long ago you described it as odd that Wales doesn't have its own national cricket team. And it seems more odd now that Ireland is a full test member of the International Cricket Council and Scotland is beating England in one day internationals. So where is Wales? I, I think many people here find it bizarre that a team called England with no Welsh players playing under the English flag, three lines on the shirt could be described as Welsh. Now, Glamorgan, who have had reservations about the Welsh team, are calling for someone to produce a business plan to explore how to have a successful county side and national side. So will your government support Glamorgan's suggestion by commissioning a feasibility study into a Welsh national cricket team, or will you let Welsh cricketers and fans continue to be so badly represented by England? Well, ultimately, this is a matter for Cricket Wales and for the Morgan Cricket Club, but not for the, uh, for the government. There is no doubt there will be a severe financial impact uh, if uh, we were suddenly to compete uh, in our own names. There's a question mark as to whether the Morgan could survive, whether the stadium would be uh, viable, uh, and indeed uh, what would happen in terms of the financial support that Welsh cricket uh, receives. I understand that there will be many who in their hearts would like to see a Welsh cricket team, but of course there are financial realities here that have to be uh, observed. Uh, and for me, I think it's best left to the cricketing authorities. Russell George. Uh, 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 First Minister, like many uh, sports across Wales, cricket um, at grassroots and amateur level is uh, coming under significant pressure, both financially and from a participation perspective. Now, on the weekend, you may have uh, seen that the WRU um, announced a pilot uh, which would see junior rugby moved to the summer season. Now, whilst I certainly acknowledge that some of the reasons put forward by uh, the WRU are understandable, um, can I ask what discussions your government has had or will be having over the coming weeks to ensure that the game of cricket in Wales is not significantly squeezed or harmed by this decision, uh, as it's surely in everyone's interest that all sports in Wales, including cricket and rugby have their own space to thrive? Uh, it was an issue. It was raised with me, actually, over the course of the, uh, of the weekend. There is significant overlap already between the sports. There was a time when people would happily play you know, rugby in the winter and uh, cricket in the summer, and the overlap was, wasn't there. It certainly wasn't there when I was in school, when we played on sloping pitches with a dull ball and one pad. It was a way to learn cricket, if I remember. But the, the serious point is this. I think cricket, it's important that cricket is able to appeal to uh, pe young people, uh, as young as possible. The uh, situation has improved. I know when my son was younger, he could play football at six, rugby at seven, but cricket not until 11. That did change very quickly, and he did take part in some cricket. So I think it's, what, what's important is that cricket continues to appeal to uh, children uh, at the youngest age possible. And in fairness, that is something that's happening now, so cricket should be able, to my mind, to uh, hold its own. Thank you, Clywyd. Tools, surely, for encouraging youth uh, cricket in Wales would be to have a national cricket team that young people at yeah, yeah. uh, the length and breadth of the country could aspire to and, and find role models in. Uh, you say that this is a, not a matter for government. Let's, let's perhaps explore what might be a matter for government. You have a major events unit, for example, that funds a host of events in order to put Wales on the map, in order to market Wales, in order to bring economic benefits to Wales. Would Welsh Government look at the possibility of even using uh, major events uh, funding to get the ball rolling on a national cricket team for Wales as, if you like, a permanent uh, major event that could bring real national benefits? Well, no, the ma major events uh, funding is there for one-off events, not for, for continuous revenue funding. Yeah. Uh, but he is right to say, of course, that it's a good way of showcasing Wales, but we don't just attract events 
that have Welsh teams in them. If I can put it that way. We've just had the Volvo Ocean race. There was Welsh participation, but there wasn't a Welsh team. The point was uh, to bring the attention of the world to, uh, to Cardiff Bay and to Wales and to see what we could host. The same with the Champions League. Well, yes, there was a Welsh participation, clearly, but there weren't Welsh teams in it. So I, I think it's, it's uh, hugely important that we are able to showcase ourselves as a nation that can host major events. We've done that incredibly successfully. You know, we are by far the smallest nation, for example, to host the Champions League. Uh, Cardiff is the smallest city to host the Champions League. We've done it, and there's no reason why we can't do it uh, again. It shouldn't just be tied to whether or not there's a Welsh team in the event uh, as to whether we then support that event. Question down. Question two, Mohamed Ashkin. Officer, <clears throat> what measure will the Welsh Government introduce to prevent animal cruelty in the next 12 months, please? Well, the Wales Animal Health and Welfare Framework Implementation uh, Plan, snappily titled, sets out the framework group and Welsh Government priorities for animal health and welfare, and the Cabinet Secretary will be making a statement on companion animal welfare later today. Thank you very much for the reply, Minister. Since May this year, every abattoir in England is required to have CCTV cameras installed on all areas where live animals are kept. Officials vet will have unrestricted access to footage to reassure consumers that high welfare standards are being enforced. Does the First Minister agree that this is an effective way to prevent animal cruelty and when will the Welsh Government make CCTV compulsory in our abattoirs in Wales? Well, there are a number of controls already in place in abattoirs. Official vets are present in every single one of them. The larger abattoirs, which process the majority of animals, have CCTV, and official vets are able to access footage if they suspect welfare standards are not being met. That said, we are determined to improve standards and practices where it's necessary and reasonable to do so, uh, and the £1.1 million food business investment funding package will assist small and medium-sized slaughterhouses to improve their facilities including the installation of CCTV. Questions now from the party leaders. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R.T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, uh, prostate cancer is a cruel condition that, if diagnosed early enough, uh, has remarkable success rates, 90% uh, plus. Uh, regrettably, obviously, screening in some parts of the UK is a, leaves a lot to be desired. In particular, here in Wales, regrettably, the ability to get access to the MP MRI scanner uh, for four health boards is non-existent, and people do end up having to pay considerable sums to to have that scan undertaken. In England, for example, where that scan is available, it has a 92% detection rate. Uh, with the four health boards, which total 700,000 men within those health boards, unable to attract uh, that type of screening, what commitment can you give as First Minister and as a government to roll out the screening so that whatever part of Wales you live in, you will have access to that screening so that if you do require surgery or intervention, it can be done in a timely manner? Well, an important question, and one that deserves uh, a, a detailed answer, if I may, uh, with. I can say the health boards in Wales are able to offer multi-parametric scans in line with the current guidance from NICE. That guidance currently recommends MPMRI for people with a negative biopsy to determine if another biopsy is needed and if the management of a proven cancer will benefit from staging of the uh, tumour. Uh, What's called PROMISE trial indicated that people with suspected prostate cancer might benefit from having their MPMRI prior to biopsy. NICE is reviewing its guidance and is expected to issue recommendations in the early part of next year. In the meantime, evidence is being considered by the Wales Urology Board. It's fair to say there are different views among the clinicians about the implications of recent evidence, with some health boards implementing elements of a revised uh, approach. What I can say is if NICE recommends pre-biopsy MPMRI for suspected prostate cancer, then we would expect all health boards to amend their care pathways uh, accordingly. In the meantime, health boards will continue to consider the evidence and pathway reforms uh, through the Wales Urology Board. I thank you for that detailed answer, First Minister. You know, regrettably, 10,000 men a year die from prostate cancer. It's the biggest killer of men. Uh, and some universality around the screening programme must be a compunction on the government because actually cancer doesn't rely on postcodes. It's universal, it is. Uh, on the bowel cancer screening uh, programme that the Welsh Government have, uh, it has been called, um, at the moment, a very postcode lottery-driven screening programme. Uh, and in particular, one in four individuals are waiting in excess of eight weeks 
to have their screening procedure diagnosed um, and actually put, put, put into practice if intervention is required. Uh, 900 people die a year of bowel cancer here uh, in Wales. If ultimately we had a better, more robust screening system uh, and a wider screening system that actually took into account 40 years and above, then we could drive those numbers down even further. Given we know the importance of screening, and in particular on bowel screening, what action is your government doing to shorten the waiting times that will remove that one in four, uh, in 25 per cent of people waiting in excess of eight weeks to get the results that they require? Because it cannot be right that where the treatment is treatable, where the condition is treatable, uh, just through waiting too long on a waiting list, you have a detrimental impact on your outcome. With screening, it's a question of uh, who do you target for the screening? Because you can't screen everybody. Uh, which particular elements of the population are particularly uh, susceptible to a particular type of cancer? Because it's not physically possible to screen uh, everybody. We want, of course, to see consistency across the health boards. They're able to access the new treatments fund, if that's appropriate, for, the, uh, for what they wish to, uh, to take uh, forward. I can say is when we look at our urgent suspected cancer route, for example, the vast majority of people started definitive treatment within the target time of 62 days, 88.7%. 96% of patients who are newly diagnosed with cancer not via the urgent route started definitive treatment within the target time of 31 days in March 2018. So the vast majority of people do get the treatment that they should get within, within the, uh, the right amount of time. But of course, we rely on specialists in order to advise us to make sure uh, that we can see how we can improve screening where that's necessary. Those improvements are desperately needed. As I said, Bowel Cancer UK say it is a national crisis uh, that people are waiting. One in four people are waiting eight weeks or more for that screening process to be undertaken. But what we do know from the weekend's announcement that the UK Government have made is that there will be a considerable uh, uplift in the spend available to the Welsh Government to spend on health and social care here in Wales. These screening, these screening proposals... Well, I can hear the chuntering from the Labour backbenchers, but the reality is that money is coming over to the Welsh Government. Now, it is perfectly right under the, devolved cons under the devolved settlement that you choose where to spend that money. From these benches, we believe that that money should be spent in the fields of health and social care to make those improvements in prostate, bowel and other treatments available to patients here in Wales. Now, will you commit today to make sure that any money that is made available to the Welsh Government is spent on those key areas so that we can see the improvements that we desperately need in diagnostic tests and waiting times and staff recruitment that other parts of the UK who are committed to delivering it into the health and social care budgets will see. We need that commitment, First Minister. Will you make it? Well, the first thing we have to see is what the, how much money we'll actually get, because uh, there are two important points to make here. Uh, first of all, uh, we have been informed that that money, whatever money we get, will be uh, the source of funding to deal with pay increases. So the lifting of the pay cap will have to be financed through uh, the, any money that we get via uh, the source that he has mentioned. So that, that's the first thing to, to mention. There's no extra money on top of that. Secondly, of course, it's never the case, is it, that we get a lump sum of money to pay for a particular uh, area, such as health or education. What happens is, of course, as he knows, is delivered via the block grant. What we don't know is that if we get the increase in health, whether we then see decreases everywhere else in local government, in education, uh, in all those areas that are devolved. Now, those, of course, uh, are removed from the figure that he's just uh, mentioned. So, until we know, firstly, how much money net there'll actually be, we don't know, it won't be 1.2 billion, but how much money net there'll actually be, uh, and until we know, of course, uh, how much money that the, we've got a fair idea that the pay deal will cost, we won't know how much money is available to spend. And until those factors are resolved, and nobody is able to do that yet because we don't know what the, um, what, what, what the any increase or, or not in our block grant will be uh, in the autumn. Until we know the definitive net sum of money, uh, it's very difficult to make any commitments at this stage. First Minister, the Prime Minister announced over the weekend that there would be a £20 billion a year birthday present for the NHS in England. As a result of... As a result of Barnet, Wales is expected to receive £1.2 billion, um, and on Sunday, 
um, a Welsh Government spokesman said that a decision on the allocation of funding um, would be made by your Cabinet um, in the usual way. So, First Minister, have you made um, that decision yet? And will you be using any extra monies we receive for health and social care? Well, the only commitment we have made is that we will lift the pay cap. Uh, we've made that commitment, unusually, because normally we, we don't make um, those promises before we know how much money is allocated. So that will have to be paid for from whichever sum of money we get from the UK government. There's no extra money for it. Now, as I said in the answer earlier on, it's not going to be 1.2 billion. We don't know whether there'll be cuts elsewhere that will bring that figure down. Until we know what the final figure is, it's very difficult to give any commitments in terms of spending. Thank you for that answer. Um, my concern here is that mental health issues um, account for around a quarter of all health problems, yet we're spending as little as over 11 per cent um, of the entire NHS Wales budget. We have seen a 100 per cent increase in the demand for child and adolescent mental health care services. Um, we know that depression affects 22 per cent of men and 28 per cent of women over the age of 65. Um, we've seen a large rise in instances of self-harm, and each year around 300 people in Wales die from suicide. Um, this is about twice the number of people killed in road accidents. Um, we're clearly not doing um, enough to tackle mental health in Wales. So, First Minister, will you commit um, to using some of this additional money, um, whatever it may be, um, uh, coming to Wales to, in order to ensure that mental health funding is based upon a robust assessment of health care needs. Yes. Particularly, of course, to look at uh, prevention. That's hugely important. Uh, with CALMS, uh, she is right to say that there was a significant increase in demand for CALMS, and we met uh, that demand by allocating, if I, if I remember, £8 million a year towards uh, CALMS in order for them to, to meet the demand that was, uh, that was there. Uh, mental health, as you will know, is, is a key priority for us in uh, prosperity for all. We want to make sure that, that, that mental health is seen as something that is a priority for all governments uh, in, in the future, and that will shape any spending decisions that we take if there's any extra money on the table. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. Um, as I've highlighted um, before many times, that one in four of us will suffer from mental ill health. Um, a friend of a work colleague could be battling depression for years. We wouldn't know about it because, unfortunately, there is still a stigma attached to mental health issues. Um, we all have to be more open about mental health. Uh, we wouldn't try to hide a broken leg, but we will try to hide depression. Um, sadly, as a result of stigma, many people end up taking their own lives. If we recognise the signs and offer non-judgmental support, many lives could be served, saved. So, First Minister, will you commit your government to ensuring that as many people as possible are trained as mental health first aiders, um, and will you look at adding the training to the school curriculum and encourage large employers to have mental health first aiders alongside the normal required first aiders? Okay. I'm not sure first aid is the way to deal with it. That suggests something that is acute, something that's just arisen. I think it's more, more long-term than that. Um, I take the point uh, that, that the, uh, the leader of UK is, is making in terms of how we deal with people who don't exhibit any external signs of, of depression. I've seen it uh, at close hand, and I've got a fair idea of how it operates in people, um, but it's not always obvious to those who are not familiar with the individual uh, involved. Uh, and that is difficult, of course, because the external signs are not there. And so if you break a leg, it's obvious the signs are there. That's why I want to make sure that when we look at mental health, we don't just look at it as a, a service designed to help people when they get into crisis. That we do look at ways uh, in which we can help young people particularly. That's important. We have a counsellor in each uh, secondary school in Wales. But what more could be done, for example, uh, to look to uh, help people who are not obviously in, in need of, of help. Uh, and they are the people quite often, of course, that the system needs to, to identify. How that's done, of course, we will take forward with, uh, with practitioners uh, to see how we can create a service that is, that is, that where there is more focus on prevention and less on, on dealing with symptoms when they become obvious. Camry leader, Leanne Wood. Does the First Minister agree with environmental lawyers, client Earth, that the Welsh Government's plans for air quality lack clarity and detail? Well, we are looking at air quality and how to, uh, to improve it. Um, I'm not going to agree with, with the firm of lawyers, obviously, that are not Welsh Government uh, lawyers. But there is a challenge, of course, to improve air quality in the future. 
Air pollution is responsible for 2,000 deaths per year in this country. It's a public health crisis, and it's your Labour government's environmental legacy. And that's why Plaid Cymru this week has launched uh, a campaign, Clean Air Week. And my colleague Simon Thomas yesterday launched a comprehensive report on hydrogen's role in, decarb in the decarbonisation of uh, transport. Now, I would urge the First Minister to read this expert-led, in-depth report and to take heed of its recommendations. Yes. First Minister, this crisis warrants urgent action. Given that a road in Kerfilly is the most polluted outside of London, will you support our calls for a Clean Air Act for Wales, which would phase out the sale of diesel and petrol-only vehicles by 2030? I think that's too early. I don't think the technology is ready. I do look forward to a time when uh, electric cars become the norm. I don't think the technology is there now in terms of the range, but I think it will become available very, very quickly. Uh, 2040, which, if I remember rightly, the target is the UK government to set, is, is I think, probably pessimistic. But such as the, uh, the development of the technology in this, uh, this field, I think we will get to a position where uh, it will become a realistic option. Now, as somebody who has been driving a hybrid car, um, the battery in my car only gives me a range of 28 miles. Now, that's the problem. We need to make sure that, that there's enough, that the technology is right to move, to move ahead in the, in the way that she's described. She's right. In the meantime, what do we do? We can't do nothing. Well, firstly, we need to make sure that, that we remove areas where traffic is idling with engines on. That affects air quality. And, of course, to, to see more modal shift. Uh, and that means, of course, moving ahead with the improvements we're going to see in our rail infrastructure to make it more comfortable for people to travel by train and air-conditioned trains that are more frequent. And also, of course, moving forward with the Active Travel Act to make sure that uh, where we see new developments, at cycle paths, for example, are an integral part of those developments, uh, so that people feel they don't have to travel by car. So I think two things. Uh, first of all, creating that, uh, that modal shift. Uh, and secondly, of course, uh, looking to encourage ways to, to ensure that, elect that, that battery cars have a much longer range in the future, and it's much easier to charge them as well, and, it is the, and that it's much easier to charge them as well than it is at the moment. I think that's where we'll get the real change. I take it then from your answer that you disagree with Labour-led Cardiff Council that has called, who has called for a ban on polluting vehicles by 2030. Why is Labour so unable to be consistent on any single policy area? The lack of urgency, willingness and the lack of being able to do things differently is costing people's lives. You can laugh and mutter, it is costing people's lives. Now, you have already lost a case against Client Earth and you face further legal repercussions if solutions aren't found quickly. Let me once again emphasise the scale of the problem here. Air in Cardiff and Port Talbot is more polluted than air in Birmingham yeah. and Manchester, despite the huge differences in population. This is the environment that your government is creating for future generations. First Minister, as a very first step, you could ensure that the planned automotive park in Ebu Vale focuses on the development of hydrogen and electric vehicles, putting Wales at the forefront of the clean transport revolution. Will you at least do that? I wonder if she or others on the play benches drive a hybrid car or an electric car. Hmm, silence. Well, I mean, practice what you preach. That, that's what I, I would say. Well, well, there we are. Simon Thomas. Well. Allow the First Minister to respond, please. Simon Thomas is right. Simon Thomas is right. He's right. He is right to say try doing fabulous. He's quite right. I don't dispute that at all, which is why the technology isn't ready yet. It does need to be moved forward. Uh, but, of course, you know, I notice that not, nobody even uh, drives a hybrid, apparently, which is something that I've been, I've been doing for three years. Anyway, look, the point is this, isn't it? How do we create clean air? That's an important point. But Talbot has, steel, has a steelworks in it. Uh, and that means, inevitably, that the air quality there may not be as good as it would be in places where that industrial operation isn't there. But we need it to be there. And, in fairness, Tata have made a, a great deal of effort and, and taken many strides in reducing... Uh, their emissions over the, uh, over the years, and, and that is, has had an effect on Potobot. Potobot also have, has a traffic problem, which is not easy to resolve, uh, which will need to be, to be looked at in the future. Cardiff, well, yes, I think it's right to say that it's probably easier to drive an electric car in Cardiff if people are commuting short distance, and that's something to encourage, and the, the infrastructure is being... Well, you know, she, she makes the point about the ministerial fleet when nobody in her own party dri it, 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 it is driving that kind of car, given the long distances. Given the long distances. 
Yes, but I am not. I am not the one, am I? I am not. I am not. I am not the one. I am not the one saying that we should move to battery operated cars as quickly as possible. They are. We'll pra practice what you preach. The second thing is, of course, and in the short term, the way to do this is to encourage more people out of their cars. And also, of course, to ensure that people are able to use the public transport network as conveniently as possible. We are doing that. Despite the criticism the bike company launched at the rail yeah. franchise last yeah. week, the only, the only people who criticised it. Should we will make sure that the whole of Wales has the best rail structure in Britain. We've shown the way for the rest of Britain. It's no longer any good for uh, people who use the Valley Line services to travel on ancient trains with no air conditioning and an unreliable service. That's going to change. Yeah. People will have the trains that they deserve. People will be able to access the cycle routes that they deserve. People will see, as we have taken powers now over buses, they will see an integrated bus and train and light rail network. And that is what we offer the people of Wales, a real vision to plug that gap until such time as the technology is available and the range is available for battery-powered cars. Question three. Question three, Paul Davis. Will the First Minister outline the Welsh Government's economic priorities for Pembrokeshire for the next 12 months? The Prosperity for All National Strategy and the Economic Action Plan set out the actions we are taking to improve the economy and business environment across the whole of Wales. I met with a relatively new business in my constituency recently called Composite Cymru, who produce carbon fibre components for vehicles, and the business is now looking to expand in order to produce other products too. I'm sure you would agree with me that it's important that we do everything that we can to support a business like this by securing access to funding so that the business can grow and that the local economy can benefit from that growth. So can you tell us what the Welsh Government is doing to ensure that small businesses particularly small businesses in rural areas, can access financial support so that they can grow and develop for the future and improve the local economy? Well, of course, we are committed to supporting SMEs and small businesses, and we've uh, invested £86 million in, from now to 2020 to ensure that small businesses and SMEs receive business support through the Business Wales programme and it's a pleasure to see that there's been an increase of 10.6% of businesses in Pembrokeshire since 2011 and of course the investment that has been made in the broadband system has made a huge difference ensuring that businesses can remain in more rural areas and not having to establish in more uh, less rural areas. How will the South Wales Metro improve access to public transport in the Cunham Valley? Well, Aberdeen and the wider Cunham Valley will benefit from an increase to four services per hour in 2022. And more immediately, the Sunday service trial that's currently operational will be made permanent in December 2018. Thank you, First Minister. I welcome those comments on the rail aspect. <clears throat> of the Metro, but I think it's important to note that from its inception, the Metro project has been promoted as an integrated transport solution. The geography of the valleys mean that it's often our most impoverished communities that can be furthest away from the train links uh, on the valley floor. So for them to benefit from better access to the jobs market, it is crucial that they serve by strong bus links that feed in to those train services. So First Minister, what reassurances can the Welsh Government give that those bus links remain at the heart of the Metro vision. Well, well members will know the frustration uh, that many of us feel when uh, constituents come to us and say, is there anything you can do about this bus route that's been cut? And the answer is, well, it's nothing to do with, with government. It's all run by the private sector, apart from mm -hmm. subsidised routes. Well, that has to come to an end, because in most parts of Wales, there's effectively a private monopoly on, uh, on bus services. They can do as they see fit in terms of which routes they run. Uh, now that we have uh, responsibility and control over the bus services in Wales, there's now the opportunity to create that integrated uh, bus, light rail and train system that we've wanted to see for a long time in Wales. She's right to say there are many cross-valley routes, for example, that are not, not served by rail, but are important in terms of what they deliver through, uh, through bus services. Now we can start looking from phase two and three and beyond at a properly integrated public transport system for the whole of Wales. And these are exciting times. David Melding. 
First Minister, we're already seeing from the population statistics for RCT in Aberdeen being very important that uh, there's an increase in population of people uh, between 30 and 40 as some people are relocating to those areas uh, uh, to purchase family size housing. This is leading to uh, a, a, a larger or more diverse social mix which itself regenerates areas like uh, Aberdeen. But an essential part of this to really build on this uh, uh, trend is to ensure the metro provides uh, excellent uh, transport because a lot of younger people do not want to, their, their lives ruled by the car and facing congestion. They do. You're quite right. They are more enlightened, I suppose, than many, uh, many of the generations older than, than them. Uh, we are looking, of course, uh, I, the member of Atlanta has offered a strong support for that. Uh, he is, uh, he, I'm glad he considers us a part of the younger generation, but uh, I'll not comment on that. The, um, we are looking, of course, at the system of half price travel uh, for young people as well to make it easier for them to, uh, to access the, uh, the, the, the network that we will have in place. But he is quite right, the member is quite right to point out uh, that we have to make sure, as, as we encourage people out of their cars, that we have a rail system that is good enough to attract them onto, uh, into the trains. For too long, they've had to put up with uh, uncomfortable trains, with condensation running down the windows, with indifferent uh, punctuality, those days must change and they will change as a result of the new franchise. McAntoniff. First Minister, the improvements to the service in Cunningham Valley will obviously uh, come through to uh, Pontypridd, but are probably unlikely to go as far as the benefits to Pontyclean, where you have a, a population from Pencoy to the surrounding area of around 100,000. The main benefit that probably people in Pontyclean will see is that there will be more trains going through Pontyclean but not necessarily stopping in Pontyclean. At the moment, there is one train an hour, uh, two at peak times, normally two carriages, uh, and there is incredible frustration in terms of people actually even being able to access the service at all because of the congestion. I wonder if something was going would have a look to ensure that in this growing area, this vitally important area, part of my constituency, uh, that there will be very specific improvements to the rail service, but to the frequency of trains and the quality of trains and the number of carriages to enable to deliver people, whether it be from Pencoid through Pontyclean to Cardiff and vice versa. My daughter travels to Cardiff on a Monday to Tuesday. She is uh, somebody who lobbies me constantly on this issue. Uh, she sees the overcrowding on the trains. She gets on in Bridgend, but of course, with, with the stops that, 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 that at Pencord, at Llanharan, then at Pontyclean, she sees the overcrowding that takes place there with a two-carriage train uh, at, in the early morning. Bear in mind, of course, that the, that the last franchise was let on the basis that there would be no passenger and no increase in passenger numbers at all. Uh, that was uh, unfathomable thinking at the time. This is not what we've done this time around. So it does mean looking at more frequent services to service constituents. It will mean in time as well, of course, looking at the old uh, Coke Works line up to Bearline to see whether that can be used, probably like trail, whether that can be used to link back into the, uh, to the main line to provide a service for, uh, for people at, um, uh, at the stations from Talbot Green, I suppose, Western Talbot Green, uh, onwards and upwards up to Bearline. Question Pim, please. Question 5, Lady Griffith. Thank you. So with... What steps is the Welsh Government taking to reduce re-offending rates? Well, the Welsh Government and Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service in Wales have worked together to develop a joint framework to support positive change for those at risk of offending in Wales. Virtually every piece of research has looked at the size of prisoners shown that smaller prisons have better outcomes for prisoners and communities as compared to large prisons and super prisons particularly. So if you are serious about reducing the levels of reoffending, then would you commit, if and when these issues are devolved, to plough a new furrow in Wales and to move away from this model and ensuring that we don't see more super prisons develop here in Wales? Yes, we will. I think we must reconsider both the justice and the court system in Wales and also prisons for young offenders. And this is something that we're considering at present because if we're going to see the devolution of the justice system, then we must have a policy. But it's no point having a policy once devolution takes place. You have to have one beforehand. And this is something that we as a government have foreseen and we are considering and developing a policy at present.
Uh, Dr. Clareth, uh, and First Minister, uh, I think, I'm sure you'd agree with me, key to low offending rates, uh, uh, key to low reoffending rates is training prior to release. And I recently opened a very successful jobs fair at Prescott Open Prison in my constituency. It was hosted by, uh, partially by Careers Wales, where ex-offenders had the opportunity to meet with employers, both local uh, and from further afield, to see how they can best apply valuable skills that they picked up um, whilst, uh, whilst in prison. I thought this was a very worthwhile scheme. Prescott has an excellent record of rehabilitation. Uh, can you tell us what the Welsh Government is doing, whilst I appreciate the prisons aren't devolved, what the Welsh Government is doing to support organisations like Careers Wales so that ex-offenders, whilst they are in prison, do get that valuable op opportunity to retrain so that upon release they can uh, reintegrate with society and, uh, and, and uh, give society back those skills which they picked up in prison? Well, youth offending teams have played a significant role in reducing reoffending amongst young people. Uh, they've looked to support prevention, early intervention and diversion. And as somebody with, with a significant experience in, in representing young people at the sharp end in the courts, uh, what I would find is, yes, it, they, they can quite often uh, get released from a young offenders institution having had training, but they fall back to the same peer group and the same habits. So, yes, training is hugely important. They're very much welcome uh, what's being done at, at Prescott. Uh, but also, of course, uh, the, the, those teams will know that it's hugely important to move people away uh, from a peer group that might have got them into trouble in the first place, and often away from drugs as well, because the, the, the rate of reoffending with people who, who um, have abused drugs is, is enormously high. So it, I think it's a holistic approach that's needed, but, the, but what he's described as happening in his, his own constituency is a hugely important part of that approach. Question, Question six, Neil Hamilton. How does the Welsh Government assist health boards in the planning of health care in Mid and West Wales? Yes, the NHS Wales planning framework 2018-21 sets out the principles which health boards should follow when developing their integrated medium-term plans. We've also set out our vision for the future of health and social care services in the long-term plan, A Healthier Wales, which was launched last week. I thank the First Minister for that reply. As he knows, a significant part of Mid and West Wales is within the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board area. As at the end of March, there were 5,714 patients that were waiting more than nine months for treatment in hospital. And under Betsy's current plans, many orthopaedic uh, patients will still be waiting more than a year for treatment, and 4,200 generally will wait more than nine months to be treated, whereas in Powys, that nine-month wait has actually been eliminated. Betsy also says that there's a systemic deficit of 13,500 patient pathways on the basis of patient demand. So that must mean that they are not being funded properly to provide a suitably comprehensive system of health care for the people of that region. Is it acceptable to the Welsh Government that under Betsy's plans, this is a health board that's actually planning to fail? No, the Health Secretary updated members last week on the progress made in some areas. He was also clear about the significant challenges that do remain and the support that will be in place for the next phase of uh, work. It's right to say that some services have been de-escalated, uh, maternity services of course, in a very difficult place at one point, uh, were uh, de-escalated as a special measures concern in February and that demonstrates what can be achieved with focused action and support and that is uh, the model that we plan to use in ensuring that there is further de-escalation uh, in the months to come. Angela Burns, uh, the, uh, Presiding Officer. Of course, we do know a little bit better now what is happening in Betsy Cadwallader and what support the Welsh Government is offering that health board, simply because we've raised it here so many times um, that we've finally managed to get an answer. I wonder now, First Minister, if you might be able to enlighten us as to the types of levels of support that the Welsh Government is offering the Halvar Health Board, which, as you know, is in a form of special intervention. Um, they've already been in it for over two years. Um, we don't want to see their situation deteriorate or continue for as long as the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board situation has. Surely the objective is that you go in, you give them the support, they put themselves right, and then they come back out of special measures. That's the way we should be running our health board. So perhaps you can just give us an overview of what you're doing for the how of our health board, because I found it exceptionally difficult to try to get some real clear, crystal clear answers on this matter from the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Well, I can say that in 2015 to 16 and 2016 to 17, we did provide Howell Law with additional non-recurrent funding of £14.4 million. 
as short-term structural support in recognition of the financial challenges facing uh, the uh, Board. On the 23rd of May, the Health Secretary announced the findings of a review which partially confirmed the view that Howell faces a unique set of healthcare challenges that have contributed to the consistent deficits incurred by the Board and its predecessor organisations as well. And as a result, £27 million of additional recurrent funding has been released to the Health Board from, uh, this, well, during this financial year. That will place the Health Board on a sounder funding basis going forward. And, of course, it will help the Board to develop and transform services in the future. Simon Thomas. Uh, I don't know, First Minister, if you've had a chance to see the Ombudsman's report on the distressing case of Ellie and Chris James of Harford West. Uh, whose son died in Glanguilly Hospital. Uh, there were a host of failings described in that Ombudsman's report, compounded by the, the decision to describe their son's death as stillborn, despite the fact that he had signs of life after being born, and that in itself was as a result of uh, several failings, including, for, for example, failing to monitor um, heartbeat. Um, this is a, happened in Glanguilly uh, with a... Uh, a, a, a young mother being taken from uh, Withy Bush to Glanguilly, a failure to escalate, uh, something we told wouldn't be happening when the services were taken from Withy Bush to Glanguilly, of course. Um, I hope you'll join with me in extending uh, deeper sympathies to the family and the circumstances that they uh, uh, have suffered. But in particular, I'd be interested to know what specific steps, steps you're taking uh, in line with the Ombudsman's conclusions that the Health Board uh, implements the recommendations of this report now, and whether you are taking any further direct action to ensure that there we have the highest standards of neonatal care in our Health Board area. Nobody could fail to be moved by what um, th these parents have gone through. And of course, I join him uh, in expressing my, my enormous uh, sympathy for what has happened to them, of course, uh, and there are all of us I'm sure, in this chamber who uh, will more than empathise with, with the situation that they find themselves in, of course. Well, what should be done as a result? First of all, the Ombudsman's report was clear uh, in its findings that the care provided was unacceptable, by more than one hospital, but unacceptable. The Health Board has accepted the report's recommendations in full. They have sent their action plan to us. Officials will now monitor the actions taken by the Health Board to ensure that the recommendations within the report are implemented. There has already been a great deal of learning and improvement in practice as a result of what is, of course, a very sad case, and we will ensure that that uh, continues. As part of the learning process, I can say that we expect all NHS organisations to reflect on this case to identify any learning to improve case, patient care within their own respective organisations as well. So, yes, how will that uh, will take action. That action will be monitored by us. Question Scythe. Question 7, Beth and Syed. Provide an update on Welsh Government policy in, in relation to the criteria for the awarding of grants to companies. Yes, the financial support we provide to businesses plays a vital role in helping them to start, to sustain and grow, and of course uh, to enable them to deliver wider economic benefit. But businesses receiving such support must satisfy grant terms and conditions, and any breaches uh, may result in the recovery of that grant. Uh, thank you for uh, that answer. You will know uh, that Celtic Wealth uh, Management had a grant uh, from your government for financial services, but instead uh, decided to use that money to rip off uh, steelworkers in the Talbot area and other people with defined uh, pension uh, benefits. Um, this effectively amounts to cold calling and is something that is unethical. I'm wondering why it's taken you seven months to even comment on this in any uh, way, shape or form, and why you are not taking decisive action uh, as a government uh, to root out the problem in relation to this particular firm, which um, if you go on their website, uh, there is now no longer any information on it. There are 44 steelworker, work, steelworkers in my area taking class action against Celtic Wealth Management and other bodies that are involved. If you are going to uh, be delivering grants, why were you not able to check what they were doing before you gave them that grant? And what are you now doing to ensure that this particular company does not receive further money from this government? Well, the, the subsequent practice by a business does not mean they were engaged in that practice when the grant was received. But she is right to say that in 2014, Celtic Wealth Management uh, did uh, receive an offer of financial support. If there has been illegal mis-selling, that would be a breach of our conditions, and we will take action to recover any money that we have given them. 
Now, the first thing that has to happen is there has to be an investigation, to my mind, by the FCA and by the other regulators. They are responsible ultimately for enforcing the laws governing financial services, but we will continue to examine the situation, as I say, quite clearly, if there is a breach of the conditions of the financial uh, support that we have provided, we will take action to recover that money. Susie Davis. Deal, shall we? Um, in your interim annual report on grants management 2016, it states that the permanent secretary was to chair the Improving Efficiency Board with the aim of, and I quote, reducing by bureaucracy by identifying administrative work which is of low value or which could be undertaken less frequently or in a different way or not at all. Uh, the work started in May last year and was to complete in 2018 by being taken on a pace. Has that work now been completed? Um, have there been any financial savings for your government? And if there have been, are, there, are they more or less than you expected? And are you anticipating more applications for grants now that there's more money available to meet them? Well, there's less money because we get less money from the UK Conservative government. So it's not as if there is a sudden windfall of money that we can draw on in order to help, uh, help businesses. But we continually uh, look to improve our offer to uh, businesses in terms of grant funding, particularly to remove duplication, because the temptation sometimes is to create a, a number of different grant schemes in order that different applications are able to fit properly. Now, uh, that can lead to a proliferation of grant schemes in time, uh, and uh, the work that's ongoing uh, is looking at slimming down uh, potentially the number of grants that are available and simplifying uh, the way in which they're applied for. Inhat. So there are now 143 accredited employers paying the real living wage in Wales across the public, private and third sector, helping to address the pay and gender inequalities in the workplace. Um, with the Welsh public sector spending approximately £6 billion annually through procurement, will you update the Assembly on the adoption of the Code of Practice on Ethical Employment and Supply Chains, which commits companies to sign up to consider paying the real living wage? Well, I can say that 86 organisations have already signed up to the Code, uh, which commits public, private and third sector organisations to a set of actions that tackle illegal and unfair employment practices. The four supporting guides that make up the Code contain tools and advice to help put those commitments into practice. They include, for example, tackling unfair employment practices and false self-employment, tackling modern slavery and human rights abuses, implementing the living wage through procurement and uh, blacklisting. All organisations that receive funding from Welsh Government, either directly or via grants or contracts, are expected to sign up to the Code. I can all our question. Finally, question eight, Lee Walter. What action is the Welsh Government taking to make sleep medication for children and young people with neurodevelopmental conditions more easily available? Well, currently, there are no medicines containing uh, melatonin licensed in the UK for the treatment of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders in children and young people. We are guided by the recommendations of NICE and the All Wales Medicines, All Wales Medicines and Strategies Group. Thank you, First Minister. Families with children with neurodevelopmental conditions often report that getting their child to sleep is one of the most stressful and difficult uh, times of the day. One constituent came to see me recently. They couldn't settle their son until four in the morning, causing chaos in the house and stress for the whole family. When children do get to see a specialist, they're often prescribed melatonin as a way of settling them until they get into a routine. But that's not currently licensed for children, and GPs won't prescribe it. Given that in the whole of our health board there's still a waiting list of some 18 months to see a specialist, though this is improving, this does cause great uh, stress for families who are unable to get help from primary care and unable to get to see a specialist consultant. We must do better in offering them something, First Minister, to help them and their families deal with this very difficult condition. Would he look to see what is practical within the constraints and, even, even better, try and remove some of the constraints? And the difficulty is that it's not licensed for use at the moment. Now, medicines licensing is not devolved. Um, the use, once a medicine is licensed, the use of it then is then governed by, uh, by NICE and the Always Medicine Strategy Group. But of course, for GPs, GPs are governed, I, I'm, I know the is over there, but GPs are governed, as I understand it, by rules that tell them what they cannot prescribe, not what they can prescribe. So it is possible for a GP to prescribe uh, melatonin. It's a matter for individual prescribers. There's no restriction on GPs doing that, but of course, any GP is going to ask the question, well, is this something I should be doing? Is it something that I regard as clinically safe? That's inevitable. And they do take clinical responsibility for the medicines that they uh, prescribe. 
the BMA does say to GPs that they should not prescribe beyond their own knowledge or capability, sensible advice, and I can imagine GPs being nervous about prescribing what appears to be an a medicine unlicensed for use in children. The next step has to be to look at evidence to make sure that it is licensed for use in children, and then, of course, to, to move on from there. What I can say, however, in the meantime, we have established a new service to assess, diagnose and provide ongoing support for children and young people with neurodevelopmental conditions, and we are investing £2 million a year to do so. Thank you, First Minister. The next item is the business statement and announcement, and I call on the Leader of the House to make the statement, Julie James. The statement on the best start in life making early years count has been withdrawn from today's agenda. Timings for other items have been adjusted accordingly. Business for the next three weeks is shown on the business statement and announcement found among the meeting papers available to members electronically. Andrew Watty Davis. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. A Leader of the House, could we have a statement uh, either from the First Minister or uh, a letter from the Permanent Secretary uh, outlining um, the way the operational protocol was put in place for the QC led inquiry? Uh, there has been various reports in the media that I would suggest cause grave areas of concern and do need explaining. Uh, I do draw the Leader of the House's attention to some of the comments that refer to Mr. Bowen can only go as far as the Permanent Secretary will allow and the Permanent Secretary acting on behalf of the First Minister, uh, and also the advice that was given to civil service uh, employees last week on the intranet, uh, obviously, that's available to employees in the Permanent Secretary's name, and also the Head of Human Resources and Director of Governance, uh, also causes grave concern, I would suggest. Uh, and I'd be most grateful if, and I'd be guided by you on this, who the appropriate person would be to address this, whether it's the Permanent Secretary herself via letter to Assembly members could clarify some of these areas so that we can have confidence uh, or the First Minister via a statement. And I do hope that the Leader of the House will facilitate such response uh, that can uh, close off some of these areas of concern that have been highlighted recently. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss uh, with the Permanent Secretary the best way of making sure that Assembly members are fully informed as to where we are with the inquiry and what the protocol um, entails. Simon Thomas. Uh, um, last week, uh, Leader of the House, I asked you uh, whether we'd be likely to discuss uh, a legislative consent motion arriving from the EU withdrawal bill, and you assured us uh, that was highly unlikely. Uh, since then, however, um, the uh, Lords have voted in favour of requiring the Secretary of State to pass primary legislation within a period of six months following royal assent of the bill, that's the EU withdrawal bill, to place on public authorities to, uh, a duty to apply EU environmental principles after Brexit and setting up an independent body with the purpose of ensuring compliance. Now, um, those uh, requirements and duties are precisely what was suggested in our amendments to our still extant um, um, Continuity Act, um, uh, uh, long title available. Um, uh, you told us at the time uh, not to press, or we did press the amendments, but they, they were rejected by the government on the basis that you take the first legislative opportunity to do that yourself. Uh, but here we have the Lords, because public bodies, public authorities are not defined as England only. This is the problem. They, they just, just says public authorities. So it could easily be seen in the context of an EU withdrawal bill that is England and Wales in terms of legislative uh, application uh, as applying here in Wales. So we have the Lords suggesting that this should happen. Uh, we have the promise from the Welsh Government of doing another thing. Um, and uh, it, it strikes me that this is, in fact, something that this place should assent, uh, assent to. Except, of course, we can't, because it's all bound up in uh, agreements. If things are ping-ponged and then the Lords and the Government agree, it doesn't uh, get back to the House of Commons, it doesn't get debated again. And, in effect, having been assented to in the Lords, this is now part of the Bill, and us passing an LCM is uh, symbolic, or, or not passing it, as the case may be, is, is symbolic. But I would, nevertheless, be interested to know uh, as to whether the Government intends in, in, in the interest of procedure, but also of visible um, uh, transparency to present an LCM to the Assembly so that we can have our say on this debate. Uh, Plycom is particularly interested because we try to make the amendments, um, but I think other members here are also interested in some aspects of, of this. Uh, and, um, you know, it just draws into attention um, this crazy way of trying to legislate uh, for devolved uh, uh, governments and devolved parliaments uh, when you're actually caught up with a, the, the most archaic 
way possible that Westminster performs its legislative duties and ping-ponging back and forth without the ability of anyone really to have a proper say uh, in things that really imp 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 impinge on our uh, powers. So I, I would appreciate a, a statement uh, on that now. Um, and if I can turn to one other, uh, other matter that's happened uh, this week, which I think is of great relevance to the Assembly. Uh, the Assembly itself voted on a backbench uh, debate, I think it was, to support the legalisation of medical cannabis and the availability of that. We were ahead uh, of the debate in doing that, and recent events, of course, in a very particular uh, uh, um, family, but other epileptic children I know are affected by this, and there's been some very limited prescribing of medical cannabis. The curious thing is the UK leads the world in production, um, development, and exporting of medicinal cannabis, and we can't legislate to have it available for uh, patients themselves. Cannabis is, you know, can be a dangerous drug, and this is a separate argument to whether we should decriminalise cannabis or not for, for the purposes of drug control. But a powerful drug does have medicinal, or powerful drugs have medicinal uh, effects. And if we can allow opiates to be used on a prescription and led by a GP, then why on earth can't we allow cannabis or cannabinoids to be used in a similar way? Now, the UK government has said that it will set up an expert commission to do this, but this is an area in which is devolved in terms of prescription policy and in terms of payment. So are you, can we have a statement uh, uh, from the uh, Health uh, Cabinet Secretary in particular saying how Wales now can get, be part of this debate? It's one thing to have an expert panel in London. We want to be part of that. We want to know how it applies in our communities. And since we have voted as an assembly, I, I assume there would be a lot of support for that to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, well, two very important points. On the um, second point, last is fresh in my mind. I mean, yes, it was very interesting, wasn't it, the swiftness that uh, that, that agenda moved forward uh, in the light of one particular case, <coughs> although actually I'm pretty sure all of us could highlight other uh, cases, perhaps not quite as stark, given what happened, but uh, certainly underlined it. And uh, Simon Thomas is right, we all broadly took that view. Um, I will discuss with the Cabinet Secretary where we are and make sure that he updates members in the most appropriate way, but I know it's a matter of great interest to a large number of us. Um, and I, I was, uh, well, it's always interesting, isn't it, how one single case can suddenly grab the headlines and move a whole agenda forward in, in that way. Um, anyway, that leads me on to the sort of chaotic way of uh, governing that uh, you mentioned earlier, and I couldn't agree more. Um, the LCM issue is a, a um, live issue. We discussed it in business committee this morning. Clara, as you know, um, our current position is that uh, it was made very clear on the floor of the House of Lords and has been made very clear to the government that there is no intention on, of, of legislating on behalf of, uh, of anyone other than Eng England and English public authorities, but I completely agree that the wording is less than optimal, shall we say, and the ping-pong is also less than optimal. Um, I just wanted to be very clear that it was on the basis that we have that assurance that we are not going ahead with an LCM and not on any other basis. Uh, I think it would, we'd also like to make very, sure, uh, very clear, and I know that Lawith um, uh, feels this as well, that uh, we would have wanted to take an LCM to state our view, should it have been the case, that we were not assured that it was uh, 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 out, out of scope that uh, they were going to do it for, for Wales. So um, the, the principle is a very important part, part of it here. But we are assured of that. We've been assured of it as a government, and in fact it was said on, on the as part of the debate, but I actually welcome the opportunity to say now our position is that we, the LCM is not required because we have been assured that they are not intending to legislate on behalf of Wales. In all other circumstances, we would have wanted to, make, to allow this Parliament to make its point of view known so that by the time the bill was ultimately passed, uh, members who were voting on that bill would be very clear what our view was, even if it wasn't uh, in time to, to affect a particular uh, section of the bill, and I know the flower ag ag agrees with that. So just to be very clear on that point, um, but I agree with you, this is not obviously a very good way of dealing with what is the single most important uh, thing that's happened in probably in our generation. Uh, I couldn't agree more. But um, just to be clear on the environmental thing, the um, a statement that I gave holds, we will bring forward legislation at the earliest opportunity, and of course, should they uh, legislate in, in that regard for Wales, then that itself would need an LCM just to be clear, so there would be another opportunity. But the principle is right, and we agree with Simon Thomas. Um, other than for the assurances, we would want to, to make that point very clear as between the parliaments. But we have been given those assurances, and on that basis, we do not think an LCM is necessary. Julie Morgan. Um, 
Jill. Um, there were two issues I wanted to raise. Um, the first one was the issue of um, progress on eliminating hepatitis C. Um, I think 12 months ago we had a very good uh, cross-party uh, debate about um, the aim of eliminating um, hepatitis C in Wales by 2030. And the government um, uh, responded with a series of actions. And um, I wondered if it would be possible to have a statement um, outlining the progress that's been made um, in the different health boards on delivering those actions. And that was the first one. And the second one was, um, um, on the weekend, the UK government um, uh, designated June the 22nd Windrush Day. Um, and um, I wondered if the government itself had any plans to uh, mark that day. I'm Ms. Wall, that's second, and I'd like to say that I'm hosting a Windrush celebration in the Millennium Centre on the 22nd, and I'd be uh, very glad to see a, a large number of Assembly members there. Uh, anyone who can get there would be very welcome. Indeed, it's a very important thing to celebrate the contribution of the Windrush generation, its entire generation, not just the people who came on the Windrush itself, of course, uh, to, to the culture uh, and development of Wales. And they've had a very, very significant role in the culture and development of Wales as a nation, and they certainly deserve to be celebrated uh, for that. In terms of the hepatitis C, uh, a, a patient notification exercise is currently being finalised in order to reach out to patients who were diagnosed with hepatitis C at a time when the treatment wasn't available. A national specification for testing in community pharmacies is being developed at the moment, and targets for our uh, substance misuse services are being developed in order to increase testing in those services. We're currently engaged in negotiations with the pharmaceutical industry to agree a new funding deal for hepatitis C uh, treatments, and we're also engaged with the counterparts in England to consider the details and potential benefits for Wales before any final decision is made. I'm sure the Health Secretary uh, will up update us as soon as those negotiations are complete, and members have been very assiduous in uh, advancing this for her patients. I'm sure the Health Secretary will keep her informed in particular. Mohamed Ashka. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, may I, may I ask for a statement from the Cabinet Secretary for the health on West Government policy towards setting up a fixed rooms for drug addicts in Wales. In November 2016, I raised this issue in the business statement following the news that a pilot project was being set up in Glasgow. The business secretary at the time said it was clearly a very important issue and she was sure a statement would be forthcoming. Now the chief executive of the charity, the Wallach, Earlier this month said the fixed rooms for drug addicts would bring so many benefits, it would be ridiculous not to have them now. Could we have a statement from the Cabinet Secretary on this by the Welsh Government on this very important issue? And I want to know why they are silent for so long, please. Uh, the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary is indicating to me that we did publish a response, but he's also indicating to me that he'll recirculate it to make sure members are kept in that, in that loop. Di Lloyd. Yes, uh, Leader of the House, uh, you may be aware that the Welsh Government last week confirmed that over £36 million of public money has been spent on developing a business park at Valindra in Swansea, yet despite being in public ownership for 20 years, Valindra Business Park remains empty. You may also be aware of other parcels of land in South Wales West which have been labelled as future business parks, but which remain empty. Land in Glyneath, for example, just off the A465, owned by the Welsh Government, but not even included within Neath but Talbot's LDP. Or the infamous piece of land at Baglan, which has been empty for so long that the Ministry of Justice thought that it could be used for another purpose. It seems that there's a major issue in terms of how the Welsh Government is going about investing in these areas, how it goes about targeting sectors and attracting companies to these sites, and how it ultimately is failing to develop jobs in these areas. Now, with the Valleys Task Force looking to deliver even more land for business or industrial use, we are looking at the potential of South Wales being flooded with available industrial land, yet severely lacking in terms of ideas, in terms of how to fill them. So would the Welsh Government therefore commit to bringing forward a statement on how it plans to develop jobs on land that it owns in Wales, and how it plans to move from a position whereby sites are empty to a position whereby sites are actually providing quality employment for local people? Um, well, I don't entirely agree with everything the member said there, but it's a very important point what the Welsh Government does with Welsh Government owned land. We have developed um, a whole set of data points to, um, to be able to identify public owned land, not just Welsh Government owned land, because sometimes it's important to assemble 
sites in that way. Um, and we have been working as part of the Valleys Task Force very much on a project to make sure that we can do just that. Um, the Cabinet Secretary uh, who, uh, who's, uh, for Public Services who's in charge of the Valleys Task Force will, will be making um, uh, updating members on the Valleys Task Force, which will include the issue of Welsh Government owned land and what we can do uh, in order to maximise its benefits uh, as part of his update on the Valleys Task Force shortly. David Rees. Cabinet Secretary, last week the Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and Sport actually issued a written statement outlining the decision to change the boundaries of ABMU and come to health boards. This has some important consequences for my constituents and the Neath Metropolitan Hospital, which is serviced by clinicians from the Bagend area and also many departments are linked and managed by the Bagend side. Now, we haven't had an opportunity to have uh, a Question, to question the Cabinet Secretary on this, and a very much important question on details of finance. For example, how is the deficit going to be allocated? How is the servicing and the funding for the different parts going to be worked out? So all those service agreements. Now, I appreciate that there are elements to be discussed. I want would it possible an oral statement from the Cabinet Secretary so we can explore the opportunities as to who's going to fund this, because we at I attended a carers event in East Metropolitan Hospital last week, and they are fighting for £10,000 just to get some carers services going, and yet we may be talking of larger sums of this just to do this management. Can we have that oral statement so we can explore the details of this proposal to ensure that actually it will, in the long term, continue to deliver for the people in my constituency? Uh, yes, uh, so I'd just like to point out, obviously, that covers my own constituency as well, so members should be aware of that. Um, the Government announced on the 14th of June that from April next year, Comtal University Health Board will be responsible for healthcare services in the Regent County Borough and Council area, as the diary has just said, uh, currently provided by uh, ABMU, and we've, uh, all the Assembly members in the ABMU area, I know, have just received a communication from the Chief Executive there. Uh, about some of the arrangements. The Cabinet Secretary has indicated to me that he's happy to meet with interested Assembly members to discuss some of the issues and to um, uh, tease out some of the specific details. I know a number of Assembly members have indicated a wish for that to happen. Um, and so uh, we'll arrange for that meeting to go forward as soon as possible. Mark Isherwood. Um, I call for, for two statements. Firstly, to uh, add my voice to the voice of Simon Thomas earlier uh, regarding uh, the provision of uh, medicinal cannabis uh, on prescription. Um, we heard of the case, it was well publicised, of Billy and Charlotte Caldwell. You may recall in January I led a debate in the Assembly as Chair of the Cross Party yeah, yeah. Group for Neurological Conditions, highlighting that this wasn't about one person, it was about multiple people with multiple conditions who were already uh, being forced to access uh, cannabis illegally uh, rather than having uh, individually distillated prescriptions uh, to meet their particular needs. After that debate, um, I hosted Billy and his mother Charlotte in this assembly uh, and they told us their story. We heard that Billy used to suffer up to 100 seizures a day until he began treatment with cannabis oil. Following successful treatment in Los Angeles by a children's epilepsy specialist and he became virtually uh, seizure free. On return from Los Angeles, Charlotte told us, he became the first person to be be prescribed medicinal cannabis uh, on the UK NHS. Charlotte has been campaigning for medicinal cannabis from the NHS, recognising the desperation felt by many families fighting to be afforded the same access that she fought so hard for. And she was adamant and remains adamant that this is a separate issue entirely and must not become confused with uh, debates over recreational use or, or broader drug legalisation, a valid debate many, many, people, many people may feel, but not relevant to this debate. She contacted me again in May after her doctor was summoned to a meeting with Home Office officials and told to, to desist writing his prescriptions. After that, I wrote to the Home Secretary, urging him and his officials to urgently contact her to find a resolution uh, and a, a way forward. Well, we heard that the UK government has now set up plans for an expert clinical panel to look at individual cases. Uh, and I know in January I was calling on the Welsh Government uh, to uh, pre put in place preparations within the Welsh NHS for potential prescription uh, here. Uh, but adding to Simon Thomas's comments, I would be grateful for a detailed statement 
acknowledging the issue and detailing uh, how the Welsh Government proposes to address this in alignment with the UK, but also in the devolved context, and hopefully add its voice of support, a voice which sadly uh, wasn't fulsome when I led the debate in January. Secondly, uh, I want to add my voice to calls by Andrew R.T. Davis earlier in questions to the First Minister regarding prostate cancer diagnosis uh, in Wales and for a statement accordingly. On this date, when Prostate Cancer UK has produced uh, figures following a research they've carried out across the UK which don't put Wales in a particularly good light. There are more than 2,500 men diagnosed with prostate cancer each year in Wales. About 600 will die in Wales each year. But I have a letter from the Minister or Cabinet Secretary only last week to a constituent, uh, again saying he can't see any reason why a patient in North Wales with suspected prostate cancer should have to pay privately for an MPMRI scan if they've been found to have a negative biopsy when I've repeatedly told him, and I have numerous constituents who have come to me, who have gone to the Community Health Council, stating they have had to pay and still haven't had justice. And the figures um, referred to by Prostate Cancer UK uh, was a freedom of information request to health bodies across the UK asking about the use of the scans before biopsy. And they found that whereas across the UK only 13% of health bodies were not providing it, the figure in Wales was 50%. And they said 18 months after the promised trial first proved that the MPMRI scans before a biopsy could radically boost detection of prostate cancer. In their words, Wales is lagging behind other parts of the UK in terms of making this breakthrough diagnostic available, putting Welsh men at a disadvantage. Well, let's put some action behind the rhetoric uh, about Wales leading the way and Wales wanting to show the rest of the UK how things should be done. This shouldn't be happening. We need action pre-biopsy, we need action pro-biopsy, and we need these men's voices to be heard at last. Uh, well, thank you, Mark Gishwood, for both of those points. As you said yourself, they've already been aired uh, in, uh, uh, today, and uh, the First Minister answered, uh, gave, you a very, uh, gave a very long response to Andrew R.T. Davis, uh, well deserved in, with such a, an important topic and uh, I had already uh, indicated to Simon Thomas what the position on the med medical camp cannabis is. I'm sure um, that we'll take that forward as soon as possible. Yeah, but... I'm sure the Leader of the House has seen the upsetting images of desperate people slumped over park benches and in shop doorways following the use of various substances. It's not good for anyone, but it's particularly bad for children to witness, I would argue. Now, in the light of recent stories where high numbers of deaths from uh, drug overdoses in some of our former uh, industrial towns, as well as incidents elsewhere, where the problem of county lines drug dealing network has been uh, highlighted. I'd be grateful if we could receive a statement uh, from the government addressing the following points. First of all, the extent that local authorities and health services are able to cope with this uh, issue, particularly given that the county lines uh, networks are exploiting vulnerable people, often homeless people. Secondly, whether the Government supports the North Wales Police and Crime Commissioner Arvon Jones's call for safer injecting rooms to be pilot piloted. International examples show that these rooms save lives. Third, the extent that this Government uh, are working with the non-devolved criminal justice system to address this growing problem. And fourthly, whether the Government shares my view that we need to move away from seeing uh, drug problems as criminal justice matters and instead move it towards public health like they view it in uh, Portugal. And I'd also be grateful to know if the Government shares my concerns and lack of confidence in Westminster's ability to debate these matters in a rational way. Yeah. Um, yes, well, on that last one, starting again, as I always do backwards for some reason, uh, I completely agree with you. Of course, it's, uh, the criminal justice system often makes the situation worse, not better. In my own constituency, it's obvious that uh, particularly young people who are caught up in this need assistance and not punishment. Um, and that's very much part of the debate about the role of the criminal justice system in this. you are very much wanting to catch the county lines uh, perpetrators and not the people who are caught up in the substance misuse. So I couldn't agree with her more. Um, I, I also agree with the uh, safer injection rooms. There's a very good project in Swansea, actually, that, uh, that um, has done the Swansea Drugs Project. <coughs> Um, that has, has very good pilots on that, and uh, the, the outcome is plain to see for everyone. 
Um, substance misuse is a, is a real issue. I myself have just been um, talking to the, uh, um, the MASH here in Cardiff about the best way to approach some of the multi-agency issues. And this is really complex. So it crosses across devolved and non-devolved things, but it also crosses across a whole range of other issues. That I think I've said this before, Sarah, in this uh, chamber, but the MASH here in Cardiff is well worth a visit if you haven't visited it to see what their multi-agency approach to this is. Because it's very, uh, it's very obvious that you need an approach to stop the, um, the organised crime part of it. You need a, a, pu a public health approach for the substance misuse. You need a social response to some of the social issues that are allow people to fall into this situation. It's a hugely complicated picture and we do have a large number of multi-agency responses already. I will discuss with uh, Cabinet colleagues, some of that is in my portfolio, some of it is in others. I will discuss with Cabinet colleagues um, bringing forward some, some statement on how we're coordinating that across the government because it's a very important point. My catches. Uh, is, uh, can I ask for a further update on the Welsh Government action to support people working for Virgin Media in Swansea? Has the Welsh Government Task Force been allowed access to talk to uh, staff and provide details of potential other employ employers? Can I ask a second question? Uh, as the, the uh, Cabinet Secretary is well aware, uh, living in the same area, there's been huge success in the development of Llandarcy, SA1, Swansea Vale and Baglan Energy Park within the former West Glamorgan area. Is it not true that it is beneficial to try and develop one area at a time rather than having them competing against each other? And isn't Belinda next on the list? Um, yes, well, on that point, absolutely. It's important to have a strategy, as I said, across the public realm to make sure that you do optimise the use of that and you don't have competing priorities. And uh, what we don't want to do is have a race over competing investments uh, in a particular area. Um, but it's also important, as I said, to combine the public realm so that you can do land uh, combinations or building and land combinations or uh, road access network and land uh, combinations. So the member's are quite right to... Uh, uh, to point that out. In terms of Virgin, we have been assured as a government that um, employees will have access to time off and support to apply for other jobs where, uh, where that's appropriate to keep their skills and talent in the area. Um, the Cabinet Secretary assures me that we've had good cooperation from Virgin. I will make sure uh, to have a conversation with him to make sure that the pressure is kept up so that we do make sure that uh, the vast majority of those staff have their very highly developed skills retained uh, for the benefit of Wales's economy. Susie Davis. Uh, so with. Um, I wonder if I could ask for one or possibly two statements as this covers two portfolio areas, uh, uh, please. Um, I hope you'll join me in, in congratulating Glasgow, which has just become the first uh, city in the UK to make uh, emergency life saving skills compulsory on the secondary school curriculum there. <laughs> Something their Director of Public Health uh, uh, has, has applauded as leading the way there. Um, as it's also the anniversary of the Cabinet Secretary's statement on the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest plan for Wales, um, I wonder if we could have an update on that, um, covering these four points specifically. Uh, the first is the role of co-responders, who were mentioned in, in the statement a year ago. Um, I'm still waiting for a letter from the Ambulance Trust promised me by the Cabinet Secretary to explain why more recent rumours were circulating uh, that the role of co-responders was going to be diminished rather than included. Um, and also if that we could also hear um, an update on the number of schools that are now taking up emergency life-saving skills voluntarily, the place of progression of uh, emergency life-saving skills on the curriculum that's currently in development. I appreciate that uh, uh, is not the Cabinet <coughs> Secretary for Health. And also whether um, there's been a big upsurge in the registration of defibrillators, being as more and more organisations are themselves deciding to um, provide them. Thank you. Um, yes, I wasn't aware of Glasgow, but I'm obviously happy to uh, congratulate them on that. Um, that's uh, quite a complex area. I'll chase it by you haven't had a response to the letter that you were promised. Um, but I will discuss with a range of Cabinet colleagues the best way to update uh, uh, the Chamber Tower, because that's quite a complicated cross-government piece. Jack Sargent. Uh, uh, firstly, I'd just like to take the opportunity to, to welcome um, Uskol Brindiva to the gallery upstairs. Um, it's actually my primary school, so it's very great to, to see them here today. Uh, um, I'd, I'd just like to move on, Leader of the House, to this weekend. And this weekend is, as many of you know, is the um, great get-together, a, a day inspired by Joe Cox, uh, the late Joe Cox MP. And I'll be holding my own events um, in the constituency in Allen and Deeside, and I, I trust all members uh, from across the chamber will be supporting uh, in their own communities as well with that uh, truly great event. Uh, 
Leader of the House, this Saturday and, and this weekend alone is um, National Women in Engineering Day. As a former engineer, I am keen to see all of our future generations, including women, uh, women enter the industry of engineering and manufacturing. A survey in 2017 indicates that 11 per cent of UK engineering workforce is female. Now, that's up 2 per cent since 2015, but the UK as a whole is still the lowest percentage of female engineering professionals within Europe. Now, I know that the Welsh Government is working extremely hard on this matter, um, but would the Leader in the House join me in paying tribute to those women within the engineering workforce currently and those thinking about going into the engineering workforce and agree with me that we need to do more to change the perceptions and encourage young people, both male and female, um, to consider engineering as a viable and rewarding career in the future? Um, absolutely. Well, in, in the good tradition of doing everything uh, backwards in the order I'm uh, asked in, um, that's very much a matter after my own heart, uh, uh, very much a soapbox of mine. I do chair the uh, Welsh Government's Women in um, STEM, although it should be STEM because it should have computer science on the end, uh, board, and we are working very hard to make sure that we can get good role models out into schools to make sure that um, all our young people, actually, not just women, take up engineering. We could certainly do across the board with more engineers, but particularly more women engineers. And I have discussed with the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Transport um, as part of the Economic Action Plan what we can do to reward companies that particularly target uh, getting more women into STEM, rewarding STEM careers as well. And so I'm delighted that Jack Sargent has highlighted that issue because it's a, a very important issue and no dear to his heart as well. I'm always delighted to welcome schools to our gallery. Flowers, um, I think they were here earlier. I think they've probably gone off for a tour now. They were sitting just opposite me. I, I certainly noticed them. They've probably maybe some already still already there. There's certainly a whole school up there earlier. I'm del always delighted to uh, welcome them. And uh, it's also great to be able to highlight, highlight that it's the Joe Cox uh, great get-together weekend. And I do hope, Flower, that a large number of communities across Wales will take that opportunity to get together and to uh, see that we do indeed have uh, more in common than that which divides us. They're behind you, Minister. Oh, there we are. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Neil McAvoy. Dear Flower, uh, Leader of the Chamber, a couple of weeks ago I asked the First Minister some questions about the New Wales and Borders Rail franchise. But he seemed to completely miss the point of my question. I asked specifically about whether the rail infrastructure itself on the Core Valleys lines was being handed over to a private company. I asked whether the Welsh Government had agreement from Network Rail to hand over the infrastructure to private companies. I asked whether the staff at Network Rail will be handed over to a private company also. Now, I don't want to talk about the trains or to be told that you have some deal with the, with the trade unions. I was asking for passengers who want to know whether rail safety is being privatised by this government in Wales. Because that went very badly last time with the Hatfield disaster. So the, the public really do need a statement on this. Um, rail safety was uh, very much a priority of the Cabinet Secretary in looking at the rail franchise, and he has included it in a number of his statements. But, um, uh, and there are many opportunities for you to question him on it. But I will uh, make sure that the issue of rail safety is highlighted in the, the, the next time rail is discussed in the Chamber. Jane Hutt. Yes, Leader of the House, uh, in February, Welsh Minister stated they were considering making a screening direction to Biomass UK developing the Barry Incinerator under the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Wales Regulations 2017, citing that the char characteristics of the development fall within the EIA regulations. I'm curious what the delay is in progressing the screening, and can um, the Leader of the House um, find out from the Environment Minister uh, whether she would disclose any correspondence with the developer on this matter since February? And secondly, can I have a statement following the National Audit Office report, which concluded that the Department for Work and Pensions has not achieved value for money in its early implementation of universal credit? Last week, two disabled men won their cases, having lost £175 as a result of, of universal credit a week. That is a great concern, of course, because universal credit is now being rolled out in Wales. Um, yes, on that last point, that's, uh, I think we're all very deeply concerned about the fundamental flaws of universal credit, and uh, I, um, we're very disappointed that the UK government is persisting with the rollout given the National Audit Office's um, 
well, really quite scathing report about the effects that it has. Um, so with many members in this chamber have highlighted the issues with universal credit and the hardship that many of their constituents have known more assiduously than, than Jane Hutt. Um, we're very concerned that the high cost of administering use, universal credit uh, outweighs any of its perceived benefits and we're all aware of the number of people who are really pushed towards food banks and so on with the delays in the payment and uh, the various um, well, the various things that people have highlighted around the assessment process and so on. The Minister for Housing and Generation has already written to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to ask for her views on how the alternative payment arrangements can be offered to claimants on the basis of a much more informed choice to help those who are most vulnerable. Um, we know that the, uh, the situation is uh, really very, um, very concerning indeed. And uh, Rebecca Evans, the minister who has overall responsibility for that, is keeping a very close eye on it, has already written on a number of occasions. I will investigate with her whether it's worth writing again in the light of this. In terms of the, um, the uh, Barry biomass, um, I'm aware that residents of Barry have been waiting a long time for the uh, decision in respect to the environmental impact ass uh, assessment. Um, we're currently looking at the environmental information produced by parties, including the developer and the DOTS Incinerator Action Group, to inform a way forward. Um, I'm afraid I don't have an exact timescale, but we are anticipating a decision within the next few weeks, and I most certainly will ask the Minister to write to you with regard to any correspondence with the developer that she's had. We're out of time uh, on the statement, but two very succinct, quick questions. Nick Ramsey. Thank you, Clive. Uh, Leader of the House, this lunchtime I was pleased to host the Agricultural Law Association at an event in the Senate attended by colleague David Melding and a number of uh, other AMs. The subject uh, was the uh, devolution of taxation and the impact uh, of primarily um, stamp duty uh, LTT uh, on rural communities in Wales and agricultural community. I wonder if we could have an update from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Um, on the rollout of tax devolution. Uh, it strikes me that uh, many people still aren't really aware uh, of the mechanics of that devolution. Uh, we've currently seen the issues of the LTT, but obviously next year we have the devolution of income tax, partial income tax as well to Wales. So I wonder if we can update on what um, communication has happened between Welsh Government uh, and people across Wales to make sure that these changes are fully understood and appreciated. Um, yes, actually, we're very pleased with the way that the um, uh, tax arrangements were implemented, the, the historic uh, tax arrangements for Wales, um, because it was all done digitally and it was a very complex project and actually there were no problems at all, which is always uh, a very pleasing flower. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance is always very anxious to uh, have occasions on which he can wax eloquent about tax, so I will certainly discuss with him when his next statement updating the Chamber will be. Equally succinct, hopefully, Jenny Rathbone. Um, at lunchtime, the cross-party group on gambling and the cross-party group on children and young people um, combined to hear um, very important and rather disturbing evidence from Professor Samantha Thomas uh, based on the research she's done in Australia on the way the gambling industry is targeting children and young people. And unless we think that this is a problem confined to Australia, she's also visited um, two schools yesterday um, here in the Vale of Glamorgan and Pontypridd, and where the, the young people were able to identify um, who all the gambling companies are, um, the, the colour of their logo, the jingles and the jokes they use in their advertising. And this is a, what, the way in which the gambling industry is targeting children and young people. Um, and uh, the, in Australia, they've now banned advertising before the 8.30 p.m. watershed. And I wondered if we could have a, a statement from the relevant Welsh minister as to what our policy is going to be to protect children and young people from becoming gambling addicts. Yes, I share the members' concern about this, and we, uh, we discussed it um, quite recently in the Chamber. Um, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and I wrote to the Advertising Standards Agency, and we've had quite a comprehensive response. Uh, so I'll um, investigate what the best way of sharing that with members is, and make sure that it's shared as soon as possible, as it uh, reiterates a number of the issues that Jenny Rathbone just raised. Thank you to the Leader of the House. Just um, apologise to the Chamber for the musical accompaniment uh, this afternoon. We're, um, we think we've identified the source. It's, um, it's wind-related. Um, I'm hoping that it'll cease um, soon. <laughs> Betley, uh, no jokes. I shouldn't have even said, mentioned that. Um, Betley, no we'll move on, therefore, to the statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Services on the Autistic Spectrum Disorder Strategic Action Plan.
and I call on the Cabinet Secretary to make a statement. Von Gethin. The Welsh Government reaffirmed our commitment to improve the lives of autistic people in November 2016 when we published the new Autistic Spectrum Disorder Action Plan, backed by £13 million of investment in new services. Today, we published the first annual report on the delivery of the Action Plan. I am pleased to reflect the achievements of all those involved in responding to the challenges we have set. The real progress made this year reflects on our vision for delivery. Innovation and collaboration have helped to establish a strong basis for future success. The most significant achievement this year has been to establish a national integrated autism service, creating consistent support for people with autism. It has been a time of great energy as new ways of working are established between agencies working in partnership in what is a complex environment. And there was great pride in the achievement that the integrated autism service has opened in Cardiff and Vale, Cum Taff, Gwent and Powys. It will be launched next week in North Wales and will open later in this financial year in Western Bay and West Wales. I am very pleased to see that we are receiving very positive feedback. This includes participants report reporting that this is the first time that they have felt listened to. The progress we are making would not be possible without the support of the ASD National Development Team that is hosted by the Welsh Local Government Association. They published their report today also, and understand that a statement highlighting that has gone around to members from the WLGA. The team is working with regions to develop the integrated service and to promote engagement and good practice across Wales. The team has a long established role in raising awareness of autism, publishing a wide range of resources and information, which is freely available on the ASD Info Wales website. Just two of the team's notable achievements over the last year include. Uh, the extension of the Learning with Autism programme. In addition to the primary school scheme, the secondary school and early year schemes have been launched and are being rolled out. 80 schools have now completed the primary school programme, with nearly 13,000 children becoming autism superheroes. The Can You See Me campaign is also being delivered, aimed at improving awareness of autism in local communities. The campaign film and resources are being rolled out in partnership with local parents, carers and businesses across Wales. And successes so far include awards achieved by the Merthyr Tidville Shopping Centre, MacArthur Glenbridge End Shopping Outlet, and training has been provided to Swansea City Football Club. Although we're making good progress, we know that there is still much more to do. We continue to look carefully at the issues which autistic people say matter to them to inform our future action. Waiting times for assessment is a priority for many, and since 2015 we've invested an additional £2 million a year in, chil in children's neurodevelopmental services, introducing a new 26-week waiting time standard from referral to first assessment appointment, which we are now piloting. We want to make further progress, and this year we're looking at good practice in some areas that is already achieving results in reducing waiting times, with the aim of replicating that success and good practice across Wales. I understand that for parents of autistic children, the most pressing issue is often to ensure that their child is receiving the right educational support to help them achieve their full potential. Earlier this year, the Additional Learning Needs and Educational Tribunal Act was passed. That will pave the way for the transformation of support for children with additional needs up to the age of 25, creating a unified legal framework which will put learners and their parents at the centre of how to plan and meet their needs. The reforms will also focus on skills development in the workforce to deliver effective support for learners and there will be easier access to specialist support, information and advice. And the new system will be rolled out in a phased approach from September 2020. Over this Assembly term, we want to focus all our efforts on delivering the ASD Strategic Action Plan, embedding the new integrated service and delivering on all of our other commitments. I have considered carefully the calls for autism legislation and the proposals contained in the draft Assembly, Med, the draft Assembly Member led Autism Wales Bill. It is clear that we are all focused on ensuring we invest in autism services in the longer term. The difference between us is in how we seek to achieve those aims. I do understand that the prospect of autism legislation that is specific is attractive to many. And it's clear that the intention of the draft legislation, as we have seen it, is to underpin existing duties 
and expectations on public bodies to provide services and support for autistic people. Public bodies are, of course, already required to provide needs-based services for people who require care and support. So autistic people and their carers already have the same entitlement to access services, just as every other citizen in Wales. We're already delivering some much-needed improvements in autism services. I don't believe the costly and resource-intensive legislation will bring additional benefits for autistic people beyond the practical commitments to improve services that we are already completely committed to. In my view, it would be better to invest time and money in ensuring we deliver on our firm commitments and to ensure there is a focus on continuous improvement as the new services that we are putting in place become established. To further support service improvement, I intend to highlight the needs of autistic people and the requirement to meet those needs across statutory services by introducing a code of practice on the delivery of autism services. This is already being developed in partnership with autistic people. It will provide clarity on the support that people with autism can expect to receive and provide guidance on how services can adapt their practice to meet the individual needs of people with autism. We will be consulting on our plans later this year, and I encourage everyone to engage with that consultation to make sure we focus on the issues that really matter. We will also update our delivery plan and reflect the feedback we receive on service delivery. The calls for improvement in autism services are not falling on deaf ears. We are taking action to achieve the improved outcomes that everyone wants to see. We are raising awareness of autism across services, improving access to assessment and diagnosis, and putting in place additional specialist support in every region of Wales. We will continue to listen, and I will keep an open mind on the potential need for autism-specific legislation in the future if it becomes clear through evaluation that the improvements that we all want to see can only be delivered by taking this route. Mark. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for your statement. I have to say the vast uh, amount of uh, autism-related casework my office is handling and the personal stories from outside North Wales we're, we're receiving indicate that huge sums of money continue to be spent getting it, sadly, very, very, and sometimes tragically wrong. How do you respond to concern raised with me that one of the four uh, integrated I, uh, autism and service or IAS uh, areas where the service has been launched is now saying they just want to become a diagnostic service and lose their support workers' function? Another area is already making representations that um, despite already receiving an extra 150 to 170,000 annually from lo local authorities and health boards on top of their IAS funding, um, they can't cope with the level of referrals they're receiving. And these are medical and not social referrals, not focused on prevention and intervention. Concern expressed to me that the majority of people accessing current non-IAS services will disappear or present in crisis. Uh, concern about the lack of numbers being picked up by the IAS uh, and the lack of services from IAS to pick up the slack from third sector bodies um, which are progressively uh, losing uh, local support despite being supported sometimes by hundreds uh, of local members of the autism community. You refer to the 26-week waiting time standard from referral to first assessment appointment. What measures have the Welsh Government put in place uh, when health, uh, to take action when health boards aren't meeting that target? And is the waiting time uh, data being updated quarterly? And if not, what action is the Welsh Government taking? How many autistic people have benefited from employment as a result of the Getting Ahead 2 programme? Did the Welsh Government achieve accreditation in the Positive About Working with Autism Charter last year? And how is it maintaining its accreditation uh, this year and beyond? How many people have accessed the integrated service in each of the four health boards where the service was launched? Which professionals have received uh, awareness training? Uh, and and uh, what are the priority areas as we look forward on that? And of course, uh, in addition to awareness training, which is often led by non-autistic people who are professionals in the medical or caring professions, which has a medical focus, uh, what uh, action are you uh, taking or will you take to address the massive deficit in autism acceptance and equality training led by trainers who are autistic people or, member of the, or members of the autism community 
focused on autistic and non-autistic people working together to overcome the disabling barriers in society. Has the advisory group agreed a work plan? Will the Welsh Government publish that work plan if it has? And how is the Welsh Government responding to the recommendations contained in the interim independent evaluation of its autism strategy and integrated autism service, which found weaknesses and inconsistencies in both assessment and diagnostic services for adults with autism and in support services for adults and children with autism? and said success requires a co-productive approach involving staff, service users and carers in design, implementation and evaluation of an integrated autism service, but there are concerns about the top-down approach, which they said had uh, stifled, stifled this. And with the service being launched in North Wales on the 27th of June, as you said, um, what action would you be taking when you learn of stories, which I raised last week, such as those of the judicial, judicial review uh, proceedings settled uh, recently uh, prior to a full hearing when Flincher Council agreed to provide a formal apology and make a damages award after failing to assess and meet the needs of an autistic young person with additional needs and to take full account of her parent uh, carer's needs. That's just one case. I have, I don't know how many similar cases, um, primarily but not exclusively in Flincher at the moment. How do you respond to the Flincher parent who emailed me yesterday uh, regarding the response to her Flincher CAMS complaint? Uh, which said your daughter uh, doesn't have an ongoing anxiety condition, um, uh, but uh, simply an apology for poor communication, but they've been forced to a private psychiatrist uh, because of lack of care, who has diagnosed the daughter with severe PTSD, depression, and anxiety. As she says, we're now glad we're getting treatment and recommendation for home tutoring, thanks to our private psychiatrist, but my daughter should have received this when she asked Flincher Cams for help six months ago. I've nearly finished, but a key issue is the genderized issue. I've raised this many times, but I'm still almost daily receiving casework where girls clearly requiring autism diagnosis are being told uh, they couldn't possibly have diagnosis. A letter, for instance, from the health board here, it's difficult to marry the me description of difficulties given by some families with information from teaching staff who report no or minimal issues in the school environment. This is not indicative of children with ASD when a wealth of uh, national and international research and evidence directly contradicts that uh, in relation to the masking and coping strategies that many children, and particularly girls, adopt. You say uh, uh, calls no, for I'm authors sorry. and legislation. Sorry. N well, you've had several questions, and you're well into six minutes nearly. So if you can say it within the next 30 seconds, you can get your last question in. How can you possibly bring in statutory duties to provide the support from statutory services that these people and countless others need that you're going to be able to meet the needs with this service? And until and without enforcement of your existing legislation, such as Social Services and Wellbeing Act, how can you possibly tell how well you're doing currently? Minister, and you don't have to answer all that, those yeah. set of questions or we'll be here till tomorrow. Yes. Uh, re regrettably, I, I, I recognise uh, your point, Deputy Presiding Officer. I won't be able to answer the more than dozen different points put uh, with respect to the member and others who will wish to uh, respond. But to be fair, a number of those, the, the points raised are individual ones, uh, and there are some more general ones. If the member wants to write to me with the detail that he set out, uh, then I'll happily ensure that the appropriate person responds to him. Uh, and of course, I will also be at the cross-party group tomorrow uh, to answer questions and have a conversation with people there. I think there are uh, a couple of points that, I, that I'd make in response to, uh, to what the member said. And think about his final point about the need for legislation or otherwise. Uh, and actually, you partly answered what you were saying about the enforcement of uh, existing duties that are already set out and the challenge in making those rights real. And part of what we are seeking to do, investing in the integrated service, is to make that real. It's also what the Code of Practice is aimed at trying to highlight and to try and make real for families. So this isn't a way of uh, trying to say that we think that you are wrong and the uh, examples you are raising are not true. I recognise that for lots of families, this is a real and significant challenge for children and adults with autism too. And this is about how we actually make sure they really do get to achieve their potential. And I have some personal insight into this as well from my own family. So I do understand that this is not uh, an easy challenge that should be glibly dismissed or glossed over. That's why 
even in these most difficult financial times, we invested £13 million into the service. It's why we should all take some pride in the role of the integrated service. And the feedback that we told is direct feedback from families themselves about the difference that the service has already made. And that is a real difference. It is not simply uh, something uh, concocted or a, or a work of fiction to try and get through a challenge here. Our challenge, though, of course, is not just about understanding what has been successful where the service has been rolled out, but to understand how we try and adapt and apply that learning to the areas where the service has not yet been rolled out. It is also in accepting that there really is positive feedback at the integrated service to recognise that it isn't perfect. No, no human service ever is. But to understand how those examples of the service has not met the needs of, the, of those individuals and their families, how we learn from that to inform improvement. Because that is the point. There will not be a standstill time. I will have more to say on waiting times after the pilot has been completed. Uh, and I will, of course, uh, make sure that that is publicly available. I, my hope is that they become official statistics, in which case they'll be ready available on a month-to-month -month basis for all members to scrutinise. But no doubt we'll continue to discuss these general themes, not just today, but for a significant period of time to come. In particular, as I expect that the member will be producing his bill uh, before we, we go into summer recess. Thank you very much. I'll try and keep my comments brief. I think that I have about four questions here. In terms of the statistics that are gathered, a target has been set of 26 weeks in terms of, of what we're waiting for, assess, for the first assessment, and the data is being gathered. And when? Are we going to have this data being published? Because any data that's available has to be published. In terms of passing the ALN bill, the concerns about the lack of resources to support that bill have been very evident. Could the Cabinet Secretary explain which resources the Government intends to provide to support local authorities in implementing that bill? There is a piece of legislation that's starting its journey through the Assembly and the statement has rejected the idea of legislating and cost is one of the main arguments against that legislation. Will the Cabinet Secretary accept that the legislation itself won't cost anything. That is, the cost will stem from any financial implications stemming from including that or the content of the legislation that will mainly deal with the ensuring the right to have rights legis uh, legally. If you intend to meet those objectives by improving services, there is no real additional cost, but at least having legal guarantees, and this is where legislation is useful, legal guarantees will give some certainty to a minority group that their, their services won't be the first to go every time local authorities face financial challenges. I think that's the third one. So the fourth one, the statement doesn't mention uh, employment. Just 16% of adults with autism are in full-time work, employed work, and only 32% are in any kind of employment. Now, could the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary provide more details about how you intend to uh, reverse this situation? Because years of partnerships and encouragement aren't working, obviously. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you for the questions. On on your final point, there's a recognition that we seek to achieve a cultural change. This isn't simply about uh, families uh, with people with autism. It's actually about the support they receive in workplaces and the attitudes of different employers. And within the, uh, the reports published today, you see uh, direct examples of people who have been helped by the service to remain in employment, if they are in employment, or to seek employment as well. The challenge is how we don't set up, set up a service to fail, but how uh, this is part of wanting to change our national conversation and try, trying to change the amount of practical support that is available to businesses and to their employees. But I recognise there, there is a significant road to travel here, a significant road to travel, just as there are in a number of other areas, but that is part of the commitment that we've set out in the integrated service. Um, I'll deal with your point about waiting times now. The 26-week target, there'll be more information available 
uh, internally within the government this autumn as we look again at the rollout of the waiting time standard. Uh, and we need to be certain before we roll out the target and we start publishing information that it is robust and reliable. Uh, all of us have had experience in the past of uh, trying to roll out uh, waiting time standards with them not being available and then with them not being ready in the robust way in which they should be rather and that then causes a lack of confidence what the figures are. I'm not trying to hide the figures, I'm trying to make sure they only come out when they look good for them. I'm really interested in making sure that they're actually generally reliable, because I expect there'll be variation and learning between different parts of Wales, but I want to make sure they're robust and they can be relied upon and they help to drive some improvement in measures that actually matter and have real impact for families. On your point about um, the cost of legislation, there is always a cost of legislation, not just the cost of this place in the mechanics uh, of running. Uh, but there's a challenge in terms of the cost, in terms of the time and resource that is available uh, to practitioners, to the policy team here centrally, and what that then means in terms of diverting that attention to go into a legislative process as opposed to being focused on improvement. Uh, and legislation won't produce more money. We will still have the sum of money that we have available to the government, and we'll still have to make choices about that together with our partners in other services. Uh, and I'm most interested in understanding the people delivering the service and taking part in what the difference it's made and what our real prospects are for delivering the sort of improvement that, as I say, each of us in this room would want to see. Um, your point about statutory services, we already have statutory requirements uh, for, our, uh, for ourselves, the health service, local government partners to achieve and to deliver on. We need to make sure those are made real, and that's part of the reason why I'm moving forward with the code of practice, because I do recognise that there will be people who will understand or tell their own story about what has happened, about where the needs have not been met, in the way which we envisage the legislation would do so. I think we need to get that legislation right and make those rights real, and that would, could and should make a real difference to those families as well. Caroline Jones. The Arctic, uh, thank you for your statement, Cabinet Secretary, and for providing an advanced copy of the ASD Strategic Action Plan Annual Report for 2017-18. I am pleased that the Welsh Government are investing in services and that progress is being made. However, the evaluation of the Integrated Autism Service and the Autistic Spectrum Disorder Strategic Action Plan Interim Reports by Dr. Holtem and Lloyd-Jones from People and Work make it clear that there has been a failure to drive systemic change and help create a postcode lottery of support for adults on the autist autism spectrum. This is not news to any of us who have been campaigning for an Autism Act. The Welsh Government might have good intentions, but people living on the spectrum are not seeing delivery on the ground. Despite the rollout of the Integrated Autism Service, many parts of Wales still have no clear pathways to diagnosis. The interim report highlighted the fact that although funding has not been an issue when it comes to establishing the new integrated service, the regional partnership boards had little capacity for developing the service. The fact that the first integrated autism service was, es was established appears to be down to the hard work and dedication of the national ASD lead. But as the interim port report highlights, this is a lot of strain to place one person under. Success or failure shouldn't rest upon the actions of, of a single individual. Cabinet Secretary, what actions are you taking to ensure that future rollout plans are not reliant on a single individual, no matter how talented? I recognise that one of the key achievements of the Strategic Action Plan was the introduction to the 26-week waiting time target for neurodevelopmental assessment. Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm that this target is being met by all health boards? If not, do you have a timescale in place for when you expect all health boards to meet their targets? And finally, Cabinet Secretary, while I remain unconvinced that Wales does not need an Autism Act, I am prepared to work with you in order to deliver improved services for people in Wales on the autism spectrum, and hopefully in 12 months' time you will have convinced me that legislation was indeed unnecessary. I look forward to seeing what progress can be made in the coming year. Deal. 
Uh, yes, thank you for the comments. I, I think I've dealt with the, the challenges and the points about waiting times already, and I recognise what you say about um, your current view on legislation, but being open to the possibility that we are able to make sufficient improvement the prospect for more, the legislation may not be something you would support. And I think there is a challenge here about the practical purpose of the legislation that Paul Davis is minded to introduce. Um, and as I say, it's about a, a shared uh, objective about improving services, about making sure there is great certain, greater certainty for families about support that they can expect, and to make sure that the needs of people with autism are properly met. And that is why the integrated service that operates in four regions is important for us, because think about the practical services we will need to deliver, the experiences of those families in those areas interacting with the service, their awareness of the service, and equally the, the, uh, the frontline staff that we will need to deliver that service. To be fair, you made points about staff as well, and not in particular not relying on a single individual to deliver the whole service, and I recognise that. Uh, an individual, uh, a service wholly reliant on an individual uh, is, no, is not uh, sustainable or uh, is, is, is not a sustainable model to roll out across the country. We can, though, say that the integrated service is seeing a welcome increase in autism expertise as more clinicians are being recruited. The model that we've provided is actually more, more attractive to staff who want to come into it to work in a way that is joined up with other health and care professionals. And crucially, we're seeing families respond to that and recognise that they, that they are are having their needs listened to and met. As I said earlier, that will not always be perfect, but it is a, a real improvement that we are delivering. And you mentioned the interim evaluation report. Um, and again, it honestly reflects there were differing visions and priorities at the start, but those are largely resolved, and that each region where the service has rolled out are proud of their achievements and recognise they've made a real difference. And that's the point. We want a service that won't just be something that a politician can stand up and celebrate and wave around an annual report, but a service that people would recognise, who, people who work in that service, uh, people who interact with that service and take part in the services that are provided, that is making a real difference to the difference that all of us wish to see for these families. Thank you. Jenny Rathbone. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, thank you very much for your um, uh, report. And um, it's very heartwarming to know that um, there's good work going on with our schools to ensure that they are as inclusive as possible. Uh, where possible, we need to be um, including uh, young people with autism into mainstream schools. But where it's not possible, we obviously need to ensure that we have excellent services for those with the greatest disabilities. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely to be welcomed. I just wanted to ask you about the services available for, people, for adults um, with, on the autistic spectrum. Uh, one of the uh, voluntary organisations that work with people with autism is Autism Spectrum Connections Cymru, which is um, based in the city centre of Cardiff, uh, in my constituency. And, um, they mainly support people with Asperger's. Um, they've had lots of, uh, hundreds of referrals, mainly from Cardiff and the Vale, uh, but also from other South East Wales uh, local authorities. Uh, because I think um, whilst assessment is important, um, support services are also important. Uh, one of the examples you gave in, in the, well, that was given in the um, ASD development team's annual report was um, support to ensure that employers and employees uh, where the employee has autism um, understand the needs of each other um, and and um, there was a, a case study there which is uh, very good um, that was done by Cardiff and the Vale and I'm sure there's a lot more work needed to be done there um, but I think my main question really is how integrated is the National Integrated Autism Service in relation to prudent healthcare and operating with, both with people who have autism as well as the voluntary organisations who support them. And, um, you know, what role does the voluntary sector play in delivering the Autism Strategic Action Plan? Uh, how does the um, Autistic Spectrum um, Development Team uh, decide which um, uh, voluntary group they work with and which ones they fund because the um, Autism Spectrum Connections Cymru doesn't receive any funding at all even though they're obviously supporting hundreds of people. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, yeah. I think look, you raise an interesting point. In the uh, examples, the real examples in the 
uh, and the National ASD Development Team report, you'll see a range of different age ranges in there, from children to, uh, to teenagers, uh, to adults and older adults as well, and about how they've been helped at various different points through their life stage, uh, and actually that lots of people go through life um, without having a diagnosis of the, the potential support that can mean, and lots of people manage to cope, and it's about what coping looks like, and that's actually still allowing someone to achieve their potential. Um, and there's a challenge there about having um, a diagnosis that we will find difficult later in life as well. The challenge about how integrated the service is, though, is still about understanding the needs of the population and understanding how those needs are met. And I'm sure there'll be a variety of third sector groups that will be providing services and support. Uh, and as ever, there is a challenge about how those services are run, funded, uh, and, uh, and then signposted between different people. And lots of people in the third sector don't look for money. They look for an acknowledgement of what they do and that they're part of being the answer. I couldn't comment on the particular organisation you refer to and their, uh, the fact that they aren't funded through the service. If you want to have a specific conversation about that, I'd be happy to do so. Um, but I don't want to get into a more general point, because I, what I don't want is that there's somehow... Sometimes when you announce money around a service, it's as if people to bid into that service, as opposed to how do you make the whole service work to deliver against the needs of the population. That's what I'm most interested in. If you think the, the particular group that you refer to could be part of that answer, then I'm happy to have uh, a conversation with you about that. Thank you. Paul Davis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has said today, he is, of course, aware of my intention to bring forward primary legislation to help improve the lives of people living with autism in Wales. And I'm very disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary in his statement today is currently ruling out the need for primary legislation and I would urge him to reconsider his position because it's clear from the two consultations I've held that there is over overwhelming support for a bill and I hope therefore that he and the Welsh Government will reconsider their position and engage through the legislative process and help deliver an autism bill that this institution and the autism community can be proud of. Now, I accept that the Welsh Government has made some progress in some areas, although I think it's clear that the Welsh Government's introduction of a code confirms the fact that the current strategy clearly isn't meeting the needs of the autism community. The autism community has overwhelmingly made it clear that they favour legislation given their responses to my consultation. Therefore, does the Cabinet Secretary at the very least agree that the views of service users in Wales must be at the heart of any direction of travel for autism services in the future. The Cabinet Secretary has today made it clear that he intends to introduce a code, and of course the problem with introducing a code is that it can always be uh, revoked and it cannot be changed or amended by this Parliament once it is presented to this place. However, my proposed autism bill will enable members to amend the legislation through the legislative process uh, and an act will ensure a level of permanence to the delivery of services as well as giving autism a statutory uh, identity. And so perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can tell us how he believes a code will address these concerns and how a code will deliver the improvements in services that the autism community want to see. And, and finally, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, given that the Government does not believe in the currently introducing legislation, can he confirm that the government will therefore be giving its backbenchers a free vote when my bill travels through the legislative process, given that some of his colleagues have been supportive of placing services on a statutory footing. Now, on the final point, any legislation that comes through uh, this place, uh, the government won't, um, at this early stage, be negotiating or outlining uh, how we'll look to work with uh, members of our own group, with members who support the government. We need to see the detail of any legislation and to take a view on it, Paul. Uh, and it's important that we do that. And I think people would uh, agree with the fiction that there's somehow not a view on it. And I'm being honest about this. We've had an honest disagreement about the right way forward to improve the lives of people with autism. Um, and we can continue to disagree, but I don't want to set out uh, that level of disagreement or the nature of it in a way that isn't honest. I don't want to try and say something here that you and I know that I wouldn't really uh, agree to do and support. Part of our challenge is that uh, legislation in England, I can't see any, any real evidence that it's led to a significant and sustainable improvement in services. And so I'm looking for whether legislation will really deliver and deliver the sort of improvements you and I both want to see 
and we have better way to do that than the path we set out with the resources we have already made available. I think lots of people um, have uh, a lack of faith that politicians will deliver on their promises. And sometimes that leads to people saying, change the law and that will make sure that services happen. Actually, it still requires a variety of different decisions to be made. And that includes the budget choices we've made and it includes the work we've already done with different partners to deliver the four integrated services that are making a real and positive difference to families uh, in those four parts of the country that we're uh, committed to rolling out. And in terms of um, the code and the point and the purpose, well, you know as well as I, because we've had these conversations in the past, um, that the code is about trying to make sure that we deliver on the responsibilities that actually uh, exist already within statute and make sure that they're real rather than loser or simply talked about and pointed at a piece of legislation but not made real for people. Uh, and I know from my previous life, uh, I'm a lawyer in recovery as opposed to a lawyer who's been dragged back into it. Look at my poor misfortune colleague, Jeremy Miles. Um, I used to be a lawyer. And so I'm, I'm well aware that uh, in dealing with the law, the rights that people have are only real if you can enforce them. And what does that mean? And it's always better to help to give people advice so they can actually deal with their rights and responsibilities uh, in a way that doesn't require the involvement uh, of lawyers. And there's a challenge about making sure that it's a real way of working and the culture change that we talk about, that's what we're trying to deliver and make sure that leads to an improvement in service. And on your point about the, uh, whether people should be at the centre of our direction of travel, yeah, that's absolutely right. You see that in a range of different areas across the government, a range of different activities. That's why when I... Uh, in my initial statement, I made clear that people with autism are part of helping to us to draft uh, the code that we're looking to. So we'll continue to involve people with autism. We're continuing to listen to them, their real lived experience, to make sure that the shared objectives we have are being delivered upon. That's the aim and objective of this government, and that will continue to guide us in our approach to services and any future debate about legislation. There have been some really good questions raised today, some, some good points made. I, I want to focus on, on two, two things, really. G generally, this government makes policies sound good, they're, they're lovely buzzwords, but the reality at the, at the sharp ends and the front line is somewhat different. I wanted to focus on, firstly, on integrated autism services and referrals, because in, in RCT there have been none. In Powys, there have been none. In Cardiff, 10. And in Gwent, 130. So f the, f the first thing is, how do you explain the disparity in that and what can be done to, to improve matters? Secondly, the autism aware businesses, which, which sounds really good uh, on paper, it, it sounds good listening to it in the chamber, but I wonder if you could outline to everybody in the chamber and the public exactly what you have to do to become and autism aware business. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, there's, there's training support provided to businesses to become autism aware. I'll, I'll, happily, uh, I'll happily send the notes uh, from the annual reports about those businesses that have done, the ones that I've mentioned in my statement, but the sort of training that they've undertaken to become autism aware businesses. Uh, and again, it will depend on the nature of the business about those people and what they're doing and their interactions. So I'll happily send the notes on. I'll happily send a note. The statement. I'll happily send the note. No, on. No, he doesn't know. Like. Like. I'll happily send the note on what that looks like, rather than getting into a row on an important issue across the chamber. And, in, and, I, and I don't quite recognise the figures that you've quoted on the activity of the integrated autism services in the reports being published today. You can see that the nature and the range of different activity that's undertaken by each of those integrated services. Uh, and so, you know, each, each area you find people coming into the service, being supported and achieving different outcomes. Uh, I'm a little puzzled about the figures that he's provided. Uh, if he wants to write to me, send out where he's got this from, I'll happily respond to him uh, and make sure that there is a level of clarity about that too. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Item four on the agenda this afternoon is a statement by the Leader of the House, Refugee Week, Wales and Nation of Sanctuary. And I call on the Leader of the House, Julie James. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This week is Refugee Week, a celebration of the contribution that refugees make to our society and an event to encourage better understanding between communities. This year is the 20th anniversary of its launch and Refugee Week organisers are asking people to take part by doing one simple act to support refugees. This can be as simple as having a conversation with a neighbour who is seeking sanctuary or learning a few words of the language from a refugee's country of origin 
All of us here in this chamber could do one very important simple thing, and that is to show our support for refugees and asylum seekers in Wales by embracing the concept of Wales as a nation of sanctuary. I hope that some of you were able to hear from the wonderful Oasis World Choir before plenary today. The choir is comprised of refugees and asylum seekers from across the globe, and they have come here today as part of Refugee Week. Some of them were in the gallery earlier, and uh, I think they're probably not anymore. Uh, but I'm sure that members will want to uh, join me in welcoming them here to the Senate. The Welsh Government's Nation of Sanctuary Refugee and Asylum Seeker Plan has been developed in response to the recommendations made by the Equality Local Government and Communities Committee report, I used to be someone, asylum seekers and refugees in Wales. The plan is currently out for consultation. It has been co-produced by the Welsh Government, refugee support organisations, public sector organisations and most importantly, asylum seekers and refugees themselves. We are fully committed to doing everything we can in Wales to support people seeking sanctuary to rebuild their lives and fulfil their potential. Wales is a welcoming nation. It is immediately ap apparent from talking with people seeking sanctuary and those that support them that most refugees who come to Wales are extremely grateful for the support they receive here. We can be proud of that fact. Nevertheless, we still have much to do to ensure refugees and asylum seekers can integrate effectively and rebuild their lives. As a government, we are committed to equality of opportunity and upholding human rights. We believe in the fair treatment of every person, especially those who are most marginalised and have most difficulty accessing the help they need to meet their basic needs. The Welsh Government firmly believes that the integration of refugees and asylum seekers should begin on day one of their arrival. This approach is essential in ensuring the best possible outcomes for individuals and communities. We know there is strong public support for recent arrivals to learn English or Welsh, or both, bearing in mind that many refugees have excellent language skills, and we want to support them to do this. Supporting volunteering schemes for asylum seekers and refugees would contribute to Welsh society whilst also supporting language acquisition, improving mental health and increasing the employability of individuals. We are aiming for a holistic approach where the actions in the plan complement each other to achieve overall positive change for refugees and asylum seekers. It is important to emphasise that integration of people seeking sanctuary is not all about one-sided giving. Refugees bring a wealth of experience and a range of skills and abilities to Wales. The NHS in Wales has benefited from the Welsh Government-funded Wales Asylum Seeking and Refugee Doctors Group. This is delivered by the Wales Deanery and Displaced People in Action, supporting refugee doctors to have their existing medical qualifications recognised and find employment in the NHS. This scheme is estimated to have saved taxpayers at least £25 million over the last 15 years, empowered refugees to utilise their skills to give back to Wales, and saved countless lives too. Some of the issues raised by the Equality Local Government and Communities Committee inquiry in 2017 can only be resolved by the Home Office. It is no secret that we are often frustrated by the UK Government's decisions in relation to asylum and migration matters, but we have to accept that these matters are not devolved to Wales. Nevertheless, we have advocated for increasing financial support for asylum seekers awaiting decisions, additional money for local authorities to support asylum seekers in their area, and improved asylum accommodation standards, amongst other issues. Unfortunately, to say the least, the UK Government does not appear to have incorporated our recommendations in the design of their forthcoming asylum accommodation contracts or significantly increased financial support in the asylum system. We will do what we can to mitigate the negative effects of UK Government policies on community integration in Wales and will seek to work constructively with the Home Office to identify and raise concerns where they arise. Our Nation of Sanctuary plan focuses on proposals within the devolved areas which the Welsh Government can influence. The plan outlines the breadth of work which we are undertaking to ensure that the inequalities experienced by refugees and asylum seekers are reduced, their access to opportunities increased, and that relations between these communities and wider society are improved. We have prioritised the key issues which refugees and asylum seekers talk to us about during preparatory work for this consultation. This includes ensuring individuals can access information and advice to help them orientate themselves to new surroundings, supporting opportunities to learn the language and to find employment, finding ways to avoid destitution and improving access to health services. In developing the actions, we have sought to prevent the most harmful problems experienced by refugees and asylum seekers in Wales. These include homelessness, mental health conditions, poor accommodation and the risk of destitution. We have already made some encouraging progress in some of these areas, but there is much work still to be done to improve outcomes. We are, considering, we are continuing to consider improvements 
that we can make to support those seeking sanctuary, including looking at extending eligibility for education grants and concessionary transport to asylum seekers. These are complex and delicate areas where a rush to extend eligibility could have unintended consequences for asylum applications. We also need the UK Government to recognise our desire to ensure that all members of Welsh society can integrate and agree not to undermine this intention by placing Welsh Government funding streams on the list of prohibited public funds in the immigration rules. We are committed to the principle of extending entitlement in the interests of community integration and personal well-being, but we need to work through potential issues carefully to ensure that we make things better for people at risk of destitution and not worse. Our work continues in respect of our support of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. While we were ultimately not asked by the UK Government to welcome as many children to Wales under the Dubs scheme as we planned for, we have been able to provide safety and a fresh start for a small number, and we wish them well in their lives here. Together with the Minister for Children, Older People and Social Care, and with our counterpart ministers in the Scottish Government, we have lobbied the UK Government regularly on a range of matters about these children. The replies we received have not been as positive, proactive or as helpful as we would have liked, I'm sorry to say, Deputy Presiding Officer. Nevertheless, we have made progress on the actions recommended by the Equality Local Government and Communities Committee in relation to these children, and we will continue to do so. As I mentioned, the Nation of Sanctuary Plan is currently out for consultation, and the plan will continue to be developed and be amended to reflect the responses and suggestions received when the consultation period closes next Monday, the 25th of June. The plan comprises actions which we are seeking to take in the remainder of this Assembly term. Therefore, it forms an important part of a long-term aim for Wales to be a true nation of sanctuary for refugees and asylum seekers. There is a Refugee Week stand in the Oriel this week, including a new film produced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission and an opportunity for members of the public to state what simple act they can do to support people seeking sanctuary in Wales. And I was very pleased that we were able to do that this lunchtime together, Deputy Presiding Officer. I urge you all to visit the stand and include your own act. I would also like to thank the members of the Oasis World Choir who came here today to sing for us. Let us demonstrate to them how democracy can work to benefit all the residents of a nation and that Wales, a small nation, punches above its weight when it comes to providing sanctuary. Dioch. Thank you. Mark Isherwood. Uh, yeah, well, thanks very much for your statement in uh, Refugee Week. And I don't think you're going to find any real disagreement with uh, the information and the sentiments that you've expressed. Uh, you say that all of us in the chamber here uh, should do one simple thing to show our support for refugees and asylum seekers by embracing the concept of Wales as a nation uh, of sanctuary. I'm pleased that I ensured that was in our 2016 Welsh Conservative Manifesto uh, as a commitment and, as you might recall, I sponsored and uh, hosted the Sanctuary in the Senate event at the back end of uh, 2016 accordingly. Uh, you refer to support for unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. When we had a, a, a statement in I think, November 2016, it was the time we'd heard that the horrible jungle camp in Calais was closing down and that the British and French governments were registering unaccompanied children who were hoping to join relatives in, in, in the UK. And I then asked whether the, the Welsh Government had any indication of um, whether those figures or the figures provided were accurate or how many of those children had or were coming to Wales. I'm wondering, do you have any better, more up-to-date information now, uh, or 18 months down the road, um, over whether uh, and in what volume or what number uh, those children arrived here and what particular support they might have received? Um, you refer to the integration of refugees and asylum uh, seekers. Again, you might be aware, um, early last month I hosted an event in the Assembly um, for the uh, Let Us Integrate Through Music and Art, uh, put on by the North Wales Association for Multicultural Integration, of which I'm honorary president, and Cumbran-based Kiran, a knowledge-based intercommunity relationship and awareness uh, network um, born, they say, out of necessity to have an engaged community where members have knowledge of different socio-cultural uh, backgrounds. And only two weeks ago, I had a meeting here with the Welsh Refugee Council, uh, North Wales Association Multicultural Integration, and the charity CAIS, who are working in partnership to break down barriers and increase understanding of each other's cultures. So in terms of supporting the integration message, how are you engaging with these trailblazing organisations which are doing their own bit and increasingly building a joined up network themselves to deliver that integration uh, message in practice in our, in our communities and on our, on our streets uh, uh, and in our, um, 
uh, rural areas to across Wales. Sadly, as you know, uh, some uh, refugees and asylum seekers become victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. And I know I'm slightly going off piste here, but there are a number of charities again working in this area, uh, including Haven of Light in North Wales, who are having a modern slavery forum on October the 12th. So in terms of this agenda, how are you engaging not just with the commissioner, but with the other agencies working together, statutory and third sector, um, regarding the particular refugee and asylum seeker issues uh, applying to this, this group of victims? And my final question uh, relates to uh, acceptance of refugees. The figures uh, published for refugees resettled in Wales last year show that uh, Merthyr Tydfil and Neathport Talbot were the only councils that accepted no refugees in the figures they provided, whereas Carmarthenshire was highest with 51, Swansea with 33, um, and North Wales, Denbyshire 21, uh, but falling to five in Flinch and only two in Conwy. So how are you helping local authorities uh, establish this understanding, awareness, the critical mass, um, and the will to ensure a, perhaps a better distribution so the lead established in one part of Wales can be replicated elsewhere. Thank you. Leader of the House. Um, well, thank you for that series of questions. I don't have the exact number uh, here, so I'll write to the member about the exact number of um, children that were under the dump scheme. But there, there were some serious issues around... Uh, um, why we weren't able to take as many as we like. But I'll, I'll make sure that the member uh, has a communication about the exact number. Um, we've, we have worked extremely hard to make sure that we work together with our stakeholders to ensure that we have as integrated a, a, a set of um, responses as possible. We've um, delivered on the ELGC committee inquiry recommendation to train social workers, for example, in the age assessment of children and young people. And earlier this year, five sessions were held across Wales and nearly 100 social workers and advocates have been trained. And there's a tool which accompanied the training which is being revised and will be published soon as a result of our engagement with stakeholders as we work very hard to make sure that we have as much as possible a seamless response. We also work very hard to make sure that we do uh, integrate the learning from the Modern Slavery Action Plan for that. And of course, Wales has been in the forefront of having the Modern Slavery Coordinator, and we have our regional coordinators working hard as well to ensure that we have as, uh, as up-to-date a stakeholder plan as possible. Um, but in the end, this is, uh, migration asylum policy is not developed to the Welsh, Welsh Government, and many of the solutions to many of the difficulties faced by asylum seekers and refugees have to be found by the Home Office. I mean, the real issue for us is how to reduce the impact and prevalence of destitution, the non-devolved welfare system and asylum decisions and eligibility for funding, all of which are real driving factors behind these, uh, those living in this situation. We're very disappointed at the lack of uh, cooperation on the new accommodation contract, for example. And just very recently, we've um, having to lobby the UK government yet again along with Scotland because the UK government has not wanted us to set up a panel of experts to help inform decisions on the uh, accommodation strategy, Deputy Presiding Officer. So we are very disappointed with that um, because uh, we think that um, saying it's commercially confidential is clearly not the right way forward for that. And one of the big issues with integration is ensuring that asylum seekers and refugees are placed in accommodation in the right communities with the right support around them. The member did raise why there is um, patchy uh, take up in the stats that he quoted, but of course they're not the ongoing stats. So uh, Neith Talbot, for example, has taken a large number of, uh, of people in the past. Um, and there are issues around the funding as well, because only around 55% of the funding is available. And there's a big issue with um, uh, the Barnet formula and the way that some of the schemes have been put together so that Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland don't access some of the funding that's available. So we have worked very hard to make sure that the UK government understands that sometimes the juxtaposition of several policies has unintended consequences for people in this category. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The aim of creating a nation of sanctuary in Wales is one that Plaid Cymru supports, of course, and supports fully and will campaign for, but I do think it's important to recognise that there are a number of barriers in trying to deliver that ambition. Many of those barriers emerge from the way in which the public debate on migration has far too often been steered by prejudice, misinformation and incoherent 
thoughts now any attempt to integrate asylum seekers and refugees must recognize that and try to create a cultural change as well as a political change. So can you outline what your government is doing to put right this prejudice and perception? Now, today's statement acknowledges that many of the problems facing refugees and asylum seekers come about as a result of issues that emerge from the Home Office. For example, we know that visas have been rejected to over 2,000 doctors in accordance with UK migration policy. Unfortunately, your party has refused to allow the Welsh Government to issue visas based on the needs of the Welsh workforce, sparing the grave need for doctors in Wales. Are you willing to reconsider your position in this area? Changes to benefits and the introduction of the universal credit will have a far-reaching impact on the lives of refugees. The Welsh Refugee Coalition have stated that we need to find ways to mitigate the negative impacts of welfare reform on refugees as well as monitor that, and you will know You've heard me saying on a number of occasions that dev devolving elements of the administration of the welfare system would enable us to Wales to mitigate some of these ill effects and create a more humane system. So can I ask you once again to look carefully at those possibilities and to learn lessons from Scotland? I believe that refugees and asylum seekers would welcome a commitment from your government today to at least consider this possibility and to bring a full report to this assembly which would look in detail at the benefits and disbenefits of this. We haven't had that thorough analysis to date and I think it would be beneficial to have that. Your statement mentions accommodation for refugees and at the moment the Home Office is deciding what private provider will provide accommodation to asylum seekers in Wales over the next 10 years. So can you outline what the Welsh Government intends to do to ensure that the quality of that accommodation is improved and that the provider itself is held to account for the duration of that contract? We know that homelessness, unfortunately, is a major problem among refugees and asylum seekers. And last week, Crisis published its ambition plan to put an end to homelessness in the UK. Part of that project talks of immigrants and the necessary legislative changes required. So can you commit to look in detail at the crisis recommendations and lobby for the changes that they are calling for? in those areas that are non-devolved. And finally, I want to discuss the scrapping of the Mayor grab grant to the local authorities, this important grant in terms of educational attainment for ethnic minorities. This is crucially important to ensure that language skills are taught in appropriate way to children who don't speak Welsh or English. But the scrapping of this grant is going to make it very difficult for the children of yet refugees and asylum seekers to learn both languages of our nation. So my question is, don't we need to bring back the MAEAG? After all, language skills are crucial in order to integrate refugees and asylum seekers fully in our nation of sanctuary, and that ultimately is the best way of dealing with prejudice and being welcoming in the true sense of the word. Leader of the House. Um, yes, th thank you for that. Um, there are a range of different issues raised there. Um, obviously, the whole point of Refugee Week is to combat some of the media representations. I entirely agree with Sean Gwentlian that a large part of the problem has been some of the, uh, I don't know how to describe it, hysteria, hyperbole, um, really very uh, detrimental reporting, entirely untrue usually. I think I'm prepared to say completely untrue in most instances uh, around perceptions about asylum uh, and refugee, uh, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and actually, uh, uh, poll after poll has shown that m many, uh, many members of the public can't tell the difference between uh, the words migrant, asylum seeker, refugee, and so on, which shows in itself some of the hysteria that's, uh, that's uh, 
uh, have been around this situation. And um, there's a wider debate to be have about the whole issue of migration in that context as well. But anyway, that's the whole point of this week, really, and that's why we're having this statement. It's why we're highlighting it. Because, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, we really do want to highlight the huge benefits that people who are, f after all, fleeing the most appalling circumstances, um, that the skills and talents that they bring to our society and our culture are to be applauded and recognised. And that is entirely the point of this, and I concur with her on that. Um, and as I say, we do have a programme for recognising uh, doctor, doctor's qualifications. Um, I chair uh, the Faith Forum here in um, Wales on behalf of the First Minister. He chairs it, uh, and I co-chair it with him, and often I'm the chair uh, uh, in practice. Um, and we had a very vigorous debate about how we could extend that programme out into other uh, health and clinicians and actually um, all asylum seeker and refugees who have professional qualifications that are required in our country and anyway we want to be able to en enable people to use their skills to the ma maximum advantage. Um, I don't agree that we should be uh, trying to take over immigration policy in terms of um, extending visas but I do agree that we should be lobbying the UK. Uh, we have done very successfully um, around uh, not having ridiculous policies about restricting the um, migration, never mind asylum and refugee seeking, of people with essential skills for our NHS and other areas of our economy. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, in terms of the uh, administration of welfare, um, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm, I feel that you are going to cut me off short if I start going into all of the detailed arguments on that. But suffice to say that we are not convinced that we would be able to mitigate some of the worst effects uh, of the welfare system simply by administrating, administrating it uh, slightly differently. We will be looking in detail at the crisis report, um, but we have had a very successful collaboration with the Asylum Rights Programme delivered by the uh, Welsh Refugee Council in Consortia, which includes Trosgan on Plant, East Balzo, Asylum Justice, the City of Sanctuary and Displaced People in Action projects. And so we have had a, a good coordinated piece across Wales, um, which has seen uh, the com well, we hope the culmination of this very good plan in response to the committee's report, which we're, um, uh, I would just remind uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, everyone in Wales, that the consultation finishes next Monday. John Griffiths. <coughs> Diolch de Pruilloedd. <coughs> yes, um, Lead Without, in terms of um, the Equality Local Government and Communities Committee report and the responses Welsh Government has made, I wonder if you could provide further detail and um, assurance with regard to a few matters. Firstly, the Community Cohesion Plan. Um, the response from Welsh Government was that that would be published in summer 2017 and we would include specific actions in terms of more positive narrative around um, refugees and asylum seekers who have settled here in Wales. Um, so given that date of summer 2017 and the fact that it hasn't yet been published. I wonder whether you could um, tell me when it will be published and what steps the Welsh Government is taking in regard to that need for a more positive narrative um, here in Wales. And with regard to the guardianship service, um, I know that um, there is currently a consultation on action to explore opinions on establishing such a service. And I wonder again what time frame there is for that work and at what point the government will be in a position to clarify whether there will be such a scheme. Um, on accommodation, um, Leader of House, um, there was a lot of concern around the right to rent checks, which I know you're very much alive to and the fact that that could lead to discrimination. Um, and we call for an immediate assessment of the impact of the UK Immigration Act. Um, and Indeed, that assessment, the need for that assessment was accepted. So I wonder um, whether it has taken place, and if, if, if not, when it will take place. And also, when the, rights to, the right to rent checks are expected to be introduced here in Wales, because um, we're not yet aware of that. And just two final matters quickly, De Pruy Lewis. Um, very quickly, the draft consultation plan doesn't always include time frames for delivery, so I wonder whether the finalised plan will have clear dates for delivery of each action and whether there will be Welsh Government funding allocated to the commitments made in the draft action plan. Thank Dioch. you. Leave the House. Yes, Deputy Presiding Officer. We've, um, 
We have made a lot of progress in the last year, uh, but we are very frustrated, as I said earlier, on the UK Government's refusal to share details of the contracts with the forth uh, forthcoming asylum accommodation and support com contracts. Um, because, as uh, John Griffiths has rightly pointed out, the, the accommodation system is crucial to ensuring the well-being of those claiming asylum, and the poor system will inevitably impact on Welsh public services and asylum seekers living here because of all of the issues that arise as a result, including poor mental health, poor integration, and, and so on. Um, we, we have made a number of attempts to gain access to the uh, contracts, um, but we, we've not been successful. But that doesn't mean we've given up. We are continuing to lobby very strongly on that. Um, we've also raised a number of the committee's recommendations with the UK Government where responsibility lies wholly or partly with them. Um, and there, there will be some improvements in the future. But that includes equality training for the asylum accommodation providers, which we're very pleased to, to see be included, a complaints process which is independent of the accommodation provider, and some additional advice during the move-on period for new refugees. Um, but we, we, have, we haven't been successful in all of the areas, as I've said a, a number of times. So therefore, we are looking to see how we can reduce the impact and prevalence of destitution in the non-devolved welfare system. Um, we've taken some time to develop the new plan, as John has pointed out, to ensure that we co-produce the plan with refugees and asylum seekers and the organisations that support them, to ensure that the plan will actually make a real difference to well-being. Um, I'm reluctant to commit to a very definitive timescale, but I understand that that's gone very well and that we hope to publish something um, reasonably soon, but it is very important that that plan means something to the organisations that contribute to it. So I, I don't want to cut that process short. I think that's very important indeed. And of course, we'd very much like it to have um, realistic, um, impactful uh, outcomes. So I will be very uh, ensuring that those exist, and I'm sure the committee um, will take a very close interest in that. So I'm very happy to discuss that uh, with the committee as, as we go along. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is we have uh, funded a series of focus groups with unaccompanied asylum seeking children and young people to understand more about their views and experiences of the services they've received. And that report will also be published soon and will help inform our future work, including the work on the plan. So we hope to look, uh, work very closely with the committee in the future. Thank you. David Rowlands. Darkly, uh, there is. Um, Britain has a proud tradition of welcoming refugees from the Huguenots in the 17th century to the Ugandan Asians in the 1970s. We should, indeed must, maintain that tradition. The problem we have today is that the distinction between true asylum seekers and economic migrants has become blurred. This is especially true for the general public. We therefore have an unfair backlash on true refugees for instance, those fleeing the war in Syria, to whom we have a huge moral obligation to take in our fair share, because we allowed ourselves to get involved with the uprising against Assad, and whilst we would, of course, not uphold his form of regime, it has become clear that any type of regime is preferable to the wholesale carnage and destruction which has ensued from the West's involvement in yet another country of the Middle East. For hundreds of years we have taken in refugees, but these have been numbered in tens of thousands per year. These people were easily accommodated and integrated into our society. The Ugandan Asians are a prime example of this. However, over the last decade we have been faced with accommodating hundreds of thousands each year, which of course impacts on our ability to provide all the infrastructure and societal needs of these people, which again impacts on those who most desperately need our aid. This is not just a concern here in the United Kingdom. Social unrest and economic stress is being felt throughout Europe in the face of unprecedented migration levels. The inability to discern between true asylum seekers and economic migrants is causing disruption in, uh, and opposition in such countries as Germany, Italy, Belgium and Spain. We must therefore have proper border controls so that we can truly assess those who have a desperate and proper need for asylum, but with stricter controls on those who come here for economic reasons. UKIP, of course, upholds all the measures proposed in this statement. We recognise the trauma many of these displaced people have experienced, and we acknowledge the necessity of providing interventions to help make these people welcome, comforted, and fully integrated into our Welsh society. 
So I just have one question uh, for you, uh, Leader of the House, is what work is being done to make the distinction between asylum seekers and refugees and economic migrants uh, to the public in general? Leader of the House. Um, well, I'm glad you support the principle, but I fundamentally disagree with your argument, uh, uh, I have to say. Refugee Week, as I said, started in the UK in 1998 as a direct reaction to hostility in the media and society in general towards refugees and asylum seekers. It's now one of the leading UK initiatives working to counter this negative climate, as I said to Sean Gwentlian earlier, defending the importance of sanctuary and the benefits it can bring to both refugees and host communities. Uh, it's, it's widely celebrated in many other countries, uh, Australia and United States, for example, but, and France held their first refugee week in 2016, so it's a, a spreading good news story. Perhaps say I simply don't like, well, first of all, the statistics that David Rowland's quotes are just not something we recognise here in Wales. M migration here is tiny. And as somebody who spent most of my life abroad, because my, my family were economic migrants, where my father sought to work around the world in order to give a better life to his family, I simply cannot find it in my heart to say that somebody fleeing war is a, a proper refugee, but somebody fleeing starvation or uh, grinding poverty is not. And so, Deputy Presiding Officer, I cannot agree with a single thing other than general support that David Rowling said. Jane Hutt. Yes, the statement during Welsh Refugee Week on the Welsh Government Consultation on the Nation of Sanctuary, Refugee and Asylum Seeker Plan. Uh, the fact that this plan has been co-produced with the Welsh Refugee Council and other partners is indication of the forward-looking inclusive approach taken by the Welsh Government, drawing in large part from the recommendations of the Equality Local Government and Communities Committee report. This year we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the founding of the NHS, and I'm pleased you've drawn attention to early action I took as Health and Social Services Minister to support the Welsh Refugee Doctors Programme. Refugee doctors wanted to contribute their skills to the NHS. And as a result of a pioneering training language and support scheme, their skills were soon put to use, resulting in over 85 refugee doctors uh, registered with G GMC practicing over the past uh, 16 years. What a contribution. Lead of the House, will you join me in congratulating these doctors working across the NHS in the UK as a result of this initiative, due in no small part to Alad Edwards of Katine, who came to me and said, we can do this, Jane, and we did. Uh, but also, can we thank, and I'm sure across the, the chamber, all those in our constituencies who supported the Syrian refugee scheme, uh, with my town of Barry providing a welcome and support to families over the past three years. Families who are now settling and contributing to this community with their skills and talents. I uh, particularly like to thank the voluntary um, Rainbow Group, a black and a mi minority ethnic group, who provides friendship and personal and social support to BAME women in the Vale of Glamorgan. But I am concerned uh, of the, to uh, understand whether the Welsh Government is um, getting due uh, respect uh, and cooperation in terms of the integration of these families into our communities from the Home Office, who are obviously leading that scheme, and I'd be grateful for your response to that. Um, also, Leader of the House, you'll be aware of community initiatives across Wales, such as Croeso Llantwit, which is following Croeso Narbeth, um, welcoming Syrian refugee family to Llantwit Major. But finally, as patron of Bauzo, um, I do want to acknowledge the work that's carried out by this specialist charity, supporting women escaping violence, including refugee women. Thank you. Um, yes, of course, I'm very happy to acknowledge uh, um, the work across Wales with a large number of organisations who have worked very hard to co-produce our plans with us and who, of course, work daily um, to make sure that uh, refugee and asylum-seeking people across Wales are integrated and the COISO um, movement, we hope, will spread even further. It's a, it's a great initiative. But as I said, there are, there are a large number of other organisations who have worked carefully with us because we very much want this plan to be something co-produced with the communities so that it really is meaningful to them. We're very grateful to the committee for producing its comprehensive reports. And we've worked very carefully through the recommendations with the communities in order to support them. And there are a number of very specific things that we can say. I've said something about the disappointment around the accommodation, but we will be working with local authority partners to make sure that where we can intervene, we do, and that people do live in accommodation that is fit for purpose. And as I said, there are a number of other improvements around the complaints process and so on that can be put in place. Um, we also recognise a real issue with destitution 
and so we've put a number of advice services in place to assist people to find the help that they need. And I would, Deputy Presiding Officer, like to say again to the UK Government that we very much want them to not place Welsh Government funds on the list of no recourse to public funds uh, schemes so that here in Wales we can make sure that we do not have destitute refugee and asylum seeking uh, people on our doorstep uh, and that we can extend our public funding to them appropriately. Thank you. Joyce Watson. Uh, <coughs> Dear, uh, Dear and I think the first thing that I want to say uh, today is that I'm sure some of us have seen the scenes in America where children are being literally ripped out of the arms of their parents and the damage that that is being done uh, to both the parents but also to the children and to the nation. So I, with your... Uh, um, uh, respect, I would ask if you will uh, condemn uh, those actions and I'm also pleased that we don't follow those actions here in Wales. It is absolutely appalling, it is absolutely inhumane uh, and uh, I cannot believe uh, and I'm sure nobody else can here that you can have a president of one of the richest countries in the world uh, actually uh, standing up and saying uh, that that is an acceptable form of behaviour. Um, so I thank you for allowing me uh, time to say that today. And it is in that vein, uh, I suppose, that I rise here today. There is an article in The Guardian, and I have a copy here. It's not rubbish, so maybe I can hold it up. Um, and it's a study about suicide that has happened because the system is so slow uh, it, when it comes to processing, uh, very often minors. And they are told quite clearly that at the age of 17 and a half, if they're not settled, that they would have to leave the country. And they've already been through hugely traumatic situations where they uh, have suffered both physically and mentally. Uh, to get to the stage that they are. They then find that all their hope and their dreams are somehow dashed by the system's inability uh, to cope with them. And I know that the system isn't down to us. So my question is this, particularly focusing on two groups. And one of them is the unaccompanied minors who find themselves destitute very often and then they become desperate and then they harm themselves and then finally uh, they take their own lives and that has happened here in Wales as well. Uh, I remember uh, going to uh, the Hay and Talgaf Sanctuary for Refugees and giving a keynote speech um, while they were remembering one of their own uh, that, and the devastating impact that it had had on those people as a group who'd done everything they could uh, to assist that individual into a life uh, worth living. So the other group uh, that I'm uh, very keen to focus on are those who find themselves, uh, and they are more or less uh, women, uh, who find themselves victims of sexual violence and uh, rape uh, and uh, all that goes with that, but it isn't exclusively uh, women. Uh, some uh, males are also subject to that. And I note in, in, in your statement that there is uh, a scoping exercise to, that will ascertain the key difficulties that are faced by asylum seekers and refugees who have experienced uh, that uh, so that you can take some action. I look forward, uh, Leader of the House, um, for the outcome of that and have you any indication whatsoever uh, when we could expect uh, the results of some of those uh, scoping exercises? Leader of the House. 
Joyce Rotten raises a number of very important issues. As I said, uh, we've had five sessions across Wales and nearly 100 uh, social workers and advocates have been trained in um, age assessment of children and young people so that we do not have some of the miscarriages of justice that we have seen uh, in the system. We'll be publishing a series of information and advice resources that will assist social workers to support unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and young people, to advise on current and potential foster carers and to advise the children and young people themselves. And this makes a commitment to produce that information uh, in the UK Government Four Nations Safeguarding Strategy for Unaccompanied uh, Asylum Seeker Children, to which the Welsh Government has contributed. And I know the member uh, has a real concern around the modern slavery uh, issue here, as well as um, people particularly uh, fleeing sexual violence are often captured by um, people who are very exploitative in that, in that regard. So we funded a series of focus groups with unaccompanied asylum seeking children and young people to understand more about their views and experiences of the services they've received in, in Wales. And as I said earlier to John Griffiths, that report will be published soon and will help inform our future work, including the final Refugees and Asylum Seekers Delivery Plan. And we've also supported the delivery of training to current and future um, foster carers when accompanied asylum seeking children, as we seek to ensure that children have the best possible experience. And I share Joyce Watson's horror at some of the scenes that we saw in uh, the United States. And I uh, also, uh, we, we've been working very hard to ensure that the UK takes very seriously um, that as part of the Brexit process, we stay part of the protocols in Europe that allow fa family reunification, because that is a very significant part of uh, what our membership of the European Union has brought. And I really very much want to keep hold of that, if at all possible. Julie Morgan. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much for calling me to speak on this very important um, uh, consultation, which I hope will move us to being truly a nation of sanctuary for refugees and asylum seekers. But I don't think um, we should ever underestimate the amount of um, daily um, racism and prejudice that um, asylum seekers and refugees do uh, face. Um, I very support very strongly that this is, plan is being made in conjunction um, with refugees and asylum seekers. I think that's absolutely crucial. And I think it's a very important message the Leader of the House, game, house gave that it's all our responsibility to make, um, uh, make people feel welcome. And great examples of that being, has been mentioned. And I know Narbeth and Lantwood Major have been mentioned today. And I know that Hay, Brecon and Talgarth City of Sanctuary Group have been doing events all over Powys in village halls, giving res refugees a day out in the countryside to make them feel welcome. And that's been um, very successful. But it is, um, as the Leader of the House said, not a one-way um, system because we do gain so much from... Uh, uh, from people who have come here to our country. Um, and I wondered um, if the uh, Leader of the House could update us about whether there is, has there been any progress about asylum seekers being able to work, because one of the biggest issues that um, I've faced with asylum seekers is their, sometimes their inability to take up a job because of the policy um, from the Westminster Government. And many of people have said to me, all I want to do is work, you know, and uh, they haven't been able to do that. Uh, the, the Welsh Government funded initiative um, that Jane um, had um, put forward about doctors getting their qualifications is absolutely great. Um, and I was very pleased that the Leader of the House said that um, this could be, perhaps be considered for all other qualifications. So I don't know whether there's any actual plans to do that. Um, if there are, perhaps um, you could tell us um, the details. And then the other issue that I feel uh, very concerned about is asylum-seeking young people who want to go to university because when these asylum claims drag on for years sometimes and um, I've had lots of examples of uh, young people, um, as young asylum seekers, children of asylum seekers who have not been able to take up places in university because they haven't been able to get funding. So I don't know if there's anything, any progress on that or anything that the um, government can do. And I'd just like to end by mentioning um, a great initiative in Lanishan High School in my constituency, which has just been awarded School of Sanctuary status. Um, Sean Owens, a member of staff there, has, uh, has spearheaded a fantastic awareness raising program where the um, young people have gone and spoken to different groups, have learned about um, what happens in detention centres. Um, and have received training from Hope Not Hate. And it really seems a fantastic initiative. And I'm sure she'd want to join me in congratulating them on what they've done. 
Beadrill House. Yes, that's a, that's a really great initiative, and uh, the more that can be encouraged to ensure that young people have a, a mutual understanding of how they got to be where they are and what they bring to the party, uh, the better. She, she asked a number of questions, which uh, I can just quickly say something about. And we are very interested in looking at schemes to recognise other qualifications, um, but actually what we want to do first is see if we can extend the medical one um, to other clinicians and then extend it out. But I'm due to have conversations with various cabinet secretaries about how we can take that forward as part of the work uh, that we were doing. Because it's, I'm very keen that people, we should uh, allow people to make the full contribution that they can make to our society. Um, in terms of the work, we haven't made any headway, I'm sorry to say, about allowing asylum seekers to work. But there is even an issue with volunteering, because you're only allowed to volunteer with a charity. And in large parts of rural Wales, if you can't volunteer with a business, then you're not really going to be able to volunteer at all. So I've made that point forcibly a number of times to UK government ministers, and we are hopeful that they will at least look at, at that bit of it. But they, uh, there's no meeting of minds on the subject of work in general. Um, in terms of uh, what asylum seekers give back, and after all, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a celebration of refugees and asylum seekers, and we've, come, we've hit a somewhat doleful note with some of the problems. I will just highlight that in my own constituency, as well as in many others, many members have already mentioned, there is a brilliant project where asylum seekers um, a writing project, and they write the most incredible stories and poems, sometimes about their experiences, but sometimes just general things. And they, it really is a, a great scheme. And I have a number of books, uh, which for a small donation to a charity of my choice, you can, I can share with you. Um, I can uh, just read them in my room if you're not prepared to put your hand in your pocket for the charity. Uh, but I do have a large supply of them, should members uh, want to take advantage of, of that, because I support that project. Um, and I just want to say this, that Refugee Week is an umbrella festival, and the events have a wide range of arts, voluntary, faith and refugee community organisations, schools, student groups and more. And they include arts festivals, exhibitions, film screenings, theatre and dance performances, concerts, football tournaments and public talks, as well as creative and educational activities in schools. So Deputy Presiding Officer, despite the gloom and despondency that we seem to have been experiencing, but which I understand entirely, I do want to uh, emphasise that this is a festival of a celebration of the contribution that refugees and asylum seekers make to our society. Finally, Beth and Sayed. Thank you. I wasn't going to speak and then I felt that I wanted to because I've, I've done quite a lot of work in this area. And when somebody mentioned earlier these people, I suddenly thought of um, the fact that they're not just these people. They have names, Ahin Ahmed, Ibrahim Sabah, only just some of the ones that I've met. And, you know, I think sometimes we talk about people without considering that they are actually humans in our society and I think that's how we need to frame the debate and that they have so much to give to us as well. So the positive, positivity I would like to bring is that not only that we help them but they can help us um, be it through new cultures, be it through uh, new ways of living, new rituals that we can learn about, new foods, new tastes and I think that's something that we should all take away from those who come to Wales and I think it's important, would you not agree with me, that um, organisations such as Bloom in Swansea and Sharp in Swansea, I think they are worth mentioning because there are many unsung heroes in all of this, volunteers um, who are either retired or young people who are juggling helping asylum seekers by translating, um, just trying to be as supportive as they possibly can, delivering goods to others. I, I, did a, I visited an asylum seeker last week and I and her pram was falling to pieces and within five minutes of me asking on Facebook somebody had delivered me that pram and I took it to her on Saturday and you know this was a really expensive piece of um, uh, goods that she would just not have been able to have afforded if that wasn't for the hospitality of somebody that I knew so I, I think that that's the positive that comes from all of this. Um, the only um, issues that I had was wanting to raise with you some questions with regards to the Syri Syrian resettlement um, scheme that's coming to an end soon so I'm just wondering wondering whether you know that there's going to be follow-through, uh, sufficient follow-through, that because those funding uh, streams are coming to an end, that we know that those Syrian um, uh, refugees are not going to be left um, uh, isolated and are going to have the support mechanisms uh, around them. Um, I would also say that the housing al allocations are simply not up to scratch at the moment. You know, I'm visiting families who are on top of hills, 
pushing prams without access to bus uh, routes, um, and they feel isolated. They're in the house all day. And do you know what? I think that the UK government want that to happen quite often because they want them to stay in their houses isolated uh, because they don't want them to make uh, um, friends. They don't want them to feel part of a community because that serves them uh, when they come to the decision to deport them quite often. Perhaps I'm cynical, but I think that has something to do with uh, the allocations and where those houses are. So I would urge you to use all the influence that you can uh, in relation to that. For example, in East Portalbert, we simply don't have anywhere that sells halal food. I mean, they've got to take the trip to Swansea then to find that food. I've written to Tesco, I've written to different outlets in East Portalbert if they can provide halal food, and they simply say, no, they don't have the demand. Well, if that's the case, then how are they accommodating those very people who are the most vulnerable, who will only eat that, um, that food in their every, everyday lives? And the thing I wanted to finish on was I was shocked uh, the other day, again, visiting a family who said that her children were refused school uniform grant because they weren't Syrian uh, refugees. Now, allegedly, there's no two-tier two system, but if her uh, children, who are from a different country, are deemed not as important as Syrian refugees, then that's going to create tension between uh, refugees and asylum seekers that we simply do not need um, in an age where they already feel persecuted. So if you could do anything in relation to sending updated guidance uh, to schools, I would be very grateful for that. Yes, well, on that one, actually, if you want to write to me with the specific details, I can do something about that. Um, we do not like the two-tier system, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Welsh Government is doing everything it can to minimise the discrepancies by ensuring all refugees are eligible for Welsh Government schemes in Wales. So, you know, we're doing our best. Well, the two-tier system is being put in place by the UK Government, but we're doing our best to make sure that that doesn't happen. I'm afraid I share uh, uh, Beth and Syed's uh, cynicism about the accommodation strategy. I think it's both a money-saving thing and uh, a, a thing that forces people not to integrate as well as they might. And a large part of what we do is attempting to make sure that that doesn't happen. So it's a, a little bit of a push-shove thing. Um, but I just wanted to go back to uh, uh, what she started with, really, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, because uh, Bloom and Sharp are two organisations I'm very familiar with in the Swansea area, but they are right across Wales. And it is absolutely heartening that when you do put an appeal out on social media, one of those uh, puts a little list up of things that they particularly need for a family. Uh, the people of Wales are incredibly generous in their response to that. And it uh, always brings a smile uh, to my heart, anyway, to see that happening. Because, after all, Deputy Presiding Officer, we really are a nation of sanctuary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 5 on the agenda this afternoon is the statement by the Cabinet Secretary for Energy, Planning and Rural Affairs, Companion Animal Welfare. The call on the Cabinet Secretary, Leslie Griffiths. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to update members on what we're doing to continue to improve standards of animal welfare in Wales. In this statement, I'll be focusing on companion animals, or pets. Animal welfare is a priority for the Welsh Government and the Wales Animal Health and Welfare Framework Group. Under the Animal Welfare Act 2006, there is a duty of care on all owners and keepers of animals to ensure their welfare needs are met, whether on a permanent or temporary basis. We will not tolerate the ill treatment of animals, and those who commit the worst acts of cruelty should face tough punishments. This is why we have agreed to work with the UK Government to increase the maximum sentence for animal cruelty offences from six months to five years. We are also working with the UK Government and other devolved administrations to ensure animals are recognised as sentient after we leave the EU. Our position is clear. We fully agree animals are sentient beings and the possibility of that not being reflected in legislation is a concern. In 2016, our RSPCA Cymru made a case for the introduction of an animal offender register in Wales. A task and finish group was established and engagement with stakeholders undertaken. Careful consideration of the evidence was carried out, and the group recently submitted its draft report to me with the final version due by summer recess. Due to the absence of practical solutions which would enable the creation of such a register, and the lack of UK-based evidence to support the impact that some stakeholders believe one would have, the group does not recommend the development of a register at this time. I am grateful to the members of the Task and Finish Group for carrying out this work, and in particular, RSPCA Cymru, the leading third sector prosecutor of animal welfare cases in Wales. I read the recommendations of the 2014 Wooler Report with interest, and in particular the recommendation for the RSPCA Inspectorate to receive statutory status under the Animal Welfare Act 2006. 
I have asked RSPCA Cymru to consider this recommendation and to provide me with evidence of whether it would be workable in Wales. We have introduced a number of pieces of legislation in recent years, which underlines our commitment to continue improving standards of animal health and welfare in Wales. We have introduced a welfare-focused licensing scheme for licensed dog breeders and the requirement for dogs to be microchipped. We have banned the cosmetic docking of dogs' tails and the use of electronic shock collars on cats and dogs. And I am proud that Wales was the first UK nation to implement such a ban. As part of our ongoing commitment to raising standards of responsible animal ownership, I have asked for the microchipping regulations, which have now been enforced for two years, to be reviewed. Research will be undertaken into levels of compliance and enforcement, and whether more needs to be done to ensure traceability. I have also asked for consideration to be given to whether there would be a benefit to extending the regulations to include other species, including cats. The introduction of the Welsh dog breeding regulations led the way in addressing welfare concerns at dog breeding establishments in Wales. This was the first and remains the only legislation of its kind in the UK. In 2017, a survey carried out by local authorities in partnership with the Welsh Government served as an opportunity to assess the standards currently applied in Wales. Further projects under the partnership will be progressed this year. In Wales, we demand high standards from our licensed breeders and sourcing a healthy puppy which can be seen with its mother or rehoming an animal from a reputable animal welfare establishment is the first fundamental step towards being a responsible owner. Yet the illegal importation of puppies driven by huge demand continues to be a problem. We already work closely with operational partners and stakeholders to deal with illegal imports, but more needs to be done. Potential owners must be informed of the poor conditions often endured by these animals, as well as the disease risks they may pose. I believe the potential banning of third-party sales is worthy of investigation, and I will be discussing options with officials. Education is a key aspect of this. Potential and existing pet owners must consider the future when deciding whether or not to own an animal, including how to meet its welfare needs and the costs associated with doing so. However, I do understand people's circumstances can change. I would like to explore what veterinary provision, assistance and advice is available to people who need help in caring for their pets. This could be during times of illness or emergency, such as fleeing from a violent household. I would like to see a collaborative approach with information readily available for people when they need it. Officials will discuss how this can be approached with the Animal Welfare Network Wales. Partnership working is a fundamental aspect of improving standards, and we are fortunate to have a knowledgeable and dedicated animal welfare sector here in Wales. Many of these organisations have and continue to work closely with the Welsh Government as members of the Animal Welfare Network Group. We have recently worked with the network to review our existing species-specific codes of practice, as well as supporting the development of a new voluntary code of practice for sanctuaries. The purpose of the codes is to explain what a person needs to do to meet the standards of care the law requires. It is my intention to lay the revised codes of practice for horses and dogs before summer recess and for a consultation on the revised CAT code to commence in the autumn. I will also be asking the network to review the rabbit code and to identify if there is a need to introduce any new codes, such as for racing greyhounds, primates and other exotic pets. Embedding a culture of responsible ownership cannot be achieved in isolation, and I am grateful for the dedication and passion shown towards animals in Wales. There is always more that can be done, but we are proud as a nation to be leading the way in raising standards of animal welfare. Thank you. Paul Davis. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her statement this afternoon? I believe it's important that animal welfare is a priority for any Welsh Government, and I'm also pleased that there are also plenty of discussions taking place at Westminster around driving up animal standards. Indeed, it's good, it's good to see that governments at both ends of the M4 are committing to this agenda. 
Of course, the draft animal welfare sentencing and recognition of sentience bill 2017 would increase the maximum penalty for animal cruelty offences from six months to five years imprisonment, and it would ensure that animals are defined in UK law as sentient beings. Of course, I'm pleased that today's statement confirms the Welsh Government's support for this bill. Therefore, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could confirm whether it's still her intention to bring forward a legislative consent motion in the National Assembly to allow this obligation to extend to Welsh Government ministers, and perhaps she could also provide an update on what discussions she's had with UK Government counterparts on this specific bill, given its impact on uh, Wales. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the UK Government's recent consultation to introduce a ban on third-party puppy sales, which would mean pet shops and pet dealers cannot sell puppies unless they have bred them themselves. I note that today's statement confirms that the potential banning of third-party sales is worthy of investigation and that the Cabinet Secretary will be discussing options with uh, officials. I'm sure the Welsh Government is also monitoring the outcomes of the UK Government's consultation. But perhaps she can tell us a bit more about the options she has so far discussed with her officials. Of course, a ban on third-party sales of puppies goes some way to tackling the puppy trade uh, in the UK, but there's scope here to look at a range of measures to tackle this problem, such as perhaps tightening regulations around the breeding and selling of uh, puppies. And I note from today's statement that in 2017, a survey was carried out by local authorities in partnership with the Welsh Government, which served as an opportunity to assess the standards currently applied uh, in Wales, and that further projects under that partnership will be progressed uh, this year. Given that we are now roughly halfway through this Assembly, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could give an assessment of the effectiveness of the current dog breeding regulations, and also expand on what type of partnership projects will be carried out this year. Now, this afternoon's statement tells us that the current microchipping regulations will be reviewed and perhaps extended to other species, such as cats. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could tell us what initial discussions she's had with cat welfare organisations and the animal welfare sector more generally at this stage about this review and the impact of extending the regulations to other species. One of the more difficult issues that I believe needs tackling is in relation to the scale of unlicensed activity and the rise in the online sale of pets in Wales, as the invisibility of this trading system has resulted in many online sellers being able to avoid pet breeding and vending legislation, and it crucially pays no regard for an animal's welfare. Therefore, whilst I'm pleased that today's statement looks at a series of measures around animal uh, welfare, perhaps she could tell us a bit more about the specific action that her department intends to take in relation to the buying and selling of animals, and in particular, online trading. Now, another important animal welfare campaign that has gained significant attention recently is in relation to sanctuaries, and the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the YouGov poll for RSPCA Cymru in 2017, which found that 83% of the public in Wales believe the Welsh Government should make animal sanctuary owners obtain a licence and be inspected to set up or operate such premises. It's clear that there's an appetite for the Welsh Government to do something here, and I accept that today's statement confirms the development of a new voluntary code of practice for sanctuaries. However, I'd be grateful if she could give us her initial thoughts of how animal welfare establishments should be monitored to ensure that they are meeting the highest possible welfare standards, and perhaps in the first instance she would consider providing a clear-cut definition of the phrase animal welfare establishment so that there can be no ambiguity in talking about what sort of establishments any, any new codes would apply to, and to ensure that all sanctuaries are included within this uh, definition. Of course, today's statement confirms that the Welsh Government has committed to looking at reviewing a range of codes of practices for companion animals, and I'm pleased that more work will be done in the autumn, as it's crucial that all codes are kept up to date and extended where they need to be and that they are considered alongside other portfolio areas, as often animal welfare guidance can have an impact on other government policies, such as health and uh, housing. Therefore, in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her statement, and I look forward to scrutinising the Welsh Government's progress on its animal welfare policies as they develop. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and, and thank Paul Davis for those uh, series of questions. Um, you started off um, around the animal welfare sentencing and recognition 
of sentience bill and i made our view very clear uh, in in my uh, statement and uh, i mentioned that we are um, working with the uk government because i think it's really important that we do maintain a comparative sentencing regime across england and wales i think that's important so that uh, you know the enforcement agencies have clarity the courts have clarity and also the public uh, have that clarity so i think it was very important that we do work together um, with the uk government in relation to that you asked me if i will um, confirm that i'm bringing forward a, an lcm and uh, i do confirm that I will be uh, bringing forward um, an LCM for those aspects of the uh, bill, which obviously then um, apply to Wales. Uh, I've had discussions around this uh, both with uh, the Secretary of State uh, at DEFRA, Michael Gove, and also with um, Lord Gardner, who's uh, a minister with responsibility for uh, animal welfare. Um, you talked about um, third-party uh, sales of, of puppies and You'll be aware of the campaign around uh, Lucy's Law, and I know there's an event uh, here at the uh, Senate, I think it's next month, um, that uh, Leonard Morgan is uh, sponsoring, and I'll be speaking at it. And certainly the um, petition that's associated with the campaign has gained over 100,000 uh, signatures, and that was debated uh, in Parliament. And I've asked officials uh, to look at the regulations, because they only apply to um, England, uh, but there are specific conditions on dog breeding that are included uh, as a requirement for um, a puppy that um, can only be shown to a prospective uh, purchaser if it's together with its biological mother. And I think that's something that is very worthy um, of consideration. And I know that a call of evidence uh, has recently closed, so we'll be looking at that um, very carefully. Um, you mentioned the... Um, the microchipping uh, regulations, which I, I said I was going to have reviewed, they've been in, in um, they've been introduced now and been in force for over two years. So I think it, it is the appropriate time uh, to be reviewed, and I think it's uh, time that we also consider whether other animals um, should be microchipped. And certainly, I've had a lot of representation around cats uh, being microchipped. So I've asked um, officials to look uh, into that uh, for me. I think the point you raised about um, sanctuaries was, was, was very pertinent and, and the definition of an animal welfare establishment, and that will be part of um, the scrutiny process that we're going to go. I want to ensure that consideration is given uh, whether the code would be suitable for use as a statutory document. I think it's important that it has that um, status. So again, I'm working with the animal welfare uh, network to support their, their development of a voluntary code of practice for animal welfare establishments and sanctuaries, and I'll obviously keep members updated. Uh, thank you uh, for the statement uh, here today. I have to say that I'm disappointed about uh, the part in the statement with regards to the animal offender uh, register uh, here in Wales, especially given that you've made a statement without giving us uh, any background information as to what actually happened um, as part of that review. Um, I'm particularly disappointed to read that you think that because there's a lack of UK-based evidence that that's something that cannot uh, be then progressed. There's plenty um, of international evidence and I wonder what uh, work has been done in that regard. For example, there's a statewide open register in Tennessee. In New York, there's a closed register for pet shops and animal sanctuaries and they must reference uh, this before selling or passing on animals. Orange County Animal Register, again in America, maintained by the Sheriff's Office and anyone when convicted must submit information to that office and anyone transferring ownership must check registry prior to any change in ownership. I mean, if we haven't got an animal abuse register in any other part of the UK, it would be difficult to have um, evidence based on practice because it doesn't exist. But that's exactly why people like myself were calling for a Wales first, so that we could look into this and also for UK uh, law uh, enforcement agencies to be able to use this particular information uh, to profile people who would potentially abuse animals and then go on to abuse uh, people in real life. I mean, this is really important, and I think it is a real missed opportunity, and I'd like to see uh, the evidence uh, that supports the conclusion. Uh, it's really hard to comment without seeing anything today. Um, with regards to um, various um, animal welfare codes, you mentioned quite a few in your statement, but you failed to mention uh, the game bird uh, 
code. Um, when will this be reviews, reviewed? Um, in conversations that I've had with the League Against Cruel, Cruel Sports, this is not monit monitored at the moment. Um, they uh, would like to meet with you to discuss uh, game bird welfare, so I'm wondering whether you would take up that offer to meet with them, because I feel that it is missing from uh, these codes, and it's just as important as uh, codes for horses and, and for, for cats. Um, in relation to um, cross-government work, um, I can't see anything in this report, in, in this statement, in relation to how you're working with the housing sector. I raised with the Minister, Rebecca Evans, about uh, the statements that landlords are putting out, no pets, no DSS. Um, we are seeing um, a rise in landlords that are refusing uh, tenants uh, with pets because of potentially they've had problems in the past. Um, but you say a lot in these statements about you know, how we make people uh, better uh, carers for the pets that they have. Um, but when they do have pets, they're often discriminated against. And those pets are really vital to their mental health, to how they uh, operate in society. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's good to say, well, you know, we have to look after the animals on one stage. But what about how animals uh, can help uh, humans? I think that's something that isn't really uh, in this statement uh, enough here uh, today. I'd also um, concur with the comments made by Paul Davis in relation to online selling. We are seeing a myriad of different uh, people selling uh, various um, animals uh, online, and it does uh, seem to be um, something that isn't regulated, isn't monitored, isn't something that anybody has a handle on. Um, and I think the welfare of animals are key here because uh, people are often breeding animals. They, they then realise they can't cope um, and then sell them in these, uh, in these ways that seem easy for them uh, to uh, offload the, 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 the burden that they see that these animals, animals provide on them, but also potentially they're not doing it in the most ethical way. So um, I'd urge you to look at that further too. Um, Beth and Saeed for those um, questions and I absolutely recognise that you would be uh, disappointed. I, I did stress that it was, I only had the draft report and I will bring forward um, a substantive response to that piece of work before summer recess, probably in the form of, of a written statement. But I know you've taken a keen interest uh, in the Animal Offender Register, so I absolutely uh, understand why you want to see the uh, evidence. As I say, I've only had the draft report. Um, but there were some positive actions, there were several positive actions actually within the report that I think um, are worthy of further work. So that piece of work will be undertaken now. And as I say, I do commit to be bringing a, you know, a full substantive response um, before the summer recess. Um, I just today discussed um, the link between um, people who abuse animals and domestic abuse with the Violence Against Women uh, National Advisors. Um, I also uh, had a presentation from Dr. Uh, Frieda uh, Park, Scott Park, um, where she is doing uh, significant work with, with veterinary practices to ensure that where they see uh, non-accidental injury of animals, that perhaps there is a link with domestic abuse. So there is a, a big piece of work uh, right across the UK being done. But um, I think, um, you know, I have to listen to what the Task and Finish group have said, but there are other things that we can bring forward uh, aside from the register. You asked about the um, code of practice in relation to um, game birds, and I've agreed um, with DEFRA and the other devolved administrations that we'll work together to review and revise um, the code of practice. I don't have a, a timeline uh, for that specifically, but that is a commitment that we will um, do that. And if you want to send me um, a, a letter around the um, group that you want me to meet, I'll be very happy to look uh, diary permitting. I haven't had a specific um, conversation with uh, the Minister for Housing um, around landlords, but I think it is obviously something that we need to consider. And I heard you say that you'd mentioned it to the Minister, and I'll certainly pick up um, on that. Um, in relation to online selling, and I'm sorry I didn't um, answer Paul Davis's um, question uh, about that, I was actually shocked at the amount of um, uh, purchasing of pets online that, that goes on and I've asked um, officials to look at this I think you're right you know it's not regulated it's not monitored in the way uh, that we would want so that is a piece of work uh, that we need to do and unfortunately there is a market for it and that market even just in the two years I've been in post that market seems to have increased which is obviously of concern. Thank you. Vicky Howells. 
Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. There is lots to welcome in your very important statement today. And first, I would like to uh, seek some uh, clarification on a number of points. Uh, on the possibility of introducing Lucy's Law to ban third-party puppy sales, I welcome your comments about discussing options with officials. We know on welfare grounds there is a growing chorus of recognition that it is a good step, and I would like to place on, on record uh, a tribute to the work of Friends of the Animals Wales and its inspirational founder Eileen Jones, and also to our Council, which was the first council in the UK to pass a motion condemning third party sales. Um, I know lots of, uh, lots of AMs have already asked you questions about this, but how would you engage with third party expertise that there is out there on this subject in order to take the issue forward? Um, secondly, I note your comments about the difficulties in establishing an animal offender register, but wonder if you'd also be able to say a little about tackling dog fighting. You may have seen the recent case with five people being charged for offences relating to dog fighting in Wales and in the East Midlands. How else can the Welsh Government help to tackle this abominable cruelty? Um, and finally, the comments around supported difficult times for owners are also important, and in particular help for people in accessing veterinary services. Uh, we have spoken frequently about the, the rising numbers of people using food banks in Wales, and I understand the Trussell Trust now accepts pet food, and the Cabinet Secretary will know the first food bank for pets was in fact set up in Wales. Would the Welsh Government also look into feeding companion animals as part of the review? Thank you, Vicky Howell, uh, for those um, questions, and I, I'll certainly join her in paying tribute to Irene Jones and um, RCT Council. Uh, there is a, a huge amount of work going on in relation to third-party uh, sales, and I've asked um, the network to have a look, uh, particularly at this aspect of uh, animal health and welfare. Um, you asked about a dog fighting, which is obviously horrific and illegal, and uh, we work very closely uh, with the police, and if anybody has any um, evidence of this, that's uh, where they should go um, in the first instant. In relation to the uh, animal offender register, you will have heard my answers to um, Beth and Saeed, and as I said, there's, a, there's several recommendations within the draft report that I do think are worthy of further consideration, um, and, I, and even though the advice to me is not to bring a register forward at the time. I think the points that Bethan raised around looking at the evidence in detail, and I certainly uh, will do that. I've literally just had the draft report, so I haven't been able to, uh, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, but I will do before I bring forward a statement um, in the summer. Um, I mentioned in my uh, opening statement that I think we need to look at uh, people who are struggling. Circumstances do change. I mentioned um, about uh, women fleeing from um, a violent household. Um, and I had a discussion with the advisers today. So I think we need to work with um, the, the Dog Trust. I know they, they help. We actually, as a government, we had two um, inquiries in the last few months about fostering pets urgently. And obviously, we, we don't have the facilities to do that. So it's about working with, our, uh, with charities and with the third sector to see if that's um, available. Thank you. Gareth Bennett. Dioch, uh, Tipper Llewith. And... Um, Thanks uh, to the Minister for today's statement, and uh, I agree with the sentiments um, underlying the statement. The majority of households that have pets um, have dogs, and there are several issues over the welfare of dogs. One ob obvious one being, in today's society, are they getting enough exercise and general stimulation? These days, a lot of households contain couples who are both out working during the day, so this can be a problem. So we have to be sure that people purchasing dogs are involved in the appropriate lifestyle for owning dogs. Um, if dogs are short of stimulation, they can exhibit behavioural problems, such as anxiety in some cases or in others, aggression. They would then need to be dealt with through uh, training classes. Now, training classes are mandatory for the owners of dogs uh, purchased from a lot of rescue centres they're not mandatory for dogs purchased um, in other means, uh, through other means, like private sellers. I'm not saying that um, it has to be mandatory, but do we need perhaps to publicise more the benefits of putting dogs through training classes? And do we need to do more to educate dog owners um, as to the welfare and cost of keeping their animals? Uh, I note that um, education is one of the themes in your statement today. Um, the microchipping regulations which were introduced for dogs, uh, you say, are being reviewed. Um, 
it seems sensible to, uh, to, to introduce uh, that uh, with the um, increase in incidence of dog napping, particularly of expensive breeds. Now, you mentioned that um, you are looking at um, whether it's, there is a good case for the microchipping scheme to be extended to cats. I would think there probably is a good case for it, but I know you've, uh, you've responded already to that uh, when Paul Davis raised it, so you may not be able to say more on that issue today. Um, can I mention horses? There isn't much detail in today's statement about horses, um, although I know there is a revised code of practice that's going on. We know that the fly tipping of sick and injured horses is at um, an all-time high, so this is a major issue. Indeed, the RSPCA claims there is a horse crisis going on. One of the problems being that horses are relatively cheap to buy but expensive to care for. So um, we could go... Uh, one way of addressing it is to go back to the education angle. Is, again, is there more we can do to educate prospective horse owners about the cost and welfare of keeping horses? Um, on a, on a more parochial level, there's actually just the, the case of people who have a single horse. Um, horses are actually herd animals, so keeping a horse all on its own is perhaps not a good idea for the animal's welfare. Now, there's a case uh, that I know of, of a couple of people near me, and um, they actually live two doors down from each other. They each own a single horse. One of those horses in particular looks most forlorn. They'd probably be better off actually keeping the horses together in the same field. So I suppose we're going back again to the issue of education. Um, are there any more specifics that we can do to promote education about the welfare of um, companion animals? Uh, thank you for those uh, questions. I think you raise a very important point about um, individuals becoming um, dog owners, uh, was, was the one you, you spoke about. And I think it is good for health and well-being. And I've um, attended the education classes that the Dog Trust uh, run, for instance. And as you say, it's mandatory if you get um, your pet from one of these um, establishments. I don't think we would look at making it mandatory, but I think we, we do need to be able to publicise it, and I'd be very happy to see um, if we could put it on uh, the website. Um, there's nothing really further I can say around microchipping, but I think uh, you're right. I think there is a good case for looking at microchipping cats. So that's a, a piece of work that's been undertaken at the current time. You asked about the code of practice for the welfare of horses. So the uh, Animal uh, Welfare Network uh, group reviewed and revised that code of practice uh, in 2016. Um, we also had a 12-week public consultation on, re on the revised one last October, and that uh, I published the summer of responses to the consultation just last month, and we will be revising the code of practice and publishing it before summer recess this year. Um, in relation to horses, interestingly, I went out for half a day with the RSPCA, and every case we visited, bar one, was in relation to the welfare of horses. And I think you uh, mentioned about education in relation to, to keep people keeping dogs and horses. And I've had those discussions uh, with the Cabinet Secretary for Education because we did look at whether we could put something in the, in the curriculum, but you'll appreciate the curriculum um, is, is pretty full. But I think there is a, an issue around education. And again, we, we publish a great deal of information on our, on our website, and I always look at what we can do to publicise it further. Rick Anthony. Uh, just a couple of um, slight variations on the issue of uh, animal welfare. Um, there's been a tendency to regard the welfare of animals, um, uh, particularly in terms of medical fees, as something of a, of a luxury in the sense that VAT is charged. And we know that many people, the, the welfare of their animals is, is often dependent upon whether they can actually afford to gain access to uh, medical services. I think it's well worth putting on record you know, the, the fantastic work of bodies like the PDSA, People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, do. In my constituency, um, Hope uh, Rescue in Taft Street in pont the work they do in terms of dog and animal welfare. But you mentioned that you, of course, have had discussions with uh, your <coughs> counterparts in the UK government in in terms of joint approaches. And it seems to me that the issue of uh, the regulation of veterinary fees is something that ought to be looked at. It seems to me there's very little clarity about veterinary fees. They seem to be largely unregulated. They seem to be increasing by about 12% per annum. Uh, and then on top of that, there's a 20% VAT charge. Of course, if you're a commercial operator, if you're a farmer, for example, you can 
get back the VAT uh, that you pay out. But if you're a pet owner, obviously you can't. And I really wonder whether, in terms of pets, in terms of domestic pets and for animal welfare purposes, the issue of reducing VAT on veterinary bills, or perhaps even removing them altogether, is something that at least should be considered, should be discussed, but that there should be things also that whilst government and perhaps our counterparts could do in ensuring far greater clarity of veterinary fees for uh, pet owners. Thank you. Um, Mick Antu raises um, a very interesting point, and I'm meeting with the British Vet uh, Association next week, and it's something that I'm, I'll be very happy uh, to raise with them. I've not had discussions around that with my UK counterparts, but I'll certainly speak to the BVA first to see um, what they would advise, but I'd be very happy to look at any joint approach uh, that would uh, help people in respect of, of uh, veterinary fees. Thank you. David Maldi. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer and Cabinet uh, Secretary. Can I welcome uh, the statement? I think the principle of responsible ownership, which is mentioned towards the end of your statement, is key, but I do think that more needs to be done with it. Several members, including uh, Gareth Bennett, have mentioned the need for education. And it is, after all, pet owners who are going to be able to deliver the maximum level of animal welfare, no matter you know, how good our laws and regulations are. Uh, it is human behaviour here that is key. I have to say, um, a, a couple of months ago, I visited Cardiff Dogs Home. And uh, can I take this opportunity to commend their excellent work? It, it's a remarkably hopeful place, which is perhaps not what I was expecting. And also the friends of Cardiff Dogs Home uh, as well, who uh, um, exercise the animals uh, twice daily. And indeed, that's what I, uh, I did during part of my visit. But anyway, the, the, the staff and volunteers there were talking to me of the problems they often have with dogs being abandoned because they were acquired in the first place irresponsibly as fashion accessories. This sounds remarkable, but I assure you it goes on. And then after six months or so, uh, the, uh, the, the novelty of having this fashion excess, excess accessory which you're showing off to your friends or whatever, wears, and the realities of uh, uh, taking care of a sentient animal with uh, a range of quite uh, uh, obvious needs, um, you know, means that, uh, that, they're, they're, that they grow um, indifferent or even callous and the animals get often abandoned. Uh, and, and, and literally get abandoned, you know, driven many miles and then thrown out of the car. Um, so that's the first point. The second point, and again, a, a couple of people have mentioned this, but I, I want to refer you to the work of the charity Cats Protection, which has highlighted the problem of pets being given up um, when people move into rented accommodation. And, and they also mentioned that uh, when people go into some form of care accommodation, it's all, often automatically the case they have to give up their pets, in this case cats. And these animals are often uh, older animals that cannot be rehoused uh, uh, very easily. I think landlords and those running various forms of care accommodation, sheltered or whatever, uh, residential homes, uh, you know, many of them can be quite sim easily made appropriate uh, for companion animals. And I think those in um, rented accommodation, um, and indeed, I mean, I live in a condominium, and. Uh, you know, we have a presumption that you can have a pet unless there are very strong reasons not to have the pet. Uh, and that, you know, is a much better way of operating. It would be fairer as well, which would cover people that would, you know, are, are in some form of rented uh, uh, accommodation as well. And I think that's a real issue, and I commend the charity for raising that matter. Thank you, David Melding, um, for those questions and comments. And I'll, I'll certainly... Join him in paying tribute uh, to Cardiff Dogs Home. I've, I've visited several um, of these establishments uh, since I've been in, in post, and you know the dedication of, of both the staff and the volunteers is incredible. I remember going to the Dog Trust in Bridge End just before Christmas, and it, there was a lot of dogs there then. And, and you can imagine, you know, you, you raise the point about fashion accessories and people getting uh, rid of pets after six months, and it's the same, obviously, with Christmas. A lot of people uh, have pets at Christmas, and then. A few months later, but I remember going to this one in Bridge End, and every every dog had a had a, a Christmas stocking, you know, full of presents. You know, the dedication of these people um, is just incredible. In relation to um, the issue around landlords, I see the Minister for Housing is is in the chamber now, so she will have heard that, and obviously Bethan Said uh, raised it with me uh, also, and I will certainly have a discussion uh, with Rebecca Evans. 
um, around this. I too live in, in rented accommodation here in Cardiff, and it's exactly the same. The, you, you are allowed a pet unless you have, you know, you have to make a, a case uh, if, if, if not. So I think you know there is a huge amount of work that we can do uh, with uh, landlords to make sure that the situations that you just described don't happen. Thank you, Joyce Watson. Uh, Dr. Flowers, I'm not going to repeat uh, obviously everything that people have said, but I particularly want to support what David Meldin has said about people, uh, particularly people who have ha had animals for a long time and those animals are ageing, uh, being subject really to a death sentence because nobody will uh, take them on. Uh, but I also want to focus on uh, the whole uh, intention of what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is... Uh, advising people how to look after their animals uh, in the right and most appropriate way. Yet, I did a very quick survey myself and found that not many people knew we were doing this. Uh, they didn't actually uh, know anything about this code of practice for companion animals amongst the general public. And I think uh, that we need to do a piece of work, whether it's us or others. But there is an area I want to focus on, and Vicky Howells has alluded to it, and that is uh, dog fighting. Dog fighting isn't only bad for the animals, which of course it clearly is, but it is a whole network uh, wrapped up very often with criminal activity, uh, betting, uh, drinking, and also drug taking. It is very uh, prevalent, I have been informed, uh, in certain areas of Wales, and we really ought to be tackling this uh, head on because it is one of the worst uh, crimes against uh, the animal and it has almost in some places become quite acceptable uh, behaviour and this is going to sound odd but I'm going to bring in uh, uh, another area that I think we ought to do uh, think about when we're thinking about animal welfare we also need to think about what we buy in our pet shops that might affect uh, uh, the ecology elsewhere. And I'm talking particularly here about tropical fish and whether we need to do a little bit of work around, because there is evidence coming out, uh, the major damage to coral reefs, because people are just simply going in to grab the fish that exists there for people to somehow sit and look at in their tanks at home. And, uh, the evidence has really come out of that Disney film, uh, Finding Nemo, and people's children wanting a fish that looks just like that. Um, and, and so there is a wider debate here uh, when we look at animal welfare about the destruction that very often uh, uh, what we buy is, is affecting communities quite seriously elsewhere. Thank you, Joyce Watson, for uh, raising those uh, uh, three points. Um, around the codes of practice, we have a, a partnership approach in relation to our codes of practice and how we, uh, we've worked with the Animal Welfare Network uh, group to uh, develop a communications plan to raise awareness of the codes of practice. I'm very disappointed to, to hear you say that, so I think there's a piece of work certainly uh, I can do and we can do as Welsh Government, uh, but I'm sure some of our partners will be uh, very happy to, to help us, but certainly we have them on the Welsh Government website. They uh, can be downloaded, they, they can be available as paper uh, documents, and also you can uh, get them on CD-ROM. So I know my officials have worked with stakeholders such as welfare organisations, uh, pet shops for instance, veterinary surgeries, to make sure we distribute um, those codes of practice and raise awareness of them. And I know the um, RSPCA in particular has been very, have been very keen to uh, use them as part of their enforcement activity to encourage the improvement of standards where uh, welfare issues have been identified. Um, around dog fighting, you, you're absolutely right, it's a criminal activity. And I did have a discussion around dog fighting when I spent some time with the rural crime team up in North Wales, and I'm due to spend um, a further day with them in, in August. So. Um, again, I'll, I'll raise it. I didn't think it was as widespread as, as you sort of implied, but um, I'm very happy to have a, a further discussion with them around that. I don't think I've done anything in relation to tropical fish, so um, if the member doesn't mind, I'll um, have a discussion with my officials and I'll drop you a note uh, in relation to that. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you.
Item 6 on the agenda this afternoon has been withdrawn. Therefore, item 7 is the Environmental Protection Microbeads Wales Regulations of 2018. And I call on the Minister for Environment to introduce the regulations. Hannah Blythin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The regulations which have been laid before the Assembly for your consideration today are the Environmental Protection Microbeads Wales Regulations 2018. These regulations have been introduced under powers contained in the Environmental Protection Act 1990 and the Regulatory Enforcement and Sanction Sanctions Act 2008. Under these regulations, it will be an offence in Wales from the 30th of June 2018 onwards for anyone to manufacture any rinse off personal care products which use plastic microbeads as an ingredient. It will also be an offence in Wales from that date to supply or offer to supply any rinse off personal care products which contain plastic microbeads. Welsh local authorities will be responsible for enforcing these regulations and this enforcement role will be carried out in line with published guidance. These regulations introduce an enforcement regime which includes civil and criminal sanctions such as variable mon monetary penalties, compliance notices and stop notices. Civil sanctions provide flexibility and allow local authorities when enforcing the ban to distinguish between those who are striving to comply and those who disregard the law. These regulations provide for anyone who has a civil sanction imposed on them to appeal to the first tier tribunal. I met with marine stakeholders on the 7th of June who impressed on me how important this ban is and through our public consultation exercises the introduction of this ban received widespread support. Deputy Presiding Officer, I commend these regulations to the National Assembly. Thank you. David Melding. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I say we are very keen to support uh, these regulations that uh, ban microbeads from personal hygiene uh, products. Uh, these regulations have already been passed, indeed they come into effect today in England and Scotland, so we're pleased to see the uh, Welsh Government um, uh, following uh, uh, that course of action, and so at least in the UK we'll have a consistent approach. I do believe this is a welcome and significant step, but it is only uh, the first step. Uh, we need a shift in public policy towards uh, uh, the responsible use of plastic products and uh, the banning of single-use plastic products. And uh, the condition of our water courses, uh, we heard evidence in the uh, 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 Climate Change uh, uh, Committee uh, um, uh, only a couple of weeks ago uh, from a uh, leading academic in Cardiff University uh, 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 you know, about the level of plastic pollution that is now being recorded in the sampling of, uh, of Welsh rivers and then getting into uh, uh, the animals. And, um, and, and as far as our seas are concerned, the amount of, uh, of plastic material that is entering, and a lot of it enters via wash-off and also from uh, fibres that are, are washed out of claws as well. They, there's so much work we're going to have to do, uh, but of course, Every significant journey requires the first step, and uh, I, I do think uh, you know, one of the most remarkable changes in the last couple of years is how the public now are really pushing us, and we need to be imaginative in how we use uh, regulations and our changes in law to deliver the quality uh, environment that, uh, um, uh, that, that people deserve and future generations deserve. So we, we are keen to support today's regulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer and Plaid Cymru. We also support these regulations today. It's important to say, however, that we are of the view that we should go further in terms of controlling plastics of all types, micro and macro. These are regulations which, as has been said already, relate to materials which are washed off the body used for personal hygiene products, but that leaves a number of other products. Um, sun cream, for example, where one could still include these microbeads. And it's estimated that between 4,000 and 7,500 tonnes of these microplastics are used every annum in the European Union. So it is a task to get to grips with this plastic. It will start with regulations such as these, but in my view have to include a broader ban on microplastics, including those in domestic cleaning products and so on. And we are still calling for a levy on single-use plastics. 
and of course the possibilities of a deposit return scheme is something that should be welcome to yesterday I visited Another shop, there are a number of plastic-free shops developing across Wales, which shows that the public is ahead of the politicians, because if businesses are pursuing customers, then clearly people are interested in this area, and this shop, La Vida Verde in Llandrindod, Wales, where they have the old pop bottles with a 30% deposit, so you'll get 30%, 30 pence back when you take your bottle back, which isn't enough in terms of inflation. I think it was five pence when I was going through the gullies for the pop bottles many years ago, but it does demonstrate that people are ready for this change. And it's also true to say that although we have good recycling rates in Wales, 44% of the 35 million plastic bottles which are bought every day, that's every day, that's almost a plastic bottle for every adult, then only 45% of those are recycled and a deposit return scheme could be used to increase that to almost 80% in that area. So we look forward to hearing more about the discussions happening between the government here and the government in Westminster in terms of introducing a scheme of that kind. David Melding mentioned the research at Cardiff University on these microplastics in the environment, which is staggering research, if truth be told. And I just want to quote from that. We heard from Professor Steen Ormerod about re research on the Irwell River in Manchester where half a million pieces of microplastic were find, found for every square metre. That's half a million. And further research then at Cardiff in the River Taff, which shows that microplastics are entering the food chain and are being found in birds, or rather eggs. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I almost answered that question myself there. But these are the eggs laid by birds, which demonstrate that we in Wales have the highest level of microplastics in the eggs themselves and we are talking about very microplastics but these are appearing in the eggs and that's the highest level in Western Europe and this just shows this is permeating through our water systems and our food chain and is having an impact between every time this microplastics travels it can carry pollution disease, germs, it can carry all sorts of other things with it and then can be found in people and in wildlife too. Now I understand that these regulations relate to microbeads, something that we specifically place in products and much of the research talks about microplastics emerging from plastic which breaks down over a period of time and becomes microplastic but it's true to say that we have to tackle in every way possible this unnecessary plastic and that's the important point it is a necessary plastic you can keep yourself clean without plastic and I think that's a very strong message conveyed in passing the regulations this afternoon call on the Minister for Environment to reply to this debate thank you Deputy President Officer I'd like to thank both David Meldon and Simon Thomas for their contributions to this debate and for the support shown right across the chamber for the microbeads ban um, a set of span is designed to protect the marine environment from further pollution, foster consumer products, confidence in the products they buy, will, will not harm the environment, and to support the businesses by setting a level playing field. On the 5th of June at the Bulb Ocean Summit, I was proud to sign the UN Environment Clean Seas Plastic Pledge on behalf of the Welsh Government. The introduction of this microbead span legislation supports this pledge and is part of a wider package of actions already underway by the Welsh Government and through partnership working to reduce levels of plastic pollution entering our seas and oceans. Both uh, David Meldon and Simon Thomas were absolutely right to point out as we welcome this, this legislation. It is just one step in the road to phasing out single use and unnecessary plastics. And I think some of you particularly touched on um, uh, you know, micro bees and other products and also um, microplastics so in terms of other products we are looking um, a, a UK left to inform our approach in reducing pollution from uh, micro bees and other products and gathering that evidence on the environmental impacts to inform further action to reduce the use of uh, products 
with uh, containing microbeads and with respect to microplastics. I mean, that's a, a kind of another issue that is kind of there on the horizon that is getting quite a bit of attention. And I've asked officials to um, do some work on that with a view to advising me on what we could and, and should be doing on that issue. And like I said, this is just one step, one piece of a, a, a very large jigsaw that we need to put together in terms to um, actually take the action that we need. And we talk about startling figures. And one of the things that during the Volvo Ocean Race, a figure I learned, I think, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, was that if we don't take action on plastics, there'll be more plastic than fish in the oceans by 2050. And that is you know, truly startling statistics. So, as we said, we are continuing to commit and taking forward action on our route map to tackle plastic, which is not only looking at actually increasing um, recycling and phasing out single use plastic, but actually looking in terms of recycled content, the value of it, and the design and product of uh, uh, manufacture of products within Wales, and coupled with the work we're doing in terms of a, um, a tax on single use plastic and the DRS scheme, which I hope to update members um, shortly in this place, and also the possibility for what we can take forward on a, a Wales wide basis, too. I've already said I'll give consideration to a uh, tax levy or charge on single-use beverage containers. So it's a whole one step and a whole, pack, a whole suite of, of measures to tackle the scourge of unnecessary and single-use plastics. So to conclude, uh, Chloe, I welcome the support of Assembly members to move to approve these regulations. The other The proposal is to agree the motion. Does any member object? The motion is therefore agreed in accordance with Standing Order 12.36. The next item is the Stage 4 debate on the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Wales Bill. Before we proceed with that discussion, I understand that the Bill needs the consent of Her Majesty and the Duke of Cornwall. Therefore, in accordance with Standing Order 26.67, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Services must signify consent before we can hold this debate. Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm that the required consents have been given? Can you confirm? Can you confirm that the... Cloweth, I have it in command from Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Cornwall to equate the Assembly that Her Majesty and the Duke, having been informed of the purport of the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Wales Bill, have given their consent to this bill. That's a Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, which allows us to move forward to the debate on the Stage 4 of the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Wales Bill, and I call the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion. Thank you, Clover. I'm very pleased to move the motion and open the Stage 4 debate for the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Wales Bill. We have, of course, been working on this bill for a number of years. We first consulted on minimum pricing for alcohol in 2014 as part of the Public Health White Paper. And I would like to start by thanking my ministerial colleagues, Mark Drakeford and Rebecca Evans, for their work to shape and develop this landmark legislation. I'd like to thank Assembly members for their support and for the scrutiny that has taken place during the passage of the Bill. In particular, I'd like to thank the three committees, the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, the Finance Committee and the Constitutional and Legislative Affairs Committee for their scrutiny. I'd also like to thank external stakeholders for their continued engagement since the introduction of the Bill last October, but also in terms of their previous contributions, including their responses to the consultation on a draft bill in 2015 that I led as the then Deputy Minister. This bill is specifically concerned with the protection of life and health. It provides for a minimum price for the sale and supply of alcohol in Wales, and will make it an offence for alcohol to be sold or supplied by retailers from qualifying premises below that price. The minimum price for the supply of alcohol in Wales will be calculated by multiplying the minimum unit price, which will be specified in regulations, the percentage strength of the alcohol and its volume. It will not increase the price of every alcoholic drink, only those currently sold below the applicable minimum price. The legislation will also put in place a series of offences and penalties relating to the new system. It provides additional powers and duties for local authorities to enable them to enforce the minimum pricing system. There have long been calls for the Welsh Government to do more to address the damage and health harms caused by the excessive consumption of alcohol, and this legislation does exactly that. Because when it comes to consumption, we know that the price of alcohol matters. 
By using price as a lever in this way, we can target and reduce the amount of alcohol being consumed by hazardous and harmful drinkers, whilst minimising impacts on more moderate drinkers. And this will help to improve a number of key health outcomes, including reducing the number of alcohol-related deaths and alcohol-related hospital admissions. And it's the formula on the face of the bill which enables us to target cheap alcohol that is high in strength and high in volume, the type of alcohol which, dis which is disproportionately consumed by hazardous and harmful drinkers. And it's worth noting that hazardous and harmful drinkers make up 28% of the drinker population, according to research undertaken this year by Sheffield University, but they consume 75% of all alcohol sold. During the passage of this bill, many have cited the data on alcohol-related harms in Wales, and it always makes for difficult reading, and so it should. And I want to repeat some of it here today. There are over 500 alcohol-related deaths in Wales last year alone. Over 54,000 alcohol-related hospital admissions last year alone. Direct health care costs attributable to alcohol amount to an estimated £159 million in the last year alone. But even more of an issue is the devastation that lies behind those figures for families, for communities, and consequences for our NHS staff and support services, as they all cope with the aftermath of alcohol-related death, disease and harm every day. This legislation provides us with, a significant, with an opportunity to make a significant difference. It gives us a chance to do more to address alcohol-related harm, and ultimately, it gives us a chance to do more to try and save lives. Since we introduced the bill to the Assembly last October, we have heard from a range of different public health experts and service providers. Many have recognised that this, the difference that this legislation could make. In written evidence to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, the Welsh NHS Confederation stated there is compelling evidence, both from across the UK and internationally, that introducing a minimum unit price in Wales would lead to significant improvements in the health and well-being of the population. And no relevance to the Health and Social Care Support Committee, the Cardiff and Vale Health Board represented argued that minimum unit pricing is an absolutely critical piece of a jigsaw, without which many other interventions we provide and the work that we do won't achieve their full benefit. Alcohol Research UK have noted that the benefits would accrue more in poorer communities. Those communities are less resilient to alcohol problems. That said, there is no doubt that this bill is novel and experimental. Only Scotland has introduced a minimum price for alcohol in this way, with their legislation for minimum pricing coming into force on the 1st of May this year. The experimental nature of this legislation is exactly why we have included a sunset clause and review provisions in the bill, and those provisions have been widely endorsed. But I would like to use today's opportunity to reiterate that the review provisions in the legislation will be underpinned by a robust five-year evaluation, and I will continue to update members as we take that work forward. I also intend to consult on the proposed level of the minimum unit price as soon as possible, and again, I will continue to update Assembly members on our plans for this consultation and associated timings. Angela Burns. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, because, uh, although I don't know why I should thank you in some ways, because this bill makes me despair. It is here we have yet another example of Welsh Government rushing through shoddily constructed legislation in pursuit of a, apology, a policy objective that none would argue with. Indeed, the Welsh Conservatives had a commitment to enacting uh, measures in our last manifesto to tackle the prevalence of inappropriate alcohol use. However, during all the committee phases and stage three, you have failed to impress Cabinet Secretary with your reasoning for refusing to ensure there is greater clarity of and clear measurements within this bill. You have refused to put the minimum unit price on the face of the bill. There is no statutory starting point, and therefore the bill can be seen as an incomplete piece of legislation. It leaves manufacturers in limbo, business in a quandary, and does nothing to reassure ordinary people that you are not intending to be punitive with devastating results for those on low incomes who have every right to enjoy alcohol as much as those whose wallets will feel less of an impact. During evidence gathering in the Scottish Parliament's deliberation, strong evidence was heard that poorer drinkers would be affected disproportionately by minimum unit pricing, and concerns were raised in our evidence sessions along the same lines. And whilst I'm on the subject of the bill in Scotland, it does seem extraordinary to me that you were prepared to wait and see how the judicial challenge would pan out 
but you are not prepared to wait and learn from Scotland's experience with implementation of this novel legislation. And that surely would have been helpful given the raft of unintended consequences that could flow from this bill, such as the issues of cross-border trade, Unlike Scotland, in Wales, our border with England is porous, is long and is densely populated with high levels of cross-border traffic, but these concerns were brushed aside. I also remain unconvinced that the potential for unlicensed, smuggled and counterfeit alcohol was properly explored. But my biggest concern is that you could be replacing one addiction with another. A number of charities, including some working with the homeless, and others working with alcoholism and substance abuse have highlighted the dangers of minimum unit pricing as a blunt, punitive instrument. There is a lot of talk about evidence in relation to this legislation, but little evidence suggests that these concerns have been allayed or even properly examined. Indeed, the Health Committee heard evidence from users of an alcohol recovery centre who said that higher prices could push drinkers towards other, more harmful substances. Additionally, the Huggard Centre, a Cardiff-based homeless charity that many of you will be aware of, warned that rising, raising price alone for legal drugs such as alcohol may simply change one addiction for another and condemn people to a more entrenched and desperate life on the streets. Their words, not mine. Consider last week the images we saw of young people on the drug Spice, which can be bought now for small change. How can we be convinced that putting up alcohol prices <coughs> won't simply push more of the poorest in society towards substances like spice? The Welsh Conservatives are deeply sceptical that current drug and alcohol rehabilitation services will be enough to help those affected. Addiction is a mental illness and we all know the, the issues that exist with the provision of mental health services. With North Wales losing the last of their residential detoxification beds and the third sector highlighting cuts to service provision elsewhere, additional support services do not look likely. And we would like to have your reassurance again that you will provide those. In short, Cabinet Secretary, this is a sound policy objective, but I would never have brought such a poor quality bill to the floor of this chamber. It is simply not joined up and the only thing the only thing that has rescued this bill from an abstention by the Welsh Conservatives is the sunset clause. But even there, Cabinet Secretary, I issue a warning. You have rejected call after call by members of the opposition for rigorous monitoring of the effects of the bill on areas ranging from the bill's impact on addiction support services, on age groups and the effect on those with small incomes. Nor are there commitments to measure the effects on domestic violence, on substitution, on alcohol-related hospital admissions, to name just a few of the consequences that we, the Welsh Conservatives, have raised at every stage of this bill's passage. But this sunset clause will be reviewed and voted on in the future by the Assembly of that day. And that Assembly, those members, will judge you harshly if you do not collect credible consistent, outcome-focused evidence which would enable proper scrutiny and sound judgment when reviewing the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Bill. Yeah. Thank you, Llywydd. Uh, this is a Public Health Bill. Um, promoting the public health is surely one of the main duties that we have um, tools in the battle against smoking are ones that people expect us to use by now. And people support that. And it's difficult to imagine any opposition to the smoking ban uh, indoors by now. And implementing that act is not difficult because people accepted the purpose. And uh, smoking secondhand smoke is bad for you. And people recognize that and we're not quite in the same place with this bill there are doubts and we shouldn't ignore those in terms of why we are doing this how effective will this be and we don't have the evidence fully yet but the evidence is strong that using financial incentives, that is, changing the price of drinks, does affect how much people drink. 
and I support that as a matter of principle, and it has been part of the Plaid Cymru Manifesto for some years. Taxation, that's what we'd use, uh, as I've said before, but we don't have the powers. I hope that we will have the powers someday, but in the absence of that, setting a minimum unit price is an option that is available to us. So after succeeding in strengthening the original bill in several ways and its passage through the Assembly, we will vote in favour of this bill today for it to become an Act. And we have strengthened it in many ways by influencing the scrutiny that there will be of this Act by the Assembly to evaluate its effectiveness. It is vital now that the government brings very clear evidence to us about the appropriate level of the minimum uh, price. And I do regret that the uh, rushed passage of this journey has failed to allow the kind of scrutiny that I'd like to have seen on that price. But there will be another opportunity through regulations for us to be able to look again at that evidence. And Measuring and evaluation will be vital for us to bring or take the people of Wales with us on this journey. And we've also insisted that on the face of the bill there is a commitment to teach people about why this legislation can be a part of the suite of tools that we have to help public health. There is a weakness here in terms of the legislation, and I do regret again that the government has failed to support that, to look at how we prevent uh, profiting from this uh, act as retailers have to sell alcohol for higher prices. We would have liked to have seen something in legislation that would have ensured that money came in the wake of this legislation in order to be able to be spent on tackling misuse of alcohol alcohol and providing treatment for those who do misuse alcohol and who drink to excess. And we will have to look now at a voluntary levy, but I do think that an opportunity has been missed here, and certainly I in the future, as we scrutinize and look for ways to strengthen this, we'll be looking for ways to ensure that there isn't any profiteering from this. And we've heard several times concerns that people on low incomes will be disproportionately affected. And I've thought a lot about this. Of course, it is a scandal that low income people ha who are more likely to suffer uh, disease or illness because of alcohol misuse. And it's an example of the social injustice and inequality of opportunity, and we have to tackle those through a broad range of policy measures. But what about the impact on people who drink to excess now and the concerns that moderate drinkers on low incomes will suffer unfairly because of the financial cost? I hope through a a program of education alongside this legislation that people, more and more people over time will see that it will be possible to adapt their drinking habits in a way that will mean that there won't be a financial penalty. And I hope that industry will respond by reducing the alcohol content, for example, and people can drink with a, uh, drink, a drink with a low alcohol content or drink less because there is a message now through this piece of legislation that we can't consider alcohol as a benign thing. But above all, let's see this as a measure for our children. I hope that this legislation will be a tool that can lead to fewer young people in Wales starting to drink to excess in the way that uh, tougher regulations in the area of smoking has led to a reduction in the number of young smokers. The health of the people of Wales is in the balance here. The Call on the Cabinet Secretary to reply to the debate. One uh, so, uh, I want to start by uh, again thanking members for the contributions in the debate but for the scrutiny of the bill as well. And in uh, understanding some of the concerns Angela Burns has raised today. I mean, the tone of those concerns is different from the conversations we've had, but to be fair, uh, she has raised a number of concerns uh, during the passage of the bill, both in committee 
and around it as well. So they're not new concerns, and that I'm happy to acknowledge that. And there is something that we need to do in persuading members that we're listening to what's happening, not just in getting a bill passed on trust, but in then acting in that way afterwards. Uh, and that is why, uh, as I said in my opening uh, statement, that we have uh, an evaluation plan. We'll need to listen. We're happy to share information and work with the committee uh, who, is, who will continue to scrutinise what is happening, uh, in addition to the sunset clause, because I, of course, when it is, is a generally novel piece of legislation, and people want to be persuaded there is evidence it's made the real difference to the health of the country that we think it will do. Uh, but I don't accept the uh, suggestion made that this is a rushed piece of legislation. We first consulted on this issue in 2014, and it's gone through proper and appropriate scrutiny during uh, its time in the Assembly. Of course, the Bill does place a duty on Ministers to take steps for awareness of the commencement of the legislation, and that includes promoting awareness of the health risks of excessive alcohol consumption and how this Bill and minimum unit pricing is intended to reduce that. That is why I was pleased to work with Reena Godworth to bring forward amendments that we supported at Stage 3 to include those provisions in the Bill. And I also want to recognise that the commitment to minimum unit pricing has, of course, appeared in the last two Plaid Cymru manifestos. But I want to end by re-emphasising that this legislation will not stand on its own. The legislation takes a targeted approach to a very real and evident problem in Wales today, and it will be supported by a range of additional action being taken forward to support those in need, in particular those areas that form part of the Welsh Government's wider substance misuse strategy. And I recognise the points made about how people who, will, who we hope will seek help in larger numbers need to be supported. But this bill addresses the reality that Wales, like so many other Western countries, has a problem with cheap, strong and readily available alcohol. This legislation is part of helping us to make an important contribution to addressing this issue and improving public health. And I ask members to vote for it today. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In accordance with Standing Order 26.50C, a recorded vote must be taken on Stage 4 motion, so I will defer voting on this motion until voting time, which brings us to our next item, which is a debate on the second anniversary of the EU referendum, and I call on the First Minister. So with, uh, Minister Presiding Officer, I welcome this opportunity to open this government debate, bearing in mind the two years have passed since the referendum and the vote to leave the European Union. I think it's true to say that the 23rd of June 2016 is considered as an extremely important date in the history of this nation. That's when the decision was made to change our relationship with the European Union. In this chamber, shall we, this afternoon to debate that decision. As I've always said, it's our responsibility to focus our efforts to deliver the right form of Brexit, not to argue over the fact of Brexit. So, this afternoon, shall we, I want to open this debate by discussing the right form of Brexit for Wales. We've spent a lot of time in this chamber and in detailed intergovernmental negotiations discussing constitutional issues to make sure the Withdrawal Bill genuinely recognises shared governance and respects devolution. Now, although that was vitally important, this perhaps is not the Brexit issue that people we represent expected us to focus on. While constitutional issues fascinate many, the majority of people will want us to concentrate on bread and butter issues. People in Wales are concerned about whether companies in Wales will take similar decisions to that taken by Jaguar Land Rover, and move production from the UK amid the uncertainty created by the UK Government on Brexit. But what matters most is securing the right form of Brexit that safeguards the economy, the jobs and the well-being of the people of Wales and indeed the whole of the UK. So with all the evidence suggests that in the short to medium term, securing the right Brexit to achieve this requires continued close integration with the economies of our EU neighbours. In our white paper, Agreed with Plaid Cymru, Securing Wales's Future, we set out a Welsh plan for Brexit. We set out clearly how the right Brexit for Wales requires agreement for participation in a single market and a customs union. That was our position 17 months ago, and no evidence has emerged to challenge our conclusion. 
So within that document, we were clear this might involve UK membership of the European Free Trade Association, uh, and through that, the European Economic Area, or a bespoke agreement to secure full and unfettered access to the single market. Now, clearly, participation in the EEA or EFTA would not on its own be sufficient, and that's why the Government will not support Amendment 4. There's no contradiction as suggested by that amendment, because we also need to be part of a customs union, and we need barrier-free access for our agriculture and fisheries. But it's telling that the European Commission has openly discussed a Norway Plus model for the UK. So, in January 2017, we set out a viable, informed position based on evidence, and we've stuck to it. Because so the evidence is clear and compelling. Nearly three in every four pounds earned by Welsh businesses from overseas exports depend on our relationship with our EU partners. The latest statistics published on the 7th of June show that Welsh exports to the EU countries increased by £649 million, or 7%, over the last year. And the EU is and will continue to be our most important trading area. And through the EU, we also access free trade agreements with more than 70 countries. With a hard Brexit, it would take decades to replicate that. Businesses up and down Wales are working hard to grow their export markets, demonstrating that Wales is an open and outward-looking country, but these efforts risk being undermined by the chaotic approach to negotiations by the UK Government. We are, of course, a little over nine months before, as a default, we leave the EU on the 29th of March 2019. You would have thought that at this point the UK Government would have a clear strategy in place. Instead, we have chaos and confusion on the vital question of our future economic relationship with our biggest and most influential market. On an almost weekly basis, we get a new statement from a Cabinet member on some element of the deal they want, only for that to be contradicted or toned down a day later. Two years after the referendum, this is simply not good enough. In her Mansion House speech, the Prime Minister acknowledged that for many sectors, particularly goods, the interests of industry within the UK require continued regulatory alignment with the single market and a frictionless relationship with the customs union. This alignment on both elements is essential for the frictionless borders that businesses up and down Wales need to make and to sell their goods. Only last week, the retiring president of the CBI said that without a customs union, entire manufacturing sectors which rely on just-in-time supply chains will simply disappear. His words, not mine. So, we in Wales know about the devastating effect of wholesale closures of key industries, and we should have no trust whatsoever in those who are prepared to risk such an outcome in pursuit of an abstract ideological set of priorities. Yet, the UK Government remains committed to their red lines that the UK will leave the single market and the customs union, even though these issues were never raised specifically in the referendum. On the customs union, it's becoming increasingly clear, even to the UK Government, that there are two alternative proposals to resolve the conundrum of how to retain an invisible border at both land and sea in the UK and Ireland, uh, is still to be free to have different customs regimes. Well, that simply does not work. You cannot have one entity in the customs union, one entity out the customs union, and an open land border between them. Two weeks ago, the UK Government published their technical paper on the proposed temporary customs arrangement designed to provide clarity to their position, the so-called backstop. Now, I understand that the original title for this was the Customs and Regulatory Alignment Period. Would you believe that acronym? Which would have given rise to what is perhaps a more appropriate description of the situation. But they had to drop this title because while the paper proposes the current custom arrangements remain in place, it's silent on the regulatory alignment required to achieve frictionless borders, other than to say this will be subject, and I quote, to further proposals. And following a tussle over who it is in the Cabinet who has hold of the steering wheel as the Brexit car careers towards the cliff edge, these arrangements are proposed to be time limited. So instead of clarity, we have a half-baked solution to half of the problem with the prospect of a self-imposed cliff edge. And the response from the European Commission, well, they say key questions are unanswered. They say that uh, this doesn't cover regulatory controls leading to a hard border and questions as to whether this is a backstop given the proposal is time limited. Well, that's not good enough. The UK is having to put all its efforts into keeping its own troops in line 
and is simply ignoring the fact that it is the EU we need to be negotiating with, not with Dominic Grieve and Jacob Rees-Mogg. So two years after the EU referendum, there is no viable proposal on customs, despite the implications for Northern Ireland. No clarity on alignment of the single market and no sign of the trade deals that we were told the world would be lining up to give us. We have silence and delay, confusion and chaos when we need serious answers. Throw into the mix the abandonment of collective responsibilities where cabinet ministers are seemingly free to air views that not only contradict but are contemptuous of UK government policy. And you have a potent mix that undermines the UK negotiating position and risks a hard Brexit that will result in lower investment, fewer jobs and depressed living standards. Where a senior member of the UK cabinet suggests that his own prime minister should be replaced with Donald Trump. And that person is still in the cabinet. And that's why, shall we, the Government will not support Amendment 1, proposed by Paul Davis, or Amendment 2, proposed by Caroline Jones. The UK Government needs to deliver a clear position, and one that does not risk our future economic prosperity. Nor will the Government support Amendment 3. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance has written to all Assembly members, I trust, on this matter, addressing the many misconceptions regarding the intergovernmental agreement. Now, shall we, we hear a lot about how inflexible the EU27 are. But the European Commission has been clear that if the UK Government moves away from its red lines, a much more generous deal can be negotiated. So the UK Government needs to face up to realities and face down the Brexit lunatic fringe. The UK needs leadership on the most important issue of the day and deserves better. Well, we have the opportunity with this debate this afternoon to call on the UK Government to go back to the drawing board to rub out the red lines. Wales and the whole UK needs a government that will argue for a dynamic and positive relationship with a single market, where the UK makes a positive commitment to working with the EU27 to retain alignment with the single market as a regulatory space and a new durable customs union with the EU. So with securing Wales' future still provides the best basis for securing the right Brexit for Wales and indeed the whole of the UK. There is no evidence, there is literally no evidence that has been adduced to support any other outcome being better than being in the Customs Union. And so, Llywydd, I invite this Assembly to reiterate its support for the approach that we have outlined. I have selected the four amendments of the motion. If Amendment 1 is agreed, Amendment 2 will be deselected. I call on Mark Isherwood to move Amendment 1, tabled in the name of Paul Davis. Mark Isherwood. Well, in a joint <coughs> statement after the people of Wales and the UK voted to leave the EU on the 23rd of June 2016, the Presidents of the European Commission, European Council and European Parliament said, quote, we now expect the UK Government to give effect to this decision of the British people as soon as possible. We hope to have the UK as a close partner of the EU also in the future. Now, contrary to offensive claims repeatedly made here that the people did not know what they were voting for, the well-publicised arguments for Brexit at the time were all about taking back control of our money, borders, laws and trade. I, in fact, checked the press this morning, the day, the day of the uh, uh, referendum, to see what they were saying. The Prime Minister has made it clear since that instead of hard Brexit, she seeks the greatest possible access to the EU through a new comprehensive, bold and ambitious free trade agreement. As she said, we're leaving the EU, delivering on the decision made by the British people in the referendum. We're committed to getting the best Brexit deal for people, delivering control of our money, borders and laws while building a new, deep and special partnership with the EU. In contrast, this Welsh Government motion asked us to support the approach endorsed by Welsh Labour and Plaid Cymru, which would deliver none of these things and a Brexit in name only. Yeah. Further, as I said here last month, the think tank Open Europe told the External Affairs Committee in Brussels, quote, it would be strange if the UK was in the customs union, the EU would negotiate trade agreements with third parties without the UK at the table, and if the UK is in the single market, they said it would have to accept all the rules without being able to vote on them. Well, whilst claiming to respect the referendum result, both the Labour Welsh Government and Plaid Cymru have spent the last two years preaching doom and gloom whilst promoting approaches that would undermine it. They claimed that the agreement secured by the UK Government last December, enabling both sides to move on to the next phase of Brexit talks, would never happen. That the Brexit transition period secured by the UK Government would never be agreed, before then taking the credit for it. And, accepting Mr Drakeford, 
uh, that a way forward allowing this Assembly to give legislative consent to the UK withdrawal bill would never be secured. Each time, they were wrong. Yet they're doing it again as they seek to undermine current negotiations on the UK's future relationship with the EU by giving away all our, all our negotiating cards at the outset and incentivising the EU, EU side to drive a hard bargain. Our Amendment 1, therefore, but are... But surely if you say to the other side that if you refuse to come to an agreement with you, we'll fix it over here afterwards to ensure that we don't actually leave at all, is uh, something along those lines. Our Amendment 1 therefore recognises that the UK Government is delivering on the decision made in the EU referendum to leave the EU and that its position in negotiations with the EU should not be undermined. For centuries, our enemies have sought to divide and destroy us. But a Scottish Conservative MP, Ross Thompson, said last week, all the SNP care about is grievance and independence. Well, the same applies to Plaid Cymru, where their spoiler approach would have disrupted the UK's internal market, in which 80% of UK goods and services are traded, destroyed jobs and driven investment from Wales. As the Prime Minister said in March, the agreement we reach with the EU must respect the referendum. It must endure. It must protect people's jobs and security. It must be consistent. I'll take one intervention. Just, just in terms of your point about enemies causing problems and disruption, can I just remind you it's the Foreign Secretary who has said that these negotiations would be better handled if Donald Trump was in charge. So he should be directing his ire at his own side rather than these benches. Was it 79 or 80 Labour MPs that defied the Labour whip in the Commons the last week over the withdrawal bill? The Foreign Secretary. It must endure. It must protect people's jobs and security. <laughs> it must be consistent with the kind of country we want to be as we leave, a modern, open, outward-looking, tolerant European democracy. Yeah. And in doing all of these things, it must strengthen our union of nations and our union of people. The EU itself, of course, has two added incentives the £39 billion it will receive if it agrees a trade deal, and the importance of access to the UK, where, for example, the External Affairs Committee heard that 10 to 15 per cent of the GDP of Germany's 16 states is exposed to the UK market. Labour's position would mean continuing to follow a swathe of EU rules with absolutely no say in them. This breaks Labour's Brexit promises and does not respect the referendum result. 70% of Labour UK constituencies voted leave and they want to see the result of the referendum honoured. People outside the parliaments across the UK are getting a little tired of parliamentary gains. They want to know when they're going to get Brexit, when it will be delivered and when it will be done. They don't want to hear the same old stuff, the same old speech from the same old First Minister month after month, year after year. <laughs> I call on Neil Hamilton to move Amendment 2, tabled in the name of Caroline Jones. Neil Hamilton. I beg to move the amendment standing in the name of uh, Caroline Jones. Uh, just over two years ago, the government published uh, at uh, taxpayers' expense a glossy 16-page document which went to every house in the country uh, predicting the end of the world if the British people had the temerity to vote for national self-government. Uh, David Cameron made speeches up and down the land warning of the uh, dire consequences, assuming the role of the fat boy in the Pickwick Papers who said, I want to make your flesh creep. Uh, the whole of the uh, business and media establishment, government, civil service, were devoted to trying to browbeat the British people into voting to stay in the EU, and yet 17.4 million people, <clears throat> the largest democratic vote ever in the United Kingdom, voted to leave the EU. And in Wales, where a majority of the people voted to leave, the votes were highest in the Valley seats, like Blaenau Gwent, which I think holds the prize for the highest percentage of leave voters, by two-thirds <clears throat> voted to leave. Now, here, 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 I, here I, I join the First Minister. Uh, because, uh, in that part of his speech where he referred to the shambolic negotiations which have been conducted by Theresa May and her ministers in the last two years. Uh, this indicates a total lack of preparation on the part of the UK government for life post-Brexit, which is, I think, a betrayal of what those 74.4 million people voted for. Uh, Theresa May is one of those people for whom her indecision is final because the government ping-pongs around uh, from day in and day out as the First Minister has uh, 
eloquently described. And I never thought I would say this about anybody, but actually Theresa May makes John Major look like a paragon of decisiveness. That at the end of two years, nearly, <coughs> since uh, uh, we had, uh, well, since we had that, that vote, uh, the upshot is that we are about to become just a non-voting member of the EU, it seems. And I'd like to quote from an article which was just a few days ago published by Daniel Hannan, a Conservative member of the European Parliament, <coughs> where he said, he said the government is, the government is inching towards an open-ended transition period that will leave almost everything as it is. Brussels will continue to run our agriculture, our fisheries, our overseas trade, our employment laws. We'll continue to pump out uh, squillions across the channel. Our laws will remain subject to Euro judges. Only one significant thing will change. We shall lose our representation in the EU institutions and with it our ability to block harmful new laws. <clears throat> so why is Britain contemplating a form of thraldom that none of the EU's other neighbours would dream of accepting? Why is Britain the world's fifth economy and fourth military power, contemplating a form of thraldom that none of the EU's other neighbours, not Albania or the Ukraine, never mind Norway, would dream of accepting. It is, is it sheer ineptness, or do some of our officials actively want it? And I think the answer to those questions is both. I give way to... Thank you very much. It's ironic to have you quoting back at us that we're going to end up with the, boast, with the worst of all worlds, because that's exactly what the Remain ca campaign warned would happen. But we were assured by you and Nigel Farage that this would be a cinch. We would sort out all these trade deals within 24 hours. We said this was nonsense. You are the one who sold people up, up and you are the ones who should be apologising for this contract. I'm, 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 I'm certainly not going to apologise for the government's failure in, in negotiation, of which I have had no part. If Nigel Farage and I had been in charge of the negotiations, I the outcome would have, been, would have been very different indeed. <coughs> so so I, accept, I accept the implied compliment from the, from the member for Trinetti. Uh, so, I mean, it's extraordinary that the government has not played a stronger hand in these negotiations because the truth of the matter is that the EU sells every year £135 billion more goods to us than we sell to them. And, and uh, trade in goods, of course, is covered by the single market legislation, whereas trade in services where it's the other way around. The UK sells to the EU £92 billion worth of services more than they sell to us. And the single market does not exist in financial services, so we do not get the benefit of the single market to the same extent as the EU. That should have been an enormously powerful bargaining counter in the hands of the British government, but they've completely blown it. They've made no preparation for no deal. We've got a, a situation now where budget payments are, are going to continue to to be made, but not linked to a trade deal, which is what should have happened right at the start, and the security guarantee which uh, the government has given to the EU is unconditional without getting anything in return. As a negotiating ploy, they have absolutely failed. The EU has entered these negotiations as a hostile power, determined to make them fail to help us remain inside the EU. The Labour Party's position is actually incoherent because they want us to leave the single market but actually stay in the customs union to make it impossible for us to do free trade deals with the rest of the world. Theresa May started, and I'll finish, I'll finish on this point, Theresa May started these negotiations saying that no deal would be better than a bad deal. Well, unfortunately, we will be leaving these negotiations with the bad deal. The Conservative Party, I think, has a lot to answer for in these negotiations because a house divided against itself cannot stand. The result has been actually a betrayal of the British people. Call on Leanne Wood to move amendments three and four, tabled in the name of Rina Pjorvat. Leanne Wood. The government's motion is one I can agree with. The Welsh White Paper offers the most comprehensive analysis of Brexit's effect on Wales, and this was in large part due to the excellent work of my colleague Stefan Lewis. Why then has the Welsh Government failed to stick to it? On powers, on the EEA and on a range of other issues, Labour is pursuing a Brexit that aligns more with the Conservatives than the White Paper co-authored with Plaid Cymru. At the very least, Labour are enabling or facilitating an extreme Tory Brexit. An anniversary is a time for reflection, to look back to the referendum and to the campaign. The campaign in Wales for Remain lacked serious attention from the key players, and I'll illustrate this point with one example. 
In the months before the 2016 Assembly election, in anticipation of the EU referendum, I approached the First Minister with a proposal. I outlined a simple but effective plan to put in place the infrastructure for a Welsh Remain campaign made up of representatives of Welsh civic society. I proposed that the trade unions should form the core of this group. With their vast reach and interest in a Remain vote, I knew that a cross-party civic group could leverage the influence of the unions, of charities, of church groups and so on to reach the people who were critical to reach for the referendum vote. During this period, you will remember, I'm sure, that we were also gearing up for the National Assembly elections, which happened just a month before the EU referendum. Many of us opposed the idea that the two ballots should be held so close together. However, once it became clear that that timeline was unmovable, I turned my focus to the task in hand. My offer to the First Minister was a genuine one. Join with me to build a civic society organisation to campaign for a re Remain vote. It was always going to be difficult to advocate for the status quo. We needed to organise, organise, organise. I was told by the First Minister that the trade unions are too busy campaigning and fundraising for Labour for the Assembly election. The First Minister refused to use his greatest campaigning tool, the unions and others, for the national good. The First Minister was confident that Leave would not win. Look at all the other referendums, he said. Well, look where we ended up. They failed to use the office of First Minister to pull together a successful campaign, like we did in 2011 and in 1997. Had you done that, we might have had a different result, and I wonder if you regret that now. Until recently, I'd believed that there was a remote chance that Labour would support policies which would see Wales take the least damaging path when it came to our exit from the European Union. Following votes on our membership of the single market and their, de their deal with the Tories on the Assembly's powers, it's clear that that isn't going to be the case. And that takes me on to Plaid Cymru's First Amendment. Would the member give way? The government's claim that they remain committed to the White Paper uh, is a claim that they've made again today. And I want to remind them of the exact wording. On page 20, the White Paper says, any attempt to claw back powers will be firmly resisted. Yeah. When we agreed to co-author this paper, we did not consider firm resistance to, um, to amount to an agreement with the Conservative Westminster Government that sees powers in 24 to 26 policy areas clause, clawed back. And herein lies the problem. The wording of the White Paper remains something that I am committed to. The Welsh Government, however, has pursued policies that are not reflected of it. Let's take Labour's position on the single market. As reflected in the second Plaid Cymru amendment, the majority of Labour MPs chose to abstain on a key amendment to the EU withdrawal bill that would have kept Wales in the single market. Now, I accept that the First Minister may say he is committed to a future Would you way? where Wales participates in the single market. Are you giving way? But the yeah, actions what? of his party do not reflect that. He says that. one thing and does another. And for this reason, Plaid Cymru will be pressing both of our amendments to a vote. And we will be doing that to reflect the fact that although we remain supportive of the White Paper, the actions of the Labour Party indicate that they are not. So I therefore formally move both the Plaid Cymru amendments three and four. Jenny Rathbone. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think it's important to remember the last two years have not produced a solution that is going to um, give the people of Wales uh, who voted to leave what they wanted, which, which was control of their own destiny. Um, the, the white paper that was published two years ago was the most comprehensive um, strategy uh, laid out to um, indicate what was needed, but clearly we don't have the powers that uh, we would like to control what the UK government has got up to. So we're now in the situation where we are mere months away from what looks like an inevitable departure from the EU. The um, External Affairs Committee um, took evidence um, a couple of weeks ago from Professor John Bell, who's a leading 
uh, legal expert based at Cambridge University. Um, and I think that what he had to say uh, made it very clear to me that those who want um, a, a campaigning for a second referendum um, to be put to the people uh, of the United Kingdom are running out of time because it is simply not possible for us to reverse a process that was started uh, with the Article 50 trigger um, unless uh, we also go through the process of um, consulting with the European Parliament and with the 27 other members of the European Union. So according to Professor Bell, the very last date that a referendum could be held is this November, because otherwise there is not time for the European Parliament to deliberate on whether they approve of that, um, were we to um, reverse the, um, the uh, decision that was taken um, two years ago. And, and, and also, it would require us to uh, obtain a unanimous vote by the other 27 governments, which would mean a huge um, lobbying exercise um, with the, all these governments that we have, frankly, uh, really um, have lost faith in us because of the way in which we've turned away from Europe. So I, I would argue that um, D-Day of the 31st of December 2020 looks inevitable. And I would like to confine the rest of my remarks to the bread and buses issues that the uh, First Minister referred to, which is what most people are concerned about, rather than the minutiae of the uh, constitutional issues that um, leaving the European Union poses. Um, I think the, the hubris from the Prime Minister um, over the weekend, indicating that uh, a lot of money could be invested in the National Health Service as a result of a Brexit dividend is pure fantasy because we have already spent <laughs> most of the money that we uh, might get back from the European Union um, and we are going to need it um, to set up the new agencies that we're going to, the new regulatory agencies that uh, we've currently relied on that work to be done by um, the EU institutions, and it's obviously much cheaper to do it in conjunction with another 27 countries than it is to do it on our own. On our own. The, um, I want to look at the, the biggest um, bread and butter issue, which is food, and the substantial impact uh, that um, Brexit has already had on um, uh, the amount of money that households are having to pay for food, simply because of the uh, deterioration in the value of the pound. The UK imports approximately 40% of the food we consume as a nation, uh, and nearly all of it is from the European Union. Um, we import nine billion pounds worth of vegetables and fruit from Europe, compared with one billion pounds worth of fruit and vegetables that are um, grown in the United Kingdom. 95% of our fruit comes from abroad and half our vegetables are imported. If we were to not be able to stay in a customs union, that would lead to a massive spike in the price of vegetables and fruit because of the tariffs that would be imposed inevitably if we were to move to WTO arrangements. Um, looking ahead, though, we have some opportunities to shape our future because we currently subsidise all the foodstuffs we eat too much of, animal protein, fat, oils and sugar, and very few of the things we need to eat more of, mainly horticulture. So we don't even know at the moment whether the Pillar 1 payments will continue to be paid, which is currently 80% of all farm subsidies. What would be the impact on our food production if Pillar 1 payments are no longer made? And um, what, um, how are we going to ensure that we are still able to feed our population a healthy diet uh, in the event of um, things going badly wrong in our relationship with Europe, which we are still going to be part of, whatever happens. These are the major issues that we now face and we need to start planning for. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you very much, Louise. And just to pick up 
where Jenny Rathbone left off with some of the figures that will impact Wales if we continue with this hardest of Brexits, as is likely to happen with the decisions taken in Westminster by two parties at the moment. We will lose as much as five billion from the Welsh economy. Many of us recall going in to a darkened room over in Caspian Place to read the government's own analysis of the impact of, on Wales if we were to leave the single market, where the decline in Welsh GDP would be almost 10% and 5% and uh, some sort of free trade agreement. And even if we were to remain in the single market, it would fall by 1.5% because the areas that voted most strongly from Brexit are the areas that are going to suffer most as a result of the current Brexit proposals being espoused by the Westminster government. It's true to say that there are a number of predictions as to what may happen if the nation had voted for Brexit, which have turned out to be incorrect, but there are facts that Jenny Rathbone referred to that England has said that we are £900 per household worse off now, even though Brexit hasn't yet happened, and that is down to the strength of the pound. The single market is crucial to Wales, as is the customs union. 61% of exports go directly to the rest of the European Union, and that compares with less than 50% across the whole of the UK. And if we look at growth... Well, the English economy will grow 1.7% this year. The Welsh economy will grow by just 1.3%, whilst Ireland, in the Eurozone, will grow 5.7% this year. And that is true, generally speaking. And therefore, the decision to leave the European Union is going to have a very detrimental impact on the most disadvantaged citizens of Wales and we need to safeguard those people and it's the job of this assembly and the Welsh Government to defend those most vulnerable people as to regard the impact of decisions taken on Brexit and that's why I'm disappointed not so much with the motion before us today because as Leanne said we can support the wording of the motion but it's the actions of the Labour Party since the vote which have become more and more uncertain and they have become more and more of a midwife to a hard Brexit proposed by a Conservative government. Disruptive as Brexit, you have to be careful of what you wish for. I don't think many of us expected that a Brexit vote would end up with a Prime Minister under the title of Taking Back Control appearing on an uh, Andrew Marr programme and saying uh, Parliament can't tell governments what to do, which is precisely what parliaments are supposed to tell governments and has been since 1688 and has been since we had the, uh, what the English like to call the glorious revolution, but I'm sure the Irish don't. Um, and it, but we have to bear in mind that this, uh, in a second if I may, we have to bear in mind as well this, this line that we are strengthening the union. How do you strengthen the union, which of course Plaid Cymru is not necessarily in favour of anyway, but nevertheless, how do, let's, let's look at these arguments. How do you strengthen the union <laughs> when what you're doing is impoverishing the weakest parts of that union and when you know that the union itself has not de delivered regional policy that addresses that. But the European Union, of course, has done that. But we move in out of that. Just on that point, I'll, I'll give you. I just wanted to, to point out that the UK Parliament has told the UK government what to do, which is it has very clearly said that it will not tolerate a hard Brexit. And that we have to acknowledge. I'm not sure if I completely agree because uh, we'll wait and see what happens tomorrow uh, with a further iteration of this process. Uh, what, what I was referring to, however, is the idea that the Prime Minister can, can have, you know, actually uh, get away with saying something as uh, radical as that. And um, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this because I just uh, have a, a, a Westminster and a Wales view on these sort of things sometimes, and I just look at it from the idea of parliamentary sovereignty and taking back control and all the other things we were told by uh, Mr Isherwood, and the reality is that the UK as a structure and as a government in the UK is completely and utterly incapable of dealing with the biggest peacetime issue that we've seen for a century. It's completely and utterly incapable of doing it. And, and that just strikes me as something that leads to all sorts 
of contentious things that could flow on from that, including the future of the union itself. Now, Plaid Cymru is not here to defend the union, but we are here to defend our communities, and we are here to stop anything happening in the next year or two that will take away from those communities the ability for them to control their futures and for them to have a realistic economic state uh, in those futures. I'll conclude, if I may, uh, so with, uh, with a simple quote, uh, which I think reflects very well on what the Labour Party has been doing over the last 18 months. And it says this, when the history books come to be written and the path to Brexit analysed, Jeremy Corbyn's role will be seen as crucial. That was in the Daily Mail. Mick Anthony. Uh, th thank you, Chloe. Uh, I don't intend to go over a lot of the statistics and the ground that we continually um, uh, debate in this chamber. So there's two areas I wanted to focus on. One is the, what I call the conspiracy of incompetence, which I believe has taken over the government. And the other is a more serious point in respect of the undermining of parliamentary democracy. In July 2016, David Davis said within two years the UK could negotiate a free trade area massively larger than the EU. And he was followed on by Liam Fox in July 2017 who said the International Trade Secretary said that negotiating a new British trade deal with the EU would be one of the easiest in history. And we get to a stage now where the only things we seem to have agreed is that uh, there's a £39 billion divorce bill. Northern Ireland is uh, going to be in chaos. And the biggest danger that we face is absolutely no deal. And you wonder how we could get to a situation where government is bringing us so close to a dangerous no deal situation. And you could almost put it down to a conspiracy of incompetence where you can almost see the hardline Brexiteers saying the more incompetent we can be, the more likely we're going to get what we actually want to achieve. And that might sound as though that's really a bit of speculation, but then you have to actually listen to the actual words that came from Boris Johnson, uh, uh, you know, one of the senior players in this, the Foreign Secretary. These are the actual words from Boris Johnson. Here we go. You've got to face the fact that there may be a meltdown. Okay? I don't want anybody to panic during the meltdown. No panic, no pro bono publico, no bloody panic. It's going to be all right in the end. And then he followed on by saying, and I'm increasingly admiring of Donald Trump. I have become more and more convinced that there is method in his madness. Imagine Trump doing Brexit. This is from our foreign secretary. Well, the reality is we don't need uh, Donald Trump because we've got our, our own Trump trio of Theresa May, David Davis and Boris Johnson. And when I was reading this up, I saw a tweet that came through. It said that even Baldrick had a plan. <laughs> Coming on to the point of undermining parliamentary democracy, the whole Article 50 case was actually about the UK government wanting to bypass Parliament, uh, uh, diminishing the actual role of Parliament. And even the EU withdrawal bill in the format it came into us was about government bypassing Parliament through the creation of Henry VIII's powers in centralising government. And of course, the Grieve Amendment, which is coming up tomorrow, is again a, an extremely important matter because this is about the fundamentals of giving Parliament a voice. And one would have suspected that the whole purpose to the Brexit referendum, we were told, was about actually restoring parliamentary democracy. Lord Hailsham in the House of Lords said the government's offer not only fails to deliver a promised meaningful vote, but is far worse. It is seeking to make it impossible to have a meaningful vote. It removes the possibility. And we see the response to this in the papers of being that people who speak in such ways of talking about supporting parliamentary democracy are called traitors. They're called enemies of the people. We risk, I believe, a collapse of parliamentary democracy if the Grieve Amendment or some subsequent <coughs> amendment is not approved that gives Parliament a voice. And it is a total irony, isn't it, that we could end up with a situation where, as a result of the loss of parliamentary sovereignty, we risk having less powers in Parliament than even if we'd remained in the European Union. There is, in my view, a significant threat to the rule of law. There is an undermining of parliamentary democracy. I believe the only way out of this is that we actually need a general election 
we need a government that actually has a new mandate because at the moment all we actually have is a government whose sole motivation, whose sole rationale for existence is self-preservation and that is not putting the interests of the nation first. David Rees. Can I start by perhaps reminding people, I think, unfortunately, the UK will be leaving the EU on March 29th, 2019, because Theresa May will hang on to power and will undoubtedly take us out, she's made that abundantly clear. But the question is, on what terms we leave, and that's the biggest question for all of us in our political careers, I think, coming ahead. And as Chair of the External Affairs Committee, I've had the opportunity to actually see the complexities and the complications that we have faced over the last two years and will face in the future and potential consequences we must overcome because of these complexities. And can I put at this point on record the excellent work done by the Commission staff in always presenting us as members with information as to the goings on both in Westminster and Europe so we can have an understanding of some of the issues that are being raised throughout this whole process. For our communities across Wales and the whole of the UK, it's vital that we do leave the EU with the very best deal available to us. And for me, there's no doubt that no deal on March 29th is a disastrous one for everyone. The noises coming from Brussels, unfortunately, over the last couple of days is that diplomats of the EU's 27 are preparing for a statement after next week's Council meeting, which will express a view that no deal scenario is now a real possibility particularly as the UK Government has continued to fail to produce a white paper on its position on the future of the EU on any relationships. I hope they're wrong. I really do hope they're wrong on this and that that statement doesn't happen. The stakes are far too high for, for everyone to simply walk away uh, into the unknown of WTO rules and this uncertainty to become a reality. Just go and ask your businesses in your local constituencies if you don't believe me. It, I he says he gives a, wants a, a good deal, but he says he cannot conceive under any circumstances of walking away. How could any business negotiating with another business in its constituency <laughs> hope to get a good deal if the other side knows they'll accept what they're given, whatever? This is, I'll come on to this, but this is a very interesting point. Um, it's clear to me that the current government has no negotiating skills whatsoever is actually going into a negotiation, not understanding that negotiations is a two-way process. And you have to understand both sides' arguments and where both sides wish to get to. And it is clear that the UK government doesn't understand that and is going into this thinking it has the sole given right to actually dictate the way it wants and not recognising the other side's position. That is not the way to negotiate. And in fact, they might want to go to the trade unions and learn a bit about their negotiations. Now, the hard fact is Theresa May actually fails to stand up to the hard Brexiteers in her own party, and has already been mentioned those in her cabinet in particular. So there's a very real possibility that she cannot get a deal because they will not allow her to have one. And that's going to be catastrophic for us. It will mean lower export figures, lower growth, lower investment, fewer jobs, and smaller incomes. And that's what our, our constituents will really face as a consequence of that. Terrible news for Wales. And let's not be honest, let's be honest with it, it's terrible news to all the UK, every part of the UK. Now, let's be clear, I heard twice already today about the fact that if we raise these issues, we are moaning and trying to derail the Brexit process. This is not about derailing, this is about getting the right deal for our people, the ones we represent. Failure to speak up is a failure to do our job. It is important that we make sure that the Brexit that will happen is done to give us the best options. People's resilience and determination to protect the future of the UK outside of the EU should not be confused or misunderstood as an attempt to subvert it. It's just a smokescreen to hide the failures of a Tory government. The challenge of building a path that offers a strong future outside the EU has made, been made more difficult because of the failures of the UK government. The weakness and the lack of a coherent strategy, it's damaging the UK. It's making us a laughing stock, to be honest. Well, it's no good to do that. They don't have a strategy in place. They don't have ideas. They haven't told the EU what they want to try and achieve. What would you expect? If I went into negotiations, I know exactly what I want to try and do. The EU has told us what their negotiating stance is. They're not hiding it. We are. There we go. Now, seen throughout the discussions, also, we've also I'm here today from Neil Hamilton, 
shift the blame to the EU. Well, I'm sorry to say, shift the blame to the Tories, because they're the ones that are failing. The EU have been clear from day one what they want. The target is the Tories just trying to protect and hide because they haven't got a clear what they want. It's important that we address this matter. Now, Mick Anthony has actually also said, tomorrow is another interesting question. When the debate comes back to the Tory party, do you accept a meaningful vote or not? It's chaos up there. It is total chaos, and we are the ones paying the price. Now, there's a long way to go in these negotiations, and there's a lot of work to be done. And just to quote a famous person, Michelle Barney, because we all talk about him, the clock is ticking, and the lack of negotiating skills is not helping us whatsoever. Compromise and pragmatism are required, and inevitably both sides will have to give away in certain areas. That's what negotiating means. Their job is to come to an agreed outcome, which projects jobs and provides, which protects jobs and provides security for future generations of the UK and of the EU. And I'm accepting that. They are, both sides need to look at it. Clever, I have often stated that on 23 June 2016, the British people voted to leave the EU. They did not vote to leave the Europe. That question put to them is about the EU. They said they certainly did not vote to see us disadvantaged because the political elite in London failed to negotiate a good deal. Lee Waters. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I move to uh, contribute briefly to this debate by the comments made by the uh, leader of Plaid Cymru, uh, that she had her own cunning plan uh, two years ago to create a campaign uh, and approach the First Minister uh, to do so. I, I have no knowledge of, of that conversation, but I'm surprised it's taken her two years to reveal this uh, cunning plan. I, I would say this. She and I both sat on the steering committee in 2011 of the Yes for Wales cross-party devolution campaign. And it was hard enough in that campaign to get civil society and the churches and the charities that she talked about to work together in any effective, meaningful way. And I was on that committee partly as a representative of civil society. So it's a seductive fantasy, I think, that she's, uh, that she's basing this argument on. Since then, the, the lobbying act was passed, which put the fear of God in, in charitable organisations that they could take part uh, in a referendum campaign. I was part uh, of some early conversations about nine months before the referendum with a loose group of, of uh, civil society organisations to see if there was some appetite to do something similar uh, for the EU referendum. And there really wasn't any uh, will to do it. I, as critical as anybody of the Remain campaign, and as frustrated as she is in the result. But it is a seductive fallacy to suggest that the result, the result which happened could have been saved had we all come together in the campaign. Who took an intervention? I will give her the courtesy she denied me, yes. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think leadership has got anything to do with this? And were trade unions bound by the same legislation that you're talking about? The trade unions were bound by the same legislation. Of, of, course, it's, of course it's about leadership. And of course there are questions for us all to ask, answer about the way that referendum uh, was conducted. And the timing of it was clearly uh, unfortunate. But I think this is fantasy politics to think. And also it, it, mis it misunderstands the depth of feeling amongst our own constituents about what that referendum was about. And if only a couple of well-meaning worthies came together and got a little campaign going, all would have been well. You know, I wish that, I wish that was so. I wish that was so. I really don't believe it is so, so. I'm surprised it's taken her two years to reveal that, and I think it's dangerous thinking uh, to try and uh, dig this up now, to try uh, and score political points to suggest that she had the answer all along. It's nonsense. And I would say uh, the leaders of that Brexit vote, the Foreign Secretary, David Davis, Liam Fox, are the ones now leading this, uh, this negotiation to follow through the words that we all said were nonsense, but we should be holding them to account. The white paper that we negotiated jointly between Labour and Plaid Cymru was a, was, a, was, a, was a good moment, I think, in us looking at our common interests. And I'm sorry that we're now starting to turn on each other. We should be turning our fire on the Tories who made promises yeah, yeah. we knew they wouldn't keep. And instead of coming up with, uh, with fantasy, I'm, I'm finishing at this point, uh, with, with, with fantasy versions of history that all would have been well, I, I think, come on, we need to do better than that and turn our fire on those people who made promises that are now uh, falling apart. Yeah. I call on the First Minister to reply to the debate. The fundamental problem with the question of Brexit is, is this, isn't it, Lewis? That Back in 2016, people were asked to vote for an idea and not a plan. We had a referendum in 1997, we had another referendum in 2011, where if people so chose, uh, they could look at a document that would tell them what would happen if they voted yes. There was no question about it. There was no ambiguity. It was there, written down in black and white. But the problem is, people were asked to vote for an idea, 
and there will be very different interpretations of that vote in this chamber. Of course there are. None of them can be proven or disproven. Because the problem is there are some, the very, very hard Brexiteers, who are almost like religious fundamentalists, who take the view we must take all of this literally. People wanted to leave everything with the name Europe in it. And I, I'm only slightly exaggerating there. And there will be others who are far more pragmatic, uh, as, as we are, who look to get a Brexit that works for Wales. That's the, the fundamental problem here, that the vote itself, the question itself, was flawed in terms of what people were being asked to do. Now, listen to what Mark Isherwood had to say. It is the case that people did not raise with me the issue of the single market of the customs union. They didn't know what they were. All they knew was what the European Union did. And even then, they weren't sure, because people said to me, I want to make sure that we get out of the European Convention of Human Rights, which has nothing to do with the European Union. So it wasn't the most well-informed referendum in that sense, as was any referendum is particularly well-informed, because people will always vote on for reasons that have nothing to do with the referendum. I heard more people telling me they wanted to kick the Tories than said to me they wanted to leave the EU. That's the reality of any referendum. Mark Isherwood also said, yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, isn't the real reality, there was no dis discussion of the customs union, because the EU was set up as a customs union. It was taken as a given that leaving the EU meant leaving the customs union. And when the single market came part of the campaign, the Leave campaign, and particularly Michael Gove, were absolutely clear that voting to leave meant leaving the single market as well as the customs union. No, because you don't have to be in the EU to be in the customs union. That's the whole point. The Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey in the customs union, they're not in the EU. Uh, if you look, for example, at Turkey in the customs union, it's not in the EU. The two things are not coterminous. That's the whole point. And here we are back again with the, with the crux of the problem. And in 2016, there wasn't a document that people could refer to that told them exactly what they wanted, to, what, they were, what would happen if they voted a certain way. I heard Mark Isherwood repeat the line, we'll take control of our borders, money and laws. We won't control our borders. There'll be a big open border with Ireland. So that's, that's just not true. Uh, the reality is if you control your borders, you don't have a very large open border with another country. Control our, our money? Well, I wasn't aware we were in the Eurozone, actually. I always thought we were part of the Sterling uh, Zone. And laws? Well, laws, but taking control of our laws came with a large asterisk that said does not apply in Wales and Scotland until we actually negotiated uh, a different outcome uh, over the past few uh, months. His party and UKIP will say you must respect the result of the referendum. Now, how close it was. I agree. I agree. But his party didn't do that in 97. Oh, no. In 2005, the Conservative Party stood on a manifesto commitment of rerunning the referendum. I remember Michael Howard saying it, rerunning the referendum. Not we accept the result, let's have another referendum, because we didn't like the result of the first one. So I can't be lectured by the Conservative Party, because you wouldn't accept the result of the referendum. Yes, you realise now. You didn't accept the result of the referendum in 1997, and you wanted to have a second referendum. I don't make that same argument. I don't make that same argument. I accept the result of the referendum. I'm not be lectured about, uh, about that point by the Tories. Mark Isherwood makes the point, and I've got no reason to contradict him, that there are some German lender where 10 to 15 per cent of their business depends on exports to the UK. Could well be true. I've got no reason to doubt that. But 60 per cent of our exports depend on accessing the single market. It's far more onerous for us to leave the single market than it is for German lender in terms of the uh, market that they would access in the UK. Uh, I listened with great patience to Neil Hamilton. Can, can I say quite simply this to him? Uh, he will remember, as I will, though not everyone in this chamber will, the series Faulty Towers. There comes a point where the major in Faulty Towers uh, is mistaken, uh, or it makes the mistake of looking for Germans, and Basil Faulty has to say to him, war's over, and the war is over. The EU is not a hostile power. The EU is not sitting there on the cliff, uh, in Calais looking at the uh, cliffs of Dover with malign intent. The EU is our partner, and we need to make sure that we, we negotiate with them as a partner, not as a hostile power, as he uh, put it. It would be remarkable if the, U if the EU didn't export more in value to the UK and the UK exported back to the EU. Quite simply, the EU is much bigger than the UK. Of course it's going to do that. But the percentage of exports from the EU to the UK is much smaller than the percentage of exports that goes from the UK to the EU. That's the difference. It's not the actual volume. It's the percentage that is uh, important. And again, he makes the point, if he'd be in charge, we'll all be done. Well, Nigel Farage said we'd have a deal with the US in 48 hours. All right, he was saying it tongue Well, you can never tell with him it's tongue in cheek. I debated him. He made things up. He went along. He couldn't uh, contradict it. But the reality is, is he really saying that the US is waiting there to do a deal with the UK? on terms that are favourable to the UK. I don't believe that. The rhetoric of, the, of, of surely the US President shows uh, otherwise. Uh, I listened to what Leanne Wood uh, said. Well, she, I just remind her, she and I on this issue are on the same side. 
She reminds me of somebody playing in a rugby team who runs around the pitch trying to tackle members of her own side, rather than focusing on the opposition who are over there. And over there, they're the opposition over there. They are the people you who are trying to, to deny the, a sensible Brexit uh, to the people of Wales. Uh, and I said to, in a second, I'll, I'll let you in. In a second, okay. I said to her at the time. I thought it was naive to have a cross-party campaign in the middle of an election. We spent all our time knocking lumps at each other as part of a democratic process. The election aren't going to buy a week later that we're suddenly all friends again. It doesn't work that way. The timing was wrong. She's right. I said to David Cameron, don't have this election, uh, don't have the referendum That's in June, have it in the autumn so that the elections are out of the way, if I've got time. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, th I, I hope, First Minister, you're not going to disillusion me now, because I've just heard from Plaid Cymru that the fact that the Remainers lost the referendum lies squarely on the shoulders of the First Minister. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the reality is David Cameron bears a lot of responsibility, I'm afraid, because I said to him, don't hold it in, in, in June, hold it in September. He thought he could win the referendum as he had in Scotland. That was the problem. He was still riding on what had happened in Scotland, and as a result, there was complacency there. And it was something that I, I did say to him at, at the time. But I have to say to the leader of Ply Cymru that she is suggesting that the focus should have been on fighting the EU referendum after the election was over. Her focus in the first week was doing a deal with the Tories and the UKIP to get a seven elected first minister. She only had 11 members in the chamber. I haven't got time, unfortunately. Two more points that I have to, uh, to make. First of all, Jenny Ransom made the. Jenny Rathbone, of all people, Jenny Rathbone made the point uh, that we are not ready to deal with the customs union. The ports are not ready. I made the point last week. Nothing has been done in the ports to facilitate the movement of goods through the ports, and the UK government will blame the ports. I have no doubt about that if there are delays in those ports. Simon Thomas makes the, 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 the perfectly correct point when he says that in the campaign and the referendum, it was said time and time again, and it was always the UK Parliament we were mentioned, power must return to Parliament, except when Parliament doesn't agree with us. That was, that's, that, that's the Brexit uh, message. Now, if you want to look for an interpretation of where people stand, people were offered the chance last year to vote for a hard Brexit as proposed by the Prime Minister, and the people said no thanks. No thanks, they said. We want, we want something different. We don't want the Brexit the Conservative Party proposed. It's time now for some realism. It's time now for some, humi some humility on behalf of the Conservative Party in London. But above all, it's time for us to see leadership in London, as we have in Wales, to deliver a sensible Brexit, which is what I believe the people of Wales voted for. A question you the proposal is to agree Amendment 1. Does any member object? <laughs> I will defer voting under this whole item until voting time, and that brings us to voting time. And unless three members wish for the bell to be rung, I will move immediately to the first vote, and that is on the debate on the stage four of the Public Health Minimum Price for Alcohol Wales Bill. And I call for a vote on the motion tabled in the name of Vaughan Gething. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 45, no abstentions, five against, and therefore the motion is agreed. The next vote is on the debate on the second anniversary of the EU referendum, Amendment 1, and if Amendment 1 is agreed, Amendment 2 will be deselected. I call for a vote, therefore, on Amendment 1. Table the name of Paul Davis. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 13, no abstentions, 38 against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. Amendment 2, I call for a vote on Amendment 2, tabled in the name of Caroline Jones. Open the vote. Close the vote in favour 16, no abstentions, 35 against. Therefore, Amendment 2 is not agreed. Amendment 3... I call for a vote on Amendment 3, tabled in the name of Rina Bjorwerth. Open the vote. Kyer. Close the vote in favour 8, 3 abstentions, 40 against. Therefore, Amendment 3 is not agreed. Amendment 4, I call for a vote on Amendment 4, tabled in the name of Rina Bjorwerth. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour, 8. No abstentions, 43 against. The amendment is therefore not agreed.
I now call for a vote on the motion. Open the vote. Close the vote. In favour 36, no abstentions, 15 against. The motion is therefore agreed and that brings today's proceedings to a close.